Hello, my name is Drew Combs. Welcome to the City Council's January 12th regular City Council meeting, our first regular City Council meeting of the year, and our first one with uh, Council Member Jen Willison. Uh, this is a teleconference meeting with the City Council, City staff, and members of the public participating remotely to ensure social distancing in this federal, state, and local emergency. Um, with that, I'll move on to, to roll call. Um, I'd like to introduce staff and city council members present, uh, Vice Ma uh, Mayor Betsy Nash, uh, city council members Ray Mueller, Cecilia Taylor, and as I mentioned earlier, Jen Willison. Staff present include city manager Starla Jerome Robinson, interim city attorney Cara Silver, and city clerk uh, Judy Heron. City Clerk Heron, would you please provide instructions to the City Council and members of the public on how to how the meeting will proceed? Thank you, Mayor Combs, and again, echoing that welcome to our January 12th City Council meeting. For members of the City Council, we ask that you remain on screen for the duration of the meeting, controlling your own webcams and microphones. Uh, staff will engage their webcams and microphones when making presentations as well as responding to any questions that the City Council may have. For members of the public who wish to provide public comment, after the Mayor calls for public comment on the item you wish to speak on, please engage that hand feature in the top right side of your screen. I'll have the opportunity to open up your microphone and you may address the City Council at that time. I would also like to bring everyone's attention to the handouts tab. Again, on the right side of the screen, you will find our city council agenda for this evening, which includes presentations, as well as all web form public comment that was received um, up until 4 p.m. today. That does include my introduction. Thank you. Thanks uh, for those instructions. Um, with that, we'll uh, proceed on to uh, the report out from closed session and I'll, um, um, ask uh, either interim uh, city attorney Car Silver or the city manager uh, to report out from the January 8th closed session. Uh, good evening. Uh, there were no reportable actions from the closed session. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, with that, we'll move on to, to public comment. Uh, um, under public comment, the public may address the city council on any subject not listed on the agenda. Each speaker may address the city council once under public comment for a limit of three minutes. Please clearly state your name and address or political jurisdiction in which you live. The city council cannot act on items not listed on the agenda and therefore the city council cannot respond to non-agenda issues brought up under public comment other than to provide general direction. Um, with that, oh, oh, uh, call on the city clerk to see if uh, if there are any public comments. Thank you, Mayor Combs. So at this time, if any member of the public wishes to speak on an item not on the agenda, so for general public comment, item C, please engage that hand feature in the top right side of your screen. I'll have the opportunity to open up your microphone and you may address the city council at this time. Mm -hmm. This will be the final call for general public comment on item C. And seeing no hands raised, Mayor Combs may continue. Thank you. Okay, with that, we'll, we'll uh, move on to uh, agenda item D, uh, consent calendar. Uh, under the consent calendar, the city council may take action to approve routine business items in one motion unless the city unless a city council member, city staff member, or member of the public requests that an item discussed or continued to be discussed or continued to a later date. Um, with that, I we'll let well let's go to the city clerk uh, first and see if there there are any public comments on on anything on the the consent calendar. Thank you, Mayor Combs. So at this time, if any member of the public wishes to speak on any of the consent calendar items, D1 through D5, please engage that hand feature in the top right side of your screen. I'll have the opportunity to open up your microphone and you may address the city council at this time. So this will be a final call for public comment on the consent calendar items D1 
through D5. Do you have one hand raised? So the first public commenter will be Nikki Winkworth. Nikki, if you would like to unmute yourself, there's a mute button above that hand that you just engaged. Click the microphone, it should turn green and you'll have the ability to address the city council at this time. Hi, council members, happy new year. I tried to understand the CAFR and I had a great deal of doing it, deal of trouble doing it because I could not access the trans, the government transparency feature on our website. And when I finally did, with the help of many people, find it, some of the items I clicked on said, gave me a 404 not available code. So what I'm saying is that our website is screwed up. The, the government transparency features are not findable. And when they are findable, they don't work properly. So I can't say anything about the CAFR because I haven't been able to properly research it. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. So final call for any public comment on our consent calendar, items D1 through D5. Seeing none, Mayor Holmes, you may continue. Oh, thanks. Thanks for that. Um, and thanks for that that uh, that, that comment, um, uh, former Mayor Winkler. Uh, again, I know that that came under general public comment, but I, I wanted to um, go to staff and to see if, if there is an awareness of this debt link situation uh, um, and uh, if, if, if not, um, uh, maybe we should touch base with the former mayor. Uh, or and, and if there's some sense of, of, of how we can correct that. And Mr. Jacobson, welcome to the meeting. Thank you, Mayor Combs. Uh, Dan Jacobson, Assistant Administrative Services Director, and my cat in the corner. Uh, I was unaware that there were any dead links. Um, the links that I did test out for the CAFR uh, and the transparency portal for the budget uh, and, and actuals reporting uh, worked when I accessed them. However, uh, if they are not working, please do uh, send me an email. My email is on the city's website. I would be glad to double check the links and just make sure that everything's working. Cool, Th thanks for that. Yeah, I, um, uh, former Mayor Winkler, if you could just sort of copy those URLs and paste them into an email and send them, and feel free to, to CC, CCIN, um, but to send on those th those links. And so, you know, we can see whether there is something on your end with your browser or, or whether it's it's something on, on, on our end with the server. So um, with that, but th thanks thanks for that, that comment. Uh, Vice Mayor Nash. Thank you. I've also had a few um, error 404s on the website um, within the budget. So I will also forward those along. Okay, cool, thank you. Um, so with that now, well, I, I guess uh, the, the way we can approach the consent calendar, first I'll start off, is, is there anything on there that someone wants to uh, move off of the consent calendar um, because they they want it to be voted on separately, and then then we'll, we'll we'll see if there's anything there, and then we'll go to see if there's any sort of clarifying or follow up questions on any of, of the items that then may allow us still to to keep them all together. But but first, I want to make sure that there is um, if there is an item that someone just wants sort of removed and voted on separately, so certainly want to want to do that. Councilmember Willison. Um, Mayor Combs, I don't necessarily need this voted on separately, but I do have a, a question uh, regarding uh, the ADU agenda item, um, D5. Okay. Let's, let's dive into that then. Okay, great. Um, and I know that um, staff uh, has, since the agenda has been published, has made a recommended um, edit to the letter, and I just wanted to make sure if staff is going to bring that up or do we bring that up or what's the protocol for that? 
Um, well, you've brought it up, and so now let's okay. have let's have <laughs> staff um, just sort of clarify the the uh, the, the correction um, for, for for sake of the of the meeting. Okay. Oh, Ms. Chow, welcome to the meeting. Good evening, Mayor Combs and members of the City Council. So, so thank you. Yes, there was um, some good uh, a good question raised, um, and so staff is suggesting some edits to the letter, which is included as attachment C to item D5. Um, specifically, it's um, some modifications to response number three, and um, that is found on page uh, 5.27 for those following the audience. Um, and so I can go ahead and read the language, or if you choose, if you'd like to read the language in, um, and then staff would suggest adding that, and I would revise it, and then uh, have the mayor authorize if the council moves that forward for the decision. So would you like me to read the modified language? Yeah, so let's, let's, let's kick off with you, you reading, reading the language. Okay. Sure, again, so I'm gonna read the response um, for item D, uh, sorry, R3. So this recommendation is in response of being, uh, this recommendation is in the process of being implemented. According to the study, investment and disinvestment as neighbors prepared by the UC Berkeley's Center for Community Innovation in collaboration with the Y Plan Initiative, the city had 126 second unit violations between 2010 and 2018. This represents approximately 1% of the total number of housing units in the city and does not appear to be a significant issue in the city as a whole. However, the majority, 78% of the unpermitted second unit violations were located in Bellhaven. And by contrast, the majority of second units permitted uh, permits issued were not in Bellhaven. When a violation is discovered, staff from planning, building, and code enforcement works with the property owner on how to bring the unit into compliance. Staff is also creating a process for homeowners to seek delayed enforcement for unpermitted second units for recent changes to state and local law. Staff will continue to review the other best practices, such as the county's pilot program and partnering on regional solutions by connecting with, supporting, and participating with the county through the 21 Elements effort. Um, so that concludes response number three. And so the, those modifications are the additional details regarding the uh, second unit data that was provided in the uh, what we would call uh, the Y plan study. Um, Councilmember uh, Walton. Uh, uh, thank you, Ms. Chow, for um, adding that language. Um, and yeah, uh, looking at the Y plan report, um, it it is uh, pretty telling how many uh, ADUs there are in the Bellhaven. Uh, neighborhood, I think the Y plan study uncovered 24% of homes in the Bellhaven neighborhood have ADUs. So um, whatever kind of efforts are made for amnesty or um, assisting uh, folks to upgrade their units um, should definitely be you know, bilingual and, and um, targeted um, in that neighborhood. Um, and so uh, with that modified language, I'd be happy to move to approve the consent calendar if nobody else okay, cool. has any other comments so we, we have we have a motion uh to uh, approve all items of the consent calendar and and again since that that uh um modification has already been incorporated by staff there's no need for us to record that separately in in a motion um so uh, uh council member mueller nash and and council member taylor is not is not on on video but she is 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 with us um please let me know if you have um any other items that that you want to to surface uh, with regards to the consent calendar i'll second the consent calendar thanks so we have a first and a second Thank you. So I have a motion on the floor by City Council Member Willison and a second by City Council Member Taylor to approve the consent calendar with the updated language for item D5. Any further City Council discussion or questions? Seeing none, by roll call vote. City Council Member Mueller? Yes. City Council Member Taylor? Yes. City Council Member Willison? Yes. Vice Mayor Nash? Yes. Mayor Combs? Yes. And the motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Cool. Thank you for that, um, City Court Parent. Okay, with that, we'll, we'll move on. Uh, that finishes the consent calendar, and we'll move on to uh, the public hearing portion 
of the meeting agenda um, item e, E1, consideration of the final approval of the Menlo Park Community Campus project located at 100 to 110 Terminal Avenue. Um, at this time, I will turn over the meeting to Vice Mayor Nash, uh, given that I'm recused from this, uh, this, this matter because uh, my employer is, is Facebook. Thank you very much, Mayor, uh, Mayor Combs. Um, so the public hearings are a formal proceeding held in order to receive testimony from all parties interested on a proposed issue or action. Um, to introduce this item is Deputy City Manager, Justin Murphy. Uh, good evening, Vice Mayor Nash and City Council. So my name is Justin Murphy. I'm Deputy City Manager. So I'm going to uh, introduce this item. So uh, yeah, but there will be a number of other people involved. So I will start uh, sharing my screen. So if you could just um, confirm confirm that my screen is visible? Yes. Great. Thank you. So, uh, yes, yeah, so this item is the uh, Menlo Park uh, Community Campus Project, and so uh, happy to be here this evening. And there are two uh, major actions associated with the final approvals on this project. So the first is a set of land use entitlements. So the architectural control use permit and environmental review for the project that was reviewed by the Planning Commission. And Chris Turner, assistant planner, will be helping me with that portion of the presentation. And then the other action item is the funding and improvement agreement uh, with Facebook. So there's a, a number of staff, namely uh, Chris Lamb and uh, Bill McClure from the city's attor city attorney's office that are, would be available for questions on, on that item. So just to uh, recap, and you've seen this slide before, there's been um, multiple iterations. I've tried to keep the overall length and what I've done is uh, remove some meetings along the way. Otherwise, it would be uh, potentially twice twice as long. But um, one item that's uh, absolutely critical to this is a number of neighborhood leaders that champion this idea before that um, October 2019 offer by Facebook to uh, make a generous um, commitment to the city of Menlo Park. So uh, that uh, group of neighborhood leaders was instrumental for us to uh, be here today. So uh, over the course of the year, and, it's, and it has been just a, over a year of uh, uh, council meetings, there's been a number of actions and we've tried to um, uh, break it down into some uh, deliberate steps along the way. And so the last time we were at the city council was on November 10th, where the council amended the project budget and also finalized um, some interim services for this project. Uh, so tonight we're gonna focus on the uh, Planning Commission's recommendation from December 14th. So another key um, component of this has been the council subcommittee. So for the 20, um, 2020 year, it was then Mayor uh, Cecilia Taylor and former council member Kat Carlton that served on the subcommittee. And most recently, uh, Vice Mayor Nash has replaced um, Council Member Carlton on the subcommittee. So again, uh, great uh, thanks and appreciation to all the time um, devoted by the subcommittee on this project. So with this, I'm going to uh, turn it over to uh, Chris Turner. I will be turning off my camera and mic. I will continue to advance the slides for him and he will cover the um, Planning Commission's review. Good evening, Vice Mayor Nash and council members. Um, tonight you will be considering the proposed Menlo Park Community Campus project. The planning entitlements on which we'll be taking action are architectural control for the construction of a new community campus building and a use permit for the use and storage of hazardous materials for the proposed use of diesel fuel 
for a mobile backup generator and pool chemicals for the um, new proposed pool. The zoning ordinance requires all non-residential buildings to undergo architectural control. The action is intended to maintain a level of quality of design that will be beneficial to the city and will not cause undue hardship for the community. Findings for architectural control include the following. That the general appearance of the structures is in keeping with the character of the neighborhood that the development will not be detrimental to the harmonious and orderly growth of the city, that the development will not impair the desirability of investment or occupation in the neighborhood, that the development provides adequate parking as required in all applicable city ordinances and has adequate provisions for access to such parking, and that the development is consistent with any applicable specific plan. The project was reviewed by the Planning Commission, who voted unanimously to recommend approval of the project based on their conclusion that the findings could be made. The Commission noted that the proposed community campus has a warm and welcoming design, which would be harmonious with the Bellhaven neighborhood in which the subject property lies. The Commission believed that the new facility would be a great improvement over the existing facilities, which would contribute to the overall desirability of the neighborhood and would constitute a significant investment in the Bellhaven neighborhood, as well as the city as a whole. Finally, the Commission commended the team at Facebook and Hard Howerton on their outreach efforts and their mission to incorporate the community's ideas into the project. The use of hazardous materials is subject to a use permit. In order to grant a use permit, the, uh, the City Council must find that the use and storage of hazardous materials would not be detrimental to the health, safety, morals, comfort, and general wel welfare of the community. The Commission initially expressed concerns with the use of diesel fuel for a mobile backup generator, noting that battery storage technology is advancing to the point where diesel is obsolete. Um, however, the commission voted unanimously to recommend approval um, of the use permit, recognizing that the amount of battery storage proposed for the project would not be sufficient to power the building during an emergency in the winter um, when energy production is at its lowest. Um, and that the use and storage of the hazardous materials would not be detrimental to the community. Um, this project is categorically exempt uh, pursuant to the California Environmental Quality Act um, guidelines section 15302, uh, which is replacement of existing facilities. Um, the project has substantially the same purpose and capacity as the existing facilities and this exemption allows for reasonable increases in square footage um, to accommodate replacement facilities. The proposed square footage would be um, an approximately 8.8 .8 increase uh, in square footage from the existing facilities currently located on the site. Um, and with that, I'll, I'll turn it back over to Justin. Great. Uh, thank you, Chris. And I will continue um, continue on. So just confirming that um, you're able to see my screen again. If not, please speak up. So I will now move on to the second uh, action item, the uh, funding and improvement agreement. So this is a uh, legal document that is uh, set up for um, signature by the city manager and representative from Facebook. So it outlines the obligations and commitments from both Facebook and the city for this project. It establishes uh, parameters for delivering the project in a timely manner, including the following targets of uh, June 2021 uh, for uh, closure of facilities, the summer for remediation and demolition of buildings, and the, the goal of being able to reopen the facilities in the spring of 2023. So the uh, components of the agreement reflect uh, the council re reviewed term sheet that occurred in uh, in September, um, and it does include the city requested work or project enhancements within the budget parameters that the council reviewed in um, uh, October and November of, of uh, 2020. So this um, document uh, 
various drafts of this document were reviewed by the uh, former and current uh, council subcommittee. So there is uh, one uh, topic related to the pool to the pool layout that I'd like to discuss. So this um, is a screenshot of attachment F to the staff report. It reflects the uh, latest layout of the pool. And um, as you may recall, the council did authorize a project budget amendment to incorporate uh, reconstruction of this pool as part of the project. And uh, Facebook was able to um, incorporate uh, that into the project agreement in terms of them taking the lead for the construction of both the, the building and the pool, of course, with the city uh, contributing the, f the funds for the pool. So there, uh, this this version was released um, last um, Thursday as part of the staff report, uh, and we believe that uh, it would benefit from a little bit more time, a little bit more review. Um, and so in the next slide, I have a staff recommended uh, condition for or motion uh, item for how to uh, conduct that review. So, um, so it's the, the the first item listed under recommendations. Um, it would be to review the uh, pool layout uh, to refer it, excuse me, to the uh, council subcommittee to explore uh, potential refinements. And then there's a series of parameters that try to fit within and that then um, any final layout would come back to the city council for a special meeting with the goal of being no later than the end of January. So the Friday, January 29th is the uh, date identified in this, in this motion, recommended motion. And so there's five basic parameters related to the, uh, the CEQA or uh, California Environmental Act, Quality Act exemption that Mr. Turner just talked about. Um, that the um, any changes to the pool layout would fit within the existing fence line that's uh, been established by the the plans that were reviewed by the planning commission. Um, that uh, of course that the the project would comply with the various codes, and that's where at, at, at one level it would seem like there's the potential to um, make some revisions, but there's a, a series of uh, code requirements specific to uh, public pools that would need to be complied with. Uh, the fourth item is related to um, that any changes to the pool layout would not uh, generate implications for the proposed building. So as you may recall, the locker rooms for the pool are within the um, uh, building, the main building. And so we would want to ensure that refinements to the pool layout did not have unintended consequences elsewhere. And then finally, that the any changes would fit within the uh, pool budget that's already been established uh, by the council. Of course, the council uh, can amend its bu the budget for the project, but, but just making sure that, that that would be a discreet um, action uh, for, the, for the full council. So that is a uh, staff recommended um, motion for this evening has received consultation with the council subcommittee. Happy to entertain any uh, revisions to this at the appropriate time. So then finally, I'll just quickly cover the two other items that are at the uh, top of the staff report in terms of the uh, resolution 6607 that would cover the, the land use entitlements. So the use permit, the architectural control, plus the uh, environmental review finding for exemption. And then the last bullet is to authorize the city manager to execute the funding and improvement agreement. So with that, I will stop the presentation. I will um, turn it over to uh, Fergus O'Shea from Facebook um, um, and uh, myself and other staff will be available for questions at the conclusion of uh, that presentation. There is a, a large contingent of uh, city staff that's uh, played an important role in um, uh, getting this project to this point and will continue to play critical roles over the next few years to bring this project to fruition. So with that, I will stop uh, sharing my screen and turn it over to Fergus O'Shea. Uh, great, good evening. Uh, can you hear me? Great. Uh, good evening, Vice Mayor Nash, Council Members, I'm Fergus O'Shea, uh, Director of Facebook's Facilities Team, Mellow Park. Uh, 
Um, it's good to see you all. I hope you're all keeping well. Um, I have a few comments and then Erin with Hart Howerton will be giving a short presentation. So, so we're really glad to be back tonight to seek your approval for the community campus project. Um, I wanted to start by just giving a little background and again on why we're doing this project. Um, so Facebook, you know, we've moved to Memo Park in 2011. So 2021, this is our 10th year in, in Menlo Park, um, which is amazing. And I think during that time, you know, we're very proud of the relationship we've built with the city and the community. We've always felt like the community has been there to support us and we've been appreciative of their support as we've built out, um, you know, the projects and the campus in Menlo Park. Um, and we're very appreciative of that. And, you know, we're delighted here to have the opportunity to build this facility um, for the residents of, of, of Bell Haven and for all of Menlo Park. Um, you know, this is a unique project for us. It's not tied to a development agreement, and this really is an investment in the community for the community. It's a project I'm very proud of. I'm personally very vested in, in uh, moving to the next step and starting construction hopefully later this year. Um, so we wouldn't, as Justin said, like this, we wouldn't be here without a lot of hard work. So I'd like to take this, this um, opportunity just to acknowledge the efforts of a lot of people. It really has been a big effort and community effort. It was from the, um, as Justin said, from the early visioning sessions with some of our key partners to the hundreds of community members who showed up to our outreach meetings. Um, the, uh, you know, the, the city staff put in a lot of work into this project. It's actually quite a complex site. There's a lot of um, moving pieces involved with it. Um, and the city staff have done a really good job. And I want to thank yourselves for prioritizing this project over the past year, which has obviously been a, a difficult time for everybody and really difficult period for us all. And I want to thank you for helping us move the project to this point. Um, and finally, I just want to thank our own team members, Facebook and our Hart Howard and the consultant team. And I think we've, uh, the project uh, Aaron is going to present to you tonight, the final uh, version of our project is uh, something we can all be very proud of. So with that, I'll hand it over to Aaron. Thank you. Thanks, Fergus. Um, Justin, I was assuming you were going to share the presentation. Perfect. Um, well, good evening. Thanks so much for, um, uh, I guess, entertaining us here for a few minutes. We're excited at where this has come over the last year plus. Um, Justin, would you mind going to the next slide? Um, as Justin mentioned, uh, you know, Facebook made an offer in October of 2019 that was formalized last December. In fact, we started uh, maybe five or six months before that with uh, some really interesting high-level discussions with members of the community. Um, it was a real education for us on the city and the community and their priorities. Um, and other than the, the little red line of, uh, of our world changing in March, uh, it's been a really terrific process. Um, the community engagement meetings that we had last January and February, as Fergus mentioned, were widely attended. Uh, I think we've gotten um, phenomenal participation from staff who really feel like vested you know partners in this um and then the consistent uh input from planning commission and you all and um, uh, other members of the community along the way so it's really been a, a terrific effort um by everybody um next next slide justin the um as I think I shared in the fall, the community input was, uh, you, you never quite know what you're going to get. And uh, the, the pictures below are from um, our, our meetings in January and February. And the input was broad and it was specific. Uh, and so it was incredibly uh, specific on architectural character, a contemporary forward-looking sustainable building. Um, we lost it. Uh, you know, very specific on things that, that people would like to do in the building and, uh, you know, how uh, ways that we use the existing facilities are good and should be geared forward and how we'd like to do things that currently we can't do in the facility. Um, totally lost there. <laughs> okay, there. Here we go. So, uh, and of course, you know, uh, I think things that we didn't as a Facebook Hart Howardson team appreciate at the, at the outset certainly about the, the need for a pool. Uh, you know, it's terrific that the city stepped up and saw that that was a real unmet need and, and we're excited to sort of incorporate that into the project. Um, beyond the community input uh, that we've gotten, um, next page, Justin. The um, staff, council, planning commission has uh, 
I really sort of sniffed out some some holes in the drawings and helped us really to understand um, how this building would be operated, how it would be used, uh, how it would be flexible into the future. And so we've had, I think, constant and very helpful input that has helped shape the plans, um, shape the functionality. In fact, we continue to make refinements. Um, I think last week we were rethinking about a, uh, a nursing mother's room and how, how, to, how to just make sure that every aspect of this building really is going to work for the community. And so what you're seeing here represents in this, in this package, the, the, really the outside, the character of the building, but there's still a lot of finessing that will happen over the next six plus months um, in terms of how this building will be used on the inside and all the little details that will really personalize it for the community. Um, next page. Uh, you know, as Fergus says, it, it, it looks like a simple site, you know, it's pretty flat, it's got a big park on one side of it, uh, it doesn't, you know, it's at the end of a road. Uh, in fact, uh, a number of encumbrances, whether that's PG&E or the dirt uh, or existing redwood trees uh, between the field and the building, uh, all create little subtleties that make it uh, an interesting uh, predicament. But I think we've landed on a really efficient, terrific, um, effectively 100% new um, facility uh, from arriving on Terminal Avenue uh, into a brand new sort of easy, easily, easy to navigate, sort of you get how to use it all at once kind of parking lot. Uh, we've worked with Beachwood to make sure that their morning drop-offs and teacher parking and all that works. Uh, you know, out of the input from council, and, and this is sort of terrific commitment to sustainability, you're seeing sort of ghosted in white, um, um, solar panels over all the parking spots um, that, you know, PG&E doesn't fly over, as well as um, out along Kelly Park, where we've added additional solar panels, as well as <laughs> nearly all of the roofscape of this building. Um, so it's just an incredible kind of testament to the city's uh, kind of progressive design culture here. Uh, obviously, the pool, which, which Justin just talked about, and then the, the building, which is primarily two stories, where we've put... Um, sort of the, the bigger element, the basketball gym, up against the PG&E substation as a bit of a buffer. We've um, kept the redwood trees that are shown in the red ovals and then integrated with those redwoods, you know, a new playground, the additional plantings to kind of make this all feel like one place, which as you drive around the campus today, you know, it, it always felt a little disjointed. So we think this is really a positive. Um, next slide. The idea is to uh, be a very welcoming place, a very transparent place. Um, the entry is a bit understated, but we think it, in a sort of a, a welcoming way. It's a very glassy um, ground floor. What you're seeing there is a deep recess. So it's, uh, I think, 16 feet or more where the second floor overhangs. And you've really got, you know, you're waiting for someone to pick you up. You're casually chatting with friends and you're out of the sun, out of the rain. Um, Upstairs is the primary library and gathering spaces, and it has just kind of a great um, curb appeal from from folks arriving. The uh, uh, if you go to the next page, Justin. The the building is very similar to what you would have seen in the in the fall. Um, again, the basketball gym on the left hand side, which is up against the, the PG&E, um, the senior dining community event room. Uh, to the opposite side of the plan and it's sort of supported by a kitchen and back of house space. What we've tried to do is, um, you know, kind of a very California approach. It's a two-story building and, and nearly every room has a kind of complementary outdoor space. So the children's library, which is really right in the middle, easy to navigate with strollers and to get in and out of, has a terrace outside of it. I've got a bunch of little kids. They have, they're escape artists. So this is like a children's terrace that you can take stories outside and the kids can't escape. Um, you know, the youth center, which is a terrific operation, but needs a complimentary outdoor play space. And so there's a, a playground and a whole area under the redwoods that's envisioned. Um, that would be the domain of the youth center in, you know, their typical operating hours. And I think the playground would be open to the public when it's not um, being operated as a youth center. So a real asset to the community. Um, locker room staff spaces that are really there in support of um, the pool and the gym and the fitness that's upstairs. What's um, 
I think really exciting about this relative to the current situation, you know, currently there's four or five facilities under four or five different roofs. And if you come for an activity at one facility, you're not really enjoying the interaction, the socialization with people who may be at any of the other facilities. And I think the idea that you get this all under one roof has a lot of promise in terms of just knowing your community and, and really having, having more on offer close at hand. It also expands the offering. So, um, you know, the youth center today has a play area outside of it. Obviously, you can walk to the field but it doesn't have the sort of tutoring space that the library could offer. It doesn't have some of these other, the basketball gym, you know, close at hand. And so we think that's a real amenity, especially for the seniors, um, because this building um, is really the complete domain of the seniors, uh, you know, from eight in the morning to two, three, four in the afternoon when they're the primary users and then kids and community start to come in in the afternoon after school and on weekends. And so, it's a building designed to be really heavily used sort of every hour of every day. And there aren't meant, it's really not the case that this space is only used, you know, these three hours of the week and this space, you know, sits empty except for these five hours. And so I think in that way, it's, it's really exciting. Uh, next page, Justin. Uh, the, as I said, it's a two-story building. On the far right-hand side of the screen is the kind of kitchen, back of house, and it, it's screened with a um, uh, like a pergola for outdoor dining. Um, the senior dining community multi-purpose room is the light gray piece um, to the right there, and it's a story and a half, so you get good good volume, great light. The library and teen space kind of hovers over the top there, and it's in a um, like a, like a patinaed metal, but a really sort of warm color. Um, the fitness spaces um, sit over top of the locker rooms, kind of grounded in a um, either a tile or a stone tile, some sort of masonry kind of um, earthy material. And then um, we've used stucco on the basketball gym and on the kitchen just as a sort of subordinate material that is cost effective, but also just sort of, um, kind of fades away so the other parts of the building have more prominence. So, Next page. Um, it's an earlier version of the pool where there were two, two, two pools side by side, but the, the building design remains consistent where uh, each of those, so you've got a kind of easy place to get in and out of locker rooms. There's family restrooms where you can kind of have an eye on a kid who's maybe running to the restroom. Um, the lifeguards there behind the, um, the vines growing up the side. Uh, and then up above, fitness and movement studios. And so there's this just the idea that there's a lot of transparency here. You're working out. You see down all the activity at the pool. Um, you know, I, I think what we're trying to create is a setting that's both a great place to work out, but also a really great place to socialize. And so it should be a place that you want to hang out and spend time. Um, you know, not a resort, but obviously something that the community is proud of and they want to hang out at. Um, next page. Um, this is the senior dining room here on the corner, and the teen rooms up there the, the, uh, on the second floor, and beneath the teen room is, is the senior lounge. Uh, there are two courtyards or two outdoor spaces on, on the senior dining room of the community multipurpose, and the idea was to create a place to bring lunch outside. Lunch is such an important part of the senior culture today, um, and so we should be able to take that outside and really enjoy the environment. Uh, they do such a great job today with planting and vegetable gardens, and so we've made provisions for that. But then um, if you go to the next page, Justin, there's also such a, a phenomenal usage of the multipurpose room in Oneta Harris today uh, by the community, barbecues, events, uh, baseball, you know, whatevers. And so having a, a space that's flexible to be really enjoyable in the evening uh, as well as during the day, I think is really important. It just effectively doubles the size of the room. Um, pre-function, all the other kinds of activities that go with it. Uh, next page. Upstairs, um, I mentioned fitness and movement. Um, you know, all these conversations we've had with the community, can the movement studio be something that's a great place for a kid to have dance lessons? And what I'd really like to do is be able to sit in the big, in a wide hallway in front of the dance lessons and watch my kid through the glass. Uh, but that glass better have shades because when it's um, not little kids doing yoga, we'd like some privacy. And so thinking through sort of all those decisions about 
how you maximize or optimize flexibility has been a really um, a fun dialogue. We're not showing furniture, but the library is really, um, through a lot of the input we've got, a great place to learn, tutor, study, meet with friends. It's almost like a super big Starbucks without coffee. And so it, it, in that way, um, kind of unconventional as a library, but also you know totally terrific as a community gathering space. Um, Teen Lounge is effectively a smaller version of the same, but maybe acoustically separate for obvious reasons. And then the makerspace is a, is a is a place that we've effectively enlarged the arts program at the senior um, senior building today, and we're imagining with staff like all the other things beyond just the kiln and painting, sewing, crafts, all the things that get done there. Um, and what else could we do? Um, next page. From Kelly Park, you know, it's really a building that's intended to be sort of subordinate to the existing um, landscape, right? So the existing redwoods are terrific. We're adding a couple of more. Uh, there's a great porch off of the maker space. It starts to step down the massing. Um, but the idea is that this really feels in harmony with the setting there, the, the, the play field, the track, and uh, all the existing vegetation. Um, next page. And so this gives you just a sense of scale. So I mentioned the uh, the children's terrace garden below that you see in the in the foreground. Uh, that mural is just meant to to represent mural to be figured out with the community. Um, we think there's a big arts program, community program, uh, community arts sort of community history uh, potential to share throughout the building. And we haven't gotten to that yet, but we, we've created settings for that. That terrace up above is off the maker space, and just to the left of that second floor terrace is the library. Um, and there's this park space, you know, kind of pathway that leads to Kelly Park from the building, so that the two really feel connected, as opposed to today, you know, it's kind of kind of sneak through the fence or kind of uh, follow the parking lot. Next page. Um, we've spent, um, I'd say, less money maybe the appropriate amount of money on the um, basketball uh, elevation as it faces the pg e substation, which is the upper right corner. We've pulled windows in to really create a daylight-filled basketball gym, right? Because it's not just basketball. It's going to be a whole lot of activities that happen in there. Um, and then we've made a concerted effort to create a tall wall that surrounds the service yard deliveries. There's some mechanical equipment there, and that happens on the um, the kitchen end of the building. And so you're seeing that in the lower left. Not the most glamorous drawings, but just wanted to demonstrate that that's a, an effort that the team has made to really kind of keep the stuff you don't want to see out of sight and out of mind. Um, and then I think last page. Uh, the consistent input from John Tananis at Facebook is that Fergus and I aren't moving fast enough. Um, so we're moving faster. Um, but I think it's been a really kind of great process. It's exciting to see how quickly this will be um, in demolition and then construction. And so the team, with our team and all of our consultants, <laughs> is pestering the city staff on a regular basis. So we really appreciate them making all the time um, and availability to uh, not just humor us, but really sort of roll up their sleeves with us because this has been a really um, terrific, intensive, and collaborative process. So. Happy to answer any questions, but just thought I'd run through that pretty quickly. So are there any clarifying questions from the city council before we open up the public hearing? Uh, council Member Taylor, do you have any questions? Not at this time. Thank you, Vice Mayor Nass. Thank you. All right. Um, Ms. Heron, could you please call for public comment? Thank you, Vice Mayor Nash. So at this time, if any member of the public wishes to make comments on item E1, consider consideration of final approvals for the Menlo Park Community Campus Project located at 100 to 110 Terminal Avenue, please engage that hand feature in the top right side of your screen. I'll have the opportunity to open up your microphone and you may address the City Council at this time. Our first public commenter will be Harry Vince. 
you are off mute. If you'd like to unmute yourself, you may address the city council at this time. And this is a call for Harry Bims. If you'd like to unmute your microphone, top right side, it should be a little red icon. Looks like a microphone. Okay, Bye. good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so I enthusiastically applaud and support this unsolicited proposal by Facebook to spend considerable time and money to modernize the existing public buildings at 100 Terminal Avenue, which were built at different times, but could be up to 50 years old. They didn't have to do any of this, but I'm grateful for their effort to create something special. This state-of-the-art campus project will replace a youth center, a senior center, community center, children's library, and a pool with a combination state-of-the-art campus infrastructure that will serve as a foundation for the delivery of high quality state-of-the-art programs and services. This new campus is built to improved earthquake standards and has emergency backup power, both of which are critically important components given it serves as a Red Cross shelter for the Bellhaven neighborhood in case of an emergency. The campus also has a more power efficient building design and it further reduces its energy needs through solar panels, both of which support the city's climate change initiatives. And as you're aware, ongoing maintenance and operating costs to the city will be significantly lower. Going forward, I urge the council to not only approve this project tonight, but encourage the staff to deliver a first cut proposal for delivery of multi-generational programs and services that take advantage of the multi-generational design of the new campus infrastructure. Staff should be in a better position than the public to brainstorm how to incorporate current trends in the delivery of programs and services that speak to the community in a multi-generational way. Through the public process, the public is best positioned to provide feedback on such proposals so that the rich variety of culture, program, and service needs in the Bellhaven community are adequately addressed by this community campus. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Our next public commenter is Amina Uzbaz. And this is for Amulin Rosmas. Yes, hi, can you hear me? Perfect. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Hi. Uh, yes. My name is Amulin Rosmus. I'm a resident of Bailhaven. I just wanted to ask um, whether there was going to be any uh, biking infrastructure in this plan. Um, I know that myself, uh, being someone under 18, and a lot of my a lot of my fellow community members do use bicycles a lot, and I, I just wanted to ask whether that was uh, being considered, and if not. Um, if there is a possibility to add, whether it's just bike parking or um, even a space to have uh, bikes safe um, when you do utilize the community campus area. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Our next public commenter is Jackie Sebrian. Jackie, you are off mute. If you'd like to open up your microphone, you may address the city council at this time. This is a call for Jackie Sebrian. In the upper right hand corner, you should see a red microphone. If you click that, it should turn green and you should be able to address the city council at this time. As we wait for uh, Jackie, this will be the final call for public comment on item E1 of public hearing this evening. Hey Jack, this will be the final call. If you'd like to address the city council at this time, I'll ask that you unmute yourself by engaging the microphone in the top right side of your screen. So Jackie, alternatively, if you'd like, you can use the uh, question and chat feature to uh, manually type in your public comment. And once that is received, um, I can read it aloud to the city council before they make their um, final deliberations. 
So at this time, Vice Mayor Nash, you may uh, close the public hearing and continue City Council discussion. Thank you very much. Um, I will now close the public hearing and open up the floor for City Council discussion. Is anyone want to go first? <laughs> Council Member Taylor. Thank you, Vice Mayor Nash. I, I just wanted to follow up on um, Mr. Bim's comments around the multi-generational programming. Um, just want to check in with staff, what would that look like, the recommendations that he made? Yeah, so I'll, I, I was just gonna uh, see if uh, Sean wanted to kind of uh, take take the lead on the programming. Great, thanks. Yes, uh, thank you for the question, Council Member. Uh, Sean Reinhardt, Director of Library and Community Services. And uh, certainly that planning um, is beginning uh, in the first part of this calendar year with the discussion about uh, reactivating library and community services programs in general. And then of course, over the two year period between now and the opening of the facility, we envision a robust process involving community members, of course, to uh, envision the types of services and programs that are desired in the new building. Thank you, Mr. Reinhardt. I, I appreciate the follow-up. Um, I actually have a, another question. This is for Mr. Murphy. Um, going back to bifurcating the pool um, from the MPCC campus, I just wanted to check in um, just about, I know the decision has to be made by the end of this month. I wanted to find out, would this require adding a meeting or is there space on the next council meeting um, on the 26th of this month to to add this as an agenda item? Uh, let's see, I probably would need to consult with the others about the actual space on the meeting of the 26th. So um, uh, um, whether there's an absolute need for a special meeting, I think that's to be determined. So but I think what would be worthwhile is to understand whether the council would be willing to schedule a special meeting if need be to be able to keep the timeline. So if there's the uh, potential to uh, fit this in on the meeting of the 26th um, and there's time on the meeting and that meets the timeline for feedback from the subcommittee, then I think that is possible. So if, um, I, at the appropriate time, I could pull that slide back up. If the council would like the option to bring it back on the meeting of the 26th, then we would, uh, I would just tweak the language in that recommended uh, motion. Is that something, Vice Mayor Nash, what are your thoughts on that? Um, my understanding is that we were going to have a special meeting for that um, because the 26th is likely very full. Um, your thoughts? Oh, that was one of the reasons why I wanted to check in with staff. Okay. To help understand. Um, Council Member Mueller. Can we empower the subcommittee to make that decision this evening? So staff to come back to the subcommittee and subcommittee to make that decision. If I may, um, I think the preference would be that we run it by the subcommittee and then bring it back to council. I think it really needs to be a council level decision. And in, as I've explained uh, to others, you know, the council's actions really bookmark any project. And we want to make sure that there's, we, we don't want surprises. We want to make sure everybody's on the same page. We will, I, uh, to council member Taylor's question, Currently, the uh, meeting of the 26th looks fairly long. And as we know, sometimes our meetings, just the agenda material changes, it gets shorter, it gets longer. So if we can fold it into the 26th, we will do that. But my guess is it could take a special meeting. But with that in mind, we would try and keep it a one item brief, as brief as you want it to be special meeting.
Any other thoughts on this on this um, special meeting? Okay. Thank you. Any other comments um, generally about the project? Councilmember Mueller. Yeah, so I think Mr. Bims ex expressed it very well. We're very grateful. I'm I'm very grateful uh, as a council member on behalf of my my constituents to Facebook for this project. I think it's um, it's a tremendous project. I think it's going to improve the quality of life of residents. Um, and I, in terms of the recommendations, I'm comfortable with all of the recommendations set forth by staff here. Uh, as this is a study session, I can just put it that way. <laughs> Actually, this is a, a public hearing where we'll be making the final recommendation. Well, I'm I'm fine with all three of them. So I, I, I'm happy to move all three of them. Thank you. Um, Council Member Willison, any? Vice, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Vice Mayor uh, Nash. Yeah, I mean, this is just a, a beautiful project, um, and it's so great to hear community members coming out in, in such strong support of it. And it is extremely generous of uh, Facebook. I, I believe it's about a $40 million um, gift to the city, and then the city is putting in another about $15, $16 million of city funds. So um, it's a big project, and I think it's it's time that the Bellhaven neighborhood receive this type of investment. Um, I do want to acknowledge, and um, I, you know, I'm speaking for myself, but I'm sure I'm speaking for all council members. Um, just while we are very appreciative of Facebook um, making this contribution, I want to be clear that um, any future kind of development decisions regarding Facebook uh, will be on their own merit, and and this will not at least influence any decisions I'm making um, on, on future approvals. Um, but we are, we are really grateful. Um, I totally agree uh, with what Mr. Bims is asking for to start planning and, and doing the outreach. And I uh, encourage staff to engage also um, Tide Academy and MA and all the different you know, multi-generational age groups that uh, will be involved. Um, I'm appreciative of the member of the public whose name I didn't quite catch who brought up um, bicycle considerations. Um, in particular, um, Mr. Murphy, you can answer this when I'm done with my comments, but um, I think there's 20 bike parking spots, uh, covered bike parking spots included, and just kind of the thoughts on how that number was arrived at. Um, I also know that at the Burgess campus and at a lot of schools, they're kind of like bike repair stations. Um, and so just thinking about, you know, people getting around and, and what type of um, kind of bells and whistles for bikes that we can include. Um, I um, appreciate the discussion that took place at the Planning Commission about the diesel generator. Um, and I um, agree with the unanimous decision they made to go ahead and use it. Um, for the rare circumstances where uh, the, the backup power or the battery and the microgrid um, are insufficient. So while, you know, it's not great to have a, a diesel beast brought into an all beautiful uh, electric campus, I understand the need for it in the rare circumstances. Um, one uh, thought I had that kind of was just occurring to me as I was sitting through the presentation and getting kind of excited about visiting the center when it's open and thinking about, you know, gathering there and meeting, you know, with uh, Council Member Taylor and her neighborhood and, and just kind of hanging out um, was coffee and snacks. <laughs> um, and I'm just curious um, if we want to make this kind of a place where people want to stay. I know there's a kitchen dedicated to the seniors in the senior area. But just and, and maybe there'll be kind of snacks for sale over at the pool, but um, and I don't want to kind of create a cafe in in this community center, but just if there have been any thoughts about uh, providing kind of a little amenity area for visitors um, to kind of encourage that kind of hanging out and gathering 
uh, feeling, which I know I like to do over snacks and coffee, at least when I'm not in a pandemic. Um, so I'm really excited about this. I think it's going to be a huge uh, contribution to our city. And um, yeah, thank you, Facebook and, and everyone. Thank you. Um, Mr. Murphy, could, would you like to respond to the comments? Uh, let's see. So I may, I may need help. Um... Uh, there are a number of them, so feel free to remind me if I, I miss any of them. Uh, so I'm going to mainly focus on bicycle issues and then the amenity issue. Is there another topic? Uh, I think that was it. Okay, yeah. So uh, for uh, bicycle, yes, you are correct that there's uh, 20, 20 new bike parking spaces that are proposed, uh, shown on the plan near the entrance of the building, so very uh, centralized right, right near the uh, front door. Uh, that number of spaces was uh, derived based off the Association of Bicycle Professionals guidelines for um, a project of this type. And so um, we feel it's the adequate number. There are other um, bike, um, bike parking locations at Kelly Park. There's uh, two, two sets of, of racks. As, as part of this, we can kind of revisit the, the quantities there, but there's the potential for additional location. So we feel like the uh, the right amount and right location is uh, is uh, proposed as part of the, the project. Um, right. And then in terms of the uh, amenities, there's um, there's quite quite a bit going on with the building. There's there's no potential for um, additional space, but there is there's nothing that precludes the potential for a cart or kiosk that um, could be uh, considered. So that would be uh, something through the overall programming uh, for the building, um, but there's no, to date, there's no space that's dedicated uh, for that type of use. Thank you. And I do understand that the approval tonight is kind of on the structure and the walls and not necessarily on the furniture and the programming and the things that go inside. Um, so as uh, you explore kind of this next phase of uh, development of looking at all these things, um, if that might be something to pass by community members and other stakeholders, um, if that's something that's desired for them as well, um, and if it's feasible, just something to look at. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just got word that um, Jackie Sebrian is available for public comment, so I'd like to reopen um, public comment at this time so that we can have her speak. Thank you, Ms. Heron. Thank you, Vice Mayor Nash. So, Jackie, I'm going to open up your microphone at this time. And if you would like to unmute your end, be able to address the City Council at this time. All right. Am I unmuted? Yes, perfect. Thank you. Wow. Okay, thank you so much um, for letting me back in. So uh, I'm Jackie Sebrian. I'm a resident of the Bellhaven neighborhood and a member of the Complete Streets Commission, but I'm just speaking on behalf of myself. So having watched this process, the library, like through this whole process, I really wanna thank everyone who has stuck with it from the library staff to the library commissions and their varying makeups and the many community members who put hours and hours into helping develop it and the city council who has kept it at the top of the priority list like it just makes me so happy to see it at this state um i think it's beautiful i totally agree that transportation is going to be huge like it will affect the enjoyment of the facility where those glitches happen because traffic margins are really tight in Bellhaven. So I think looking at a really good multimodal transportation plan is critical to the overall enjoyment. Um, and uh, as always, I, I may be late to the game, but if we have room to make the teen room larger during the tours of libraries we went to, the universal thing I heard was that their teen spaces weren't big enough for the teens that showed up. So if we can be flexible in that teen space, that would be great. And um, really, thank you everybody for all your time. It's awesome to see it. Thank you for your comments. Um, Vice Mayor Nash, I'm turning it over to you. Thank you very much. And we will now reclose the public hearing.
Um, I saw two hands go up. Uh, Councilmember Mueller. Yeah, and I just want to thank uh, Ms. Seabrand for reminding me. So actually, what I, I do want to take a moment and reflect tonight, uh, that there was a time period uh, back on council, it must have been almost three years ago, where council was looking at two different libraries at once, and there was a big push to push forward with the library redesign here. And I just want to I reflect back on that because I remember the debate that night and pushing uh, and the push to say, no, Bellhaven needed to go first. And if we hadn't have done that at that time, if we hadn't had that push uh, in that debate in that council meeting, people hadn't showed up and we hadn't pushed for that, it may very be very well that we wouldn't have the matching funds ready to go with this project now. So I think it's really important uh, as we remember and we thank Facebook tonight, we also think about um, at least I reflect upon that decision that night because it was a decision about equity then that we're seeing the fruits of today. So thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Willison. Yeah, I just wanted to acknowledge um, and thank the Library Foundation, um, which is noted in the staff report for the fundraising uh, that they're planning to do for this project. And um, I just think that's wonderful. So I just wanted to acknowledge that. Thank you very much. And you actually, yes, <laughs> um, again, just thanking everyone who's worked on this. First of all, with Justin Murphy, who's put so much effort and time into all of this. And also um, prominently the Bellhaven Bayfront Neighborhood Association, who really started all of this. Um, but also the many, many community members, um, the many, many staff members, council members, the 2020 subcommittee, which put so much time into it with um, at the time Mayor Taylor and council member Carlton, and all the commissions who have um, seen various iterations of this um, some numerous times. Um, the foundation, as was just mentioned, and um, then certainly Facebook and all of the other um, support there with Hart Howerton and everyone who's um, contributed to this. It's just, um, it's amazing to see this actually come to fruition and it'll be even more exciting when it really, it's built. Um, with that, are there, and actually, I guess the other um, comment I would like to make is just, I appreciate um, staff and um, everyone looking at um, having a little bit more time to finesse the pool design um, so that, just making sure that any pool we build is um, at most has the utmost functionality, and it's a real source of pride for the community and the city. And so, I um, with that, I would like to see if anyone has more to say or wants to make a, a motion. Councilmember Taylor. Thank you, Vice Mayor Nash. Um, I would like to make a motion to approve this project and also to um, support all of the thank yous uh, to the community, to our city staff, to Hart Howerton, to Facebook, um, and the general public. So thank you. Um, and I move that we accept the recommendations. Councilmember Mueller. I'll second. Wonderful. Thank you. So I have a motion on the floor by City Council Member Taylor, a second by City Council Member Mueller to refer the latest pool layout as attachment F to the City Council Subcommittee for potential refinements subject to the following parameters and final layout approval by the City Council of a special meeting no later than January 29th of 2021 to adopt resolution number 6607 for the architectural control for the construction of a new multi-generational community campus building in the public facilities district and use permit for the use and storage of hazardous materials including diesel for a backup mobile generator and pool chemicals and authorize the city manager to execute the funding and approval agreement for the project with Facebook. Is there any further city council discussion or questions? Seeing none by roll call vote, city council member Mueller. Aye. Before I continue, Justin, is there anything else you needed in this motion? Uh, no, th thank you. I just wanted to clarify the, the discussion earlier about the special meeting. So um, that, that would only be if needed, um, okay. maybe a one way of uh, 
uh, inserting that to give us a little bit of flexibility. Yes, I can clarify the minutes with that. Thank Great. you, Justin. So continuing the roll call vote, City Council Member Taylor? Yes. City Council Member Willison? Yes. Vice Mayor Nash? Yes. And the motion passes with Mayor Combs recused. Concludes the site. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Very exciting times. So at this time, the city council will take a brief recess and return at, uh, let's say, 645. Thank you. So as a reminder, I ask all members of the city council to disengage their webcams and microphones and only engage your webcams uh, when returning. Thank you.
Welcome back, everyone. Having all members of the City Council return to our virtual dais, Mayor Combs, you may reconvene the meeting. Thank you. Thank you, uh, City Clerk Heron. Um, so we will move on to uh, regular business um, and first under regular business is item G1 uh, amend the fiscal year 2021 budget and authorize the city manager to waive bid requirements and increase award authority for specified projects um, <clears throat> and so with that we'll have uh, assistant administrative services director Dan Jacobson to uh, introduce the item Great. Thank you, Mayor Combs, and uh, good evening again, members of the City Council. Give me just a second to start screen sharing here. Uh, at this time, are you able to see the presentation? Yes, we can, Dan. Thank you. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, so I will be giving this uh, overview of this round of requested budget amendments for fiscal year 20, 2021. So I do feel a bit like a broken record saying it, uh, but the city budget is a living document. It was fully expected that this year's budget, that is fiscal year 2020-21, just due to the circumstances, uh, would require a number of amendments. So the amendments for your consideration today include several which were continued from the November 10th, 2020 meeting and several new ones. In total, these amendments include $2.97 million in revenues across all funds, $4.74 million in expenditure amendments across all funds, they include carryover project funding for some capital funds, so revenues and expenditures will balance for many of the clerical amendments. Uh, there is a request for four full-time equivalent positions for partial year authorizations, um, and they re the requests cover city operations um, for staffing, departmental requests, and clerical adjustments uh, in many areas. So the second action before city council is to consider authorizing the city manager to waive bid requirements and execute agreements in an amount not to exceed the approved budget, approved project budgets for each of the existing building electrification project and the electric vehicle charging station. So this action would reduce administrative delays in project timelines, but it does not affect the appropriations for either project. And it's another sort of standard refrain you may have heard me say, may have heard me say in the past, I will be giving this presentation, uh, but because the requested amendments do cover a number of city operations, there are other subject matter experts who may come on to answer questions depending on the particular area. So for topics tonight, uh, we'll take these in the same order that they were presented in the staff report. So starting with the requested personnel amendments, moving on to the non-personnel amendments, covering clerical adjustments, and then move on to clarifying questions from city council, public comment, and finally city council deliberations and direction to staff. So for the first set of items, these are personnel requests and were included in greater detail in attachment A in the staff report. The first item on here, and, and all of these are continued from November 10th. So the first item is a community services officer uh, in the police department. So this position re responds to lower level crimes and does a variety of department tasks that allows uh, freed up capacity for sworn officers to respond to more severe crimes and run patrol operations. Uh, this position was eliminated during the budget adoption process. The next uh, item in the list there is the police traffic unit. This was also removed during the budget adoption process and the dedicated traffic unit can increase traffic safety through regular enforcement and frees up other officers for patrol duties uh, so they are not focused on traffic enforcement during patrol times. Um, this is two full-time equivalent uh, positions in this request. And then finally, the Six Sigma Black Belt position. Uh, this position would serve as an internal consulting engagement manager and serve as a centralized point of contact for process improvement initiatives citywide, um, adding capacity and project management. So you'll notice that there are a couple columns here. One is the amendment amount. Um, these are the amendment amounts for the fiscal year 2020-21 budget. Um, understanding that these positions would need to be recruited for um, and selection would take a while. Um, so they are just partial years for the community service officer and police officers. The earliest anticipated start date would be the beginning of May. So these amendment amounts uh, cover two months in fiscal year 2020-21. 
um, the Six Sigma Black Belt, as there is a list already established, uh, the earliest start date is anticipated to be March, um, so four months in fiscal year 20, 2021. So the cost data is presented for both the current year and annualized to ensure that city council has full context regarding the personnel commitment, uh, given that the assumption is that these positions would continue into fiscal year 2021-22. And then finally, of note, several of the position requests on November 10th were reallocated or removed. So vacancies existing in the currently authorized staffing level were used to fill several of those requests. So that's why those are not presented in this list again tonight. So moving on to the next section, non-personnel requests. This is attachment B. There are two slides just given the length of these. Um, so the first six on this list are continued from the November 10th meeting. Those include building and facility ad adaptations for the COVID-19 local emergency response, IT master plan implementation to update the city's website, climate action plan implementation, the National League of Cities Race, Equity, and Leadership, or REAL program, an upgrade to the police reporting software and enhancements to the building permit process. So new to the list on this page for January are street light maintenance, and this would pursue uh, previously unforeseen maintenance needs and extend, and this last item is to extend a telework stipend, uh, which was authorized in the summer of 2020 for the remainder of calendar year 2020. Uh, this stipend allows remote workers to procure high-speed internet services and home office supplies, which would otherwise typically be provided in a pre-pandemic workplace. Uh, the remainder of the non-personnel requests, uh, so these are all new since November 10th. Uh, they include downtown lighting to maintain the lighting on trees, including upfront material costs and labor costs. It would consist of removal of existing damaged lights and purchase and installation of new lights on 48 trees. Uh, next is overtime, which was cut by approximately 50% during the budget adoption process and primarily allows for minimum staffing for police operations. So these are 24-hour operations for both the 911 dispatch and the patrol officers. Um, so they do have somewhat more complex staffing requirements than other city operations. The next item, accelerated pension payments, were started in fiscal year 2019-20 with the goal of paying down the city's unfunded pension liability at a faster rate than that is required by CalPERS um, in order to save interest on that unfunded liability. So this amount represents half of the initially planned second year payment and would use the strategic pension reserve. Um, in the library and community services department, uh, some of their programming and materials are supplemented through donations. So these are very difficult to predict, but major, don major donors have estimated the ability to support the city with approximately 288,000 in fiscal year 2020-21. Uh, and these would exclusively be operated through the library donations fund. Uh, a number of businesses require regular stormwater inspections, and the next item provides for contracting out these inspections. Uh, these funds would be would utilize the dedicated stormwater funds exclusively. And finally, for the non-personnel requests, the water rate study was previously suspended, and this last item would allow resumption of that study and paid through the city's water enterprise fund. So uh, the final category of requested amendments is that of clerical adjustments. So these have a few purposes, including formalizing the actions taken by the city council in December of 2020, including increasing community funding grants, uh, the solid waste and water rate subsidy pilot, the cafe grant program, and holiday tree lighting. Next up is a true up of carryover for capital projects. So the budget development process uses an estimate for capital projects whose work spans several fiscal years. And these are amounts are these amounts are typically adjusted once the financial statements and the annual audit are complete. So the city council received the CAFR today, so those audited numbers are available. Uh, these adjusted these adjustments listed correct the adopted budget numbers to match the audited financials at the start of the fiscal year. Um, also of note in this list are two adjustments in the Menlo Park Community Campus Fund and the General Capital Improvement Fund to reallocate funds for projects which are no longer necessary due to the Menlo Park Community Campus Project and utilize these funds for that project. And finally, the cancellation of the mobile command vehicle negates the needs for the uh, COPS and Supplemental Law Enforcement Fund to make transfers to reimburse the General Capital Improvement Fund, and the, the final adjustment would reverse that plan to transfer. 
So in recognition that these amendment requests have a great deal of information, staff has also prepared, prepared a single consolidated list of uh, requested amendments, which I can show after the presentation. It is too large to fit in a single screen, uh, but I did want to briefly reassure the City Council that there will be an opportunity to look at details such as fund, revenue, expenditure, net impact, and personnel implications of these on a more granular basis. Um, and again, this is just a screenshot to show that it's all there, but I will blow it up to a more readable level um, as requested. So to recap the action in front of City Council tonight, staff requested the City Council consider amending the fiscal year 2020-21 budget with a total of $2.97 million in revenues and transfers in across all funds, $4.74 million in expenditures and transfers out across all funds, and this amounts to a total reduction of $1.77 million in fund balance across all funds. And the second action is to consider authorizing the city manager to waive bid requirements and execute agreements in an amount not to exceed the approved project budgets for each of the existing building electrification project and the electric vehicle charging station. Uh, I do also want to note here that the City Council Climate Action Plan subcommittee of Vice Mayor Nash and Councilmember Mueller met yesterday as well, so that subcommittee may have some additional commentary on these items as well. And this does conclude my presentation, so I'll hand it back to the virtual dais for any clarifying questions. Um, yeah, actually, before we do clarifying questions, I'd actually like to go to public comment. Um, and because uh, um, I, I think that there could, we could uh, easily get muddled between uh, uh, clarifying questions and, and analysis. And so I, I'd prefer to get, get the public comments um, um, out of the way. Thank you, Mayor Combs. So at this time, if any member of the public wishes to speak on item G1, amend the fiscal year 2020-21 budget and authorize the city manager to waive bid requirements and increase award authority for specified projects, please engage that hand feature in the top right side of your screen. I'll have the opportunity to open up your microphone and you may address the city council at this time. So our first public commenter will be Lynn Bramwick. Lynn, you'd like to address the city council this time you may. Yes, good evening, council. I ask um, that you not approve more staff hiring until after the goal setting meeting. So there can be a fuller discussion of city priorities and staffing decisions related to same. I think the public needs to weigh in more broadly. Uh, there are many reasons to postpone adding more staff. Uh, Number one, you've heard prior public concerns about the size of the Menlo Park staff organization when compared with other cities of similar size. In response, we usually hear some form of that we offer more services, yet we have yet to ask the public what services we don't want and that we don't want to pay for. And we also offer services that are basically duplications of services the residents can get nearby. So. Second, the ongoing uncertainty with the COVID pandemic warrants caution. I'm also very concerned, and this is my primary reason, we are missing a key staff position in the form of an in-house disaster preparedness manager. Um, th this could take quite some time to explain why, but this, the justification for some of the positions talked about quality of life We've already seen our quality of life erode due to our unpreparedness for a pandemic. If a major earthquake hit, it would erode even more. And we're also missing out on grant money. If we had somebody in-house, this position would pay for itself just by applying for grant money for those projects on our hazard mitigation plan that continue to get put off with reasons being given some form of uh, the city has not been able to move this initiative forward due to other daily priorities and limited staffing capabilities. So I think it's time to really look at what, what do we have? Are, are we kind of missing some key elements here? And I think keeping the residents safe should be a higher priority. I also point out that to me, the staff report doesn't give enough justification. For example, in the police, it talks about restoring a community services position. The rationale is it'll free up the police. But I, I've heard from a resident in Belhaven that the, the Belhaven patrol is going into East Palo Alto because they don't have enough to do. 
So I, I think there should be more facts supplied and also was an entire review given um, of what other roles could be transferred. And then related to that and the traffic request, we, we all know traffic is really down. So the statistics are from 2019, but we don't know the month. We don't know if that's after COVID or before. So I ask you, you know, hold, hold off um, for a fuller discussion and more facts. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment. Our next public commenter will be Fran Dean. Fran, if you'd like to unmute yourself, you may address the city council at this time. Great, thank you very much. Good evening, mayor and council members, and thanks for the opportunity to comment this evening. Although all the requests for budget amendment do have merit, I'd like to focus my comments on downtown lighting. Um, it seems insignificant, but it's not from an economic development standpoint. A number of years ago, the Chamber of Commerce embarked on two programs to spur economic development along Santa Cruz Avenue and foster pride in the business district. One initiative was to illuminate all the heritage trees along Santa Cruz Avenue through direct funding from the chamber and our chamber membership sponsoring all heritage trees were lighted. The second initiative was to highlight the Santa Cruz median trees, excuse me, to light the Santa Cruz medium trees. Each year we had paid for holiday lighting on the streetscape. However, it was again an economic development move to expand the lighting to a year round display. And I've lost my place. After uh, the initial installation and maintenance by the Chamber of Commerce, the city agreed to assume responsibility for maintaining the lighting. But now downtown is dark. Sadly, the median and heritage trees are no longer illuminated and street lighting is modest at best. Please approve the request of $45,000 for downtown lighting repair and installation and the continued maintenance. Our neighboring communities display lighting throughout their retail areas. By contrast, Menlo Park does not currently mirror this attribute in our downtown business district. This is also a vote of confidence to our businesses struggling under the mantle of COVID-19 reduction in hours and business practices. Um, we, we really look like Menlo Dark right now and, and we need to look differently. It will help um, it, it maintain a, just a level of ambiance downtown that we should have, we should have year round. And also it's very difficult for anyone to look at a vacant space and envision why they would want to be a business coming into Menlo Park if we really are not taking pride in our downtown. So um, I hope that you will approve it. Um, and I thank you very much for your actions on this and also for your previous action in December in the uh, grant program for outdoor dining. Thanks very much. Thank you for your comment. So this will be the final call for public comment on item G1 regarding the fiscal year 2020-21 budget. And seeing no further hands raised, Mayor Combs, you may continue. Thank you. So um, I'll, I'll open it up now to clarifying questions. Um, but I want to sort of preface that, that when we sort of get into this, I do want to sort of take it as it has been presented to us by staff. And so first, it's it's you know amending the budget in in light of the three attachments: personnel, non-personnel, clerical, um, and then and then going to the the some of the climate action projects. Uh, for, for, for number two, um, specifically as it relates to to bidding um, um, uh, bidding procedures, um, and then uh, uh, then going into to, to number number three uh, again the the building electrification and electric vehicle charging projects, and so so, so that's how um, I, I think we should tackle it once we sort of get into it. But but obviously. Um, let's first go through any any um, any clarifying questions across across the the entirety of the presentation. 
uh, Council Member Willison and then Council Member Nash. Uh, thank you, Mayor Combs. Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, and Mr. Jacobson, if you can come back on screen. Um, I missed your comment about the Six Sigma position. Um, I believe you were talking about March and four months. And if you could repeat um, what, what you were saying about that position. Sure. Uh, so the Six Sigma position uh, would be uh, a process improvement position. There is a list established for the senior management analysts. So the recruitment time for this one is shorter than for the other positions, which don't have lists. Um, the anticipated start date allowing for selection would be March, the beginning of March. So that would be March, April, May, June in the current fiscal year. And what do you mean by a list that's available? Um, so in the competitive uh, recruitment process that the city follows, uh, during recruitments are opened and then there's a list established of um, people who are eligible to fill that. So the city does have a list of people that are eligible to fill this position and so would only have to go through the selection process to actually appoint one of them to the position. So this would be an internal movement? The, the recruitment that happened was an open recruitment. It actually happened at the beginning of 2019, uh, well before all of the pandemic effects, and it was for a number of management analyst positions. Uh, but so there, there are identified candidates who would be uh, potentially available to fill the list. Okay, thank you. Um, and um, I, have, I have two more questions. And uh, Mr. Jacobson, if you could stay on for this one. Um, regarding the overtime, of uh, six hundred thousand um, dollars, how would that amount be impacted, if at all, um, if the traffic, if the police positions were filled versus if they're not filled? So, do we, if we don't fill those positions, do do we need more overtime, or does that represent the assumption that those positions are filled or aren't filled? If that makes sense. So I may have to defer to Chief Spiller on some of the details of this, but my initial uh, read would be that the large majority of the overtime is really for 24-hour operations and allowing for having staff available to do the 9-11 dispatch or 911 dispatch and patrol operations. And so while there might be some marginal change due to the traffic unit, uh, the vast majority of this over overtime is really for the 24-hour operations rather than the traffic. Uh, if I could just jump in, I think that was perfectly stated. The intention of the traffic unit is to have directed resources to traffic enforcement and uh, citizens complaints and uh, uh, colli uh, uh, reported collisions. So uh, the overtime is not a factor as it relates to those two positions. Okay, thank you, Chief Spiller. Um, and then uh, my final question um, is regarding the CAFE grant program. I am curious if you have any updates on applications and I know we are now in a shelter in place and restaurants are closed but I believe there was some time where we were urgent to get it going um, so I'm just curious if anyone applied and what that looks like. Uh, th thank you. Thank you Councilmember Wallison, uh, Nick Pigueros, Assistant City Manager. Uh, we actually have a um, uh, one of our, we're getting very close to opening the uh, program for applications. Uh, we worked through a number of details uh, that that um, comp comport to the direction council gave on December 10, I believe was the date. Um, Sam Cita has uh, and uh, city staff have uh, worked very closely, included including in that in that um, in that development process. Uh, the CEO and president of the Chamber of Commerce, uh, Frank Dean. Uh, and so uh, there's more to come. Uh, we do not, initially we had um, we had anticipated or we knew that there would be a timeout for in-person dining. And now it seems that that is being pushed out uh, a little longer, um, which gives uh, definitely a better amount of time to to move through the grant process. Okay, thank you for the update. That That's the rest of my clarifying questions. Thanks, Mayor Combs. And Council Member Nash. Thank you. I actually, this is a question first to you, Mayor Combs, and that's, um, I have an update about the, what the Climate Action Subcommittee, um, how it affects the budget, and I was thinking that it might be beneficial to bring it forward now, only because it'll give people some idea of um, what's being asked and how it might affect other just the total amount. Yeah, totally fine. 
Great, thanks. Um, and actually, um, so this Climate Action um, Subcommittee Council Member Mueller and I uh, met with yesterday with um, City Manager Jerome Robinson, Assistant City Manager um, Figueros, and um, Sustainability Manager Lucky. And we essentially um, took a look at both cap number one and cap number three and have um, decided to focus on cap number one policy and to work on cap number three, um, the existing multifamily property owners, um, rather than working on policy there um, to implement ordinances, we're going to work with them to apply for PCE and other incentive programs um, to try and push the cap number three and EV infrastructure forward that way. And so therefore, um, I'm hoping that the city manager will correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that we no longer have any funding needs on the table. Our prior budget covered everything. A correct Vice Mayor Nash, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Starla. That's all I was gonna say is that's correct, uh, Vice Mayor Nash. I, if if I may, I, I do I would like to add just one additional item. So not only do are we um, is the budget request for the climate action plan uh, removed as a result of that recommendation, uh, but it also eliminates the need to have the special uh, dispensation for bidding and award authority. Uh, it removes that it removes the second project from that list. So now there's only one project that we're asking council for. Uh, special uh, permission to move forward and expedite uh, the contract services. And that's for the burnout ordinance or burnout uh, natural uh, electrifying uh, buildings, existing buildings. So just so I'm making sure I understand if we sort of look at the, the staff report, um, do, do items, the, the top of the staff report, the sort of recommendations, do items two and three in their entirety become moot? Or, or is that burnout uh, item you were speaking about? Is it is it buried in there, or is it is it is it in attachments A, B, or C? It's a climate action plan number uh, one. It is the only project that we would we are requesting council authorization to waive bid requirements and increase purchasing authority. Okay, so. Uh, so then that that's that's so item two a if i'm i'm correct if from the the top the top of the staff report is is that yes just one second i apologize i'm having screen difficulties here um yeah so item one would the so under the city staff recommendation item one uh, would be amended to remove the request for funding for the climate action plan. Uh, we have sufficient budgeted resources. Mm -hmm. Under number two, we remove 2B from consideration. Mm -hmm. And under number three, we remove three, uh, which should be B, but it's actually D on the staff report. Uh, 3D would come off as well. Okay. And and so, so, so we'd be left with 3C and in 2, 2A. 2A, okay. Yes. Okay, okay thanks. Um, and so, so was that uh, all of the additional comments you had, Council Member Nash? Yes, thank you. Okay, um, Council Member Taylor, do you have any, any clarifying questions? Yes, I do, Mayor Combs. Um, I, I just wanted to ask the subcommittee, so where does number four and six stand, or was that not a part of your discussion? And that's as far as the climate action plan. So, so sorry, <laughs> I, was I was looking at my name. Yeah. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, thank you. Um, so we were only discussing what was related to this specific um, this specific staff report, and um, but just generally, um, one, three, and five were with the projects that were were the items on the climate action 
plan that were approved to move forward um, strongly this year. And two, four, and six are being worked on, um, but they're being worked on through um, the through other means such as utilizing other partner um, nonprofits and um, working with the um, climate action with the EQC and the subcommittee there. So there's still there is still work going on. And then honestly, that um, number six, which is the sea level rise, is also on the priority list as the safer project. And um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Is that covered? Thank you. Um, actually, Vice Mayor Nash, I also have a question in, for, for you. And I, I know I saw your hand up, Councilmember Wilson, and I'll go to you and then, then Councilmember Mueller. And so again, mo obviously this, this costs are essentially personnel costs, and they are sort of broken out in, in the staff report. Um, the energy analyst, assistant building official, senior planner, public engagement professional, legal analyst, uh, project analyst support. Do we know which one of those line items go away in connection with this scaled down, um, uh, uh, this no sort of scaled down approach? Because I, I, I think it's um, fair for the sake of transparency because we had uh, Ms. Bramlett's comment about that there should be no staff hiring, right? And when we get to the personnel part, we, we may sort of decide or not decide to, to take up some of her advice, but, but I do, so, so, so correct me if I'm wrong that, that there is personnel happening here and, and, and let's be sort of clear about what, what, that, what that is. So actually, um, yeah, wonderful, I'll let you <laughs> go ahead. I didn't mean to put you on the spot at all. I'm sorry, maybe that's, that should have been a staff question from the beginning, I apologize. Uh, thank you, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, the uh, budget requests that was transmitted in the staff report uh, provides for uh, resources to hire contract staff uh, for each of those uh, classifications that are listed in the attachment. Um, I can invite Rebecca Lucky, sustainability sustainability manager, to talk about um, the uh, pros and cons of um, the or the impacts of this uh, of the subcommittee's recommendation on. Uh, the staffing needs, and I'm hoping that she can join us here. I don't see her. There she goes. We can't hear you if you're talking, Miss Lucky. Sorry about that. Can you hear me now? Yes. Good evening, Council Members. Rebecca Lucky, Sustainability Manager. Uh, to follow up on your question, Mayor Combs, the line items that would go away, the contract staff would be the senior planner position and the legal analysis. Those were really associated with um, looking at uh, parking requirements and how to adapt those with EV charging um, stations. And so without those, there would be uh, a $15,000 in, in budget, and there actually might be a little bit more because we did have some contract staff already working on this policy, and so that could be further reduced um, with, uh, with the shift in the work. Thank you. Um, were, were you done, Councilmember Nash? Yes, although I actually have um, one other question, clarifying question at some point. Oh, okay, totally. Uh, yeah. Council Member Willison. Yeah, my question is back to, to Council Member or Vice Mayor Nash and, and Ms. Lucky, um, just trying to understand this a little bit better. So it looks like there were, there were going to be synergies with, with these positions to do the work simultaneously. Um, so what are the consequences of not pursuing what was originally proposed? Um, both in those synergies and then do we feel that working with PCE will make up what we're not doing internally or are we losing anything in CAP progress by this option? Go ahead, Council Member Nash. Sorry. Go, you go first and then I could follow up with anything. Do you want to reverse that? 
for, well, sure. Um, so essentially, no, we do not feel like we're, um, there is a chance we will still want to go with um, and investigate policy for the multifamily um, EV infrastructure at a later date. But right now there's enough programs that are um, out in the um, area where we feel that there um, is, with encouragement, we're hoping that we can actually facilitate that update and that it'll be a much easier um, adoption. And also with market forces and everything going on at this point with the electric vehicles, we're hoping to do it that way and really to focus on the building electri electrification, which is already a big lift and focus the energy there rather than um, diluting it. It is possible that down the road, we could have had some efficiencies by doing it all together. Um, but overall, we feel like it's really a beneficial um, approach. So that staffing will just, that, that extra capacity will just go more towards building electrification. So building electrific electrification will be electrified even more than if it were, if you weren't doing this proposal. That is the hope, yes. Yes, thank you. Councilmember Mueller. So I just wanted to, just for transparency purposes, it wasn't clear to me in the staff report, what will the net result be in terms of the deficit, uh, if there is a deficit to our year end, our year end budget calculation as a result of taking these actions? Mr. Jacobson, please. Um, so I think that that question may require just a little bit of nuance. Um, typically, the council focuses largely on the general fund. Um, so the general fund, with the amendments uh, undertaken November 10th, actually has a 2.53 or 54 million dollar surplus uh, projected at this point. So the uh, if all of the um, amendments that are proposed were uh, accepted, there would still be a surplus. Um, I can find the exact number, but I believe it's 0.72 million. Um, that said, that doesn't take into account um, a change in the climate action plan that was a general fund proposed amendment, so that would increase uh, the surplus further. Okay, and so I just uh, want to say to my colleagues, I'm actually going to support the staff recommendation uh, this evening. Um, the traffic unit uh, was something that has gone away in the past uh, during economic downturns, but I actually think it's going to take a while to hire the officers for that. And come June, uh, please, my prayer, COVID, uh, COVID vaccinations hopefully will be happening on a more widespread basis in at-risk populations uh, and across the board. And we'll be looking at uh, an increased economic activity uh, as we move toward the end of the year. So I think bringing back those officers for safety uh, purposes, especially because uh, I confess, I've gotten very used to uh, walking <laughs> all over the roadways <laughs> to get away from people and keep my space. Um, I think we're gonna, I think it's going to be really important to have a presence uh, to ensure safety uh, of the public's interaction with traffic as that traffic comes back. Um, and I, I actually, I support uh, bring, I support what the chambers indicated with respect to the lighting downtown. I think that's actually uh, really important. I trust that our staff knows right now the very best way to go ahead and, and start to bring us out of uh, this pandemic uh, budgeting that we've been doing. But I really am, as we look at this, I'm really, uh, and I hope I'm not wrong, but I'm really hoping that with those vaccinations come June, we're going to be looking at how do we go ahead and start moving things forward again in the city and see that, that and, and I looking for, and to my colleagues, I'd say looking forward to our budget our budget cycle of next year, actually uh, want to be aggressive in terms of investments and in that gets our local economy moving, getting our, our, our uh, and empowering our small businesses and people to moving around town. So those are my comments. Thank you, Councilmember Mueller. Um, I had one uh, final clarifying question. If, if, if no one um, sort of had any additional, then we can sort of, uh, take Councilmember Mueller's prompt and, and move into the the, cor the corpus of the the, the discussion. Um, and that is just, an, and maybe Councilmember Nash, you, you can answer this. Just going back to some of the, the, the cap sort of personnel line items, 
Um, the public engagement professional for 175,000. And again, I know this is stuff that's already covered in, in the budget now, but is, is that one position or, or is that sort of uh, contracting with a public engagement sort of agency of some sort? It, it just wasn't quite clear. And, and if so, like what, what's the length of that, of that, that, that contract at, at $175,000? Thank you, Council Member Combs for, for your question. So it would be a, a contracted position, uh, likely a full time just for the amount of stakeholders and engagement. And um, just based on discussions with the CAP subcommittee and the Environmental Quality Commission, there is also a need to engage at a policy level and also engage at a more educational level with the community about the climate action plan. So it is quite a work in coordinating meetings, keeping record, um, you know, making sure the meetings are productive, and at the same time, uh, continuing to focus staff's efforts on the analysis and uh, how to implement a policy and what's the right kind of thresholds um, to enforce and trigger um, a regulation. Um, and, and just so I, and you feel that that, that 175 is the, uh, that's the market rate, the going rate for. Yes, for so, yes, Mayor Combs. So I, I did um, seek out companies and, and get some quotes and that was about the average um, rate. Okay, cool, thanks. Um, Council Member Nash, th thank you, Ms. Lucky. Thank you. I actually had one more clarifying question, if that's wonderful. Um, so going back to the Sigma uh, Six Sigma Black Belt, um, I had a question how that would work to get that person in um, and working remotely. Um, it just, and also how that plays with putting up all the new IT systems before we actually have them up and running. And can you just talk a little bit about, I, I really question why now. Uh, thank you, Vice Mayor Nash. So I think that one of the main reasons for why now is because the organization is at this point quite used to change um, and to adapting operations on a, a fairly rapid basis. Um, so this would offer the opportunity of doing some of those process improvements that uh, would otherwise be uh, pursued when capacity it allows by adding capacity for some of those. Um, and to the point of onboarding somebody remotely, the city has actually hired a not large number of staff, but a few number of staff uh, entirely remotely. And sort of speaking uh, to the work area where I spend a, a lot of my time, uh, the finance team has had people who have only ever been in the office a handful of times um, and, and largely worked remotely. So I, I don't think that it's impossible to do. Um, that said, it is certainly more difficult to do. Council Member Nash. Thank you. Just to follow up. So I certainly um, have no concerns about um, generally people being um, hired and onboarded and working remotely. Um, this particular position, someone who um, is coming in new to the organization who has to learn about our various policies um, and see how the systems work seems like that's tremendously more difficult to do remotely. I, I absolutely think that that's a, a fair observation. Um, I, I will point out that on our eligibility list, so those, uh, the candidates who have been identified as uh, possibly filling up that position, some of them are internal. And, and just sort of following up on that, uh, Mr. Jacobson, does the job have to be like sort of posted? Um, uh, as, as an open position, like if, if there seems to be a preference for internal people, can we just not move those internal people into <laughs> that internal person into this 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 position? Like, do, do you have to have like an open an open job, uh, rec? So that portion of it actually already happened, and so that's that was the recruitment that happened in January of 2019. Um, so it was posted, it was open, um, and now the people that are identified as being eligible to fill the list could be appointed, including those internal candidates. And and so and with those internal candidates, uh, and so that means that there is a position that then becomes open. Um, does that automatically get queued to be filled, or or what what of that position? 
Um, so this would be adding to the authorized staffing level, um, and then it would go to the city manager at the city manager's discretion, uh, filling it essentially, um, assuming that a, a candidate that was the right fit could be identified. Okay, Thank, thanks for that answer. Um, okay, w w with that, um, and, and just uh, uh, Council Member Taylor, just want to double back with you that, that, that you, you didn't have uh, any, any additional clarifying questions? No, I did not. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, so, so let's let's um, uh, get into this by first looking at the these these personnel requests. Um, so, um, uh, they are essentially again, you know, two police officers, a community services officer, and and this the senior management analyst. Um, I um. Uh, does there anyone wants to? I, I, Council Member Mueller has has weighed in uh, in a sense, and he can correct me if I'm wrong that he is uh, all of these requests still leave us with a, a budget surplus, um, and his sense is that we we need to sort of uh, start gearing up for for post pandemic, and we we will we will be in a post pandemic world eventually, right? um, and so and and so, and so uh, uh, and, and so that's my sense of, of where he stands. Mr. Jacobson, did did you want to? Uh, uh, add something. Uh, I just wanted to verify that the city council can see my screen. Uh, so I do have, as I oh, mentioned, yeah. the list of all of the amendments. Um, so I can zoom in a little bit further if that's helpful. Um, I did take the liberty of changing uh, the climate action plan one to uh, declined, but please correct me if that is incorrect. Okay. Yeah, we can we can see it. And thank thank you. Um, so. Uh, uh, so as far as the personnel, we we at least have one vote. We're sorry, one vote for, uh, for 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 these requests. Um, where uh, are, are are the rest of the council uh, feeling about this? What is the rest of the council feeling about this, uh, Vice Mayor Nash? Thank you. Um, well, first of all, I want to acknowledge um, what city manager Jerome Robinson has done, um, working flexibly with available headcount and really appreciate um, utilizing uh, available headcount rather than adding headcount. Um, so that's the first thing. The second thing I want to do is basically I have, um, with regard to adding any additional headcount in the area of police, um, while I very much respect and understand the idea behind it, I truly believe that we need to um, hold off until we have a discussion and a community discussion about policing and about police reform and um, see, look at headcount in the context of that discussion. And I understand that that will be held until we have a new police chief in place. So I would like to see that um, revisited at a time whenever the new police chief is in place and feels that it's an appropriate time because I'd be more than happy to discuss it. But I do, I personally um, am not inclined to um, add police at this time until we have a community-wide discussion. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Council Member Mueller. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify my thoughts on that. The reason why I'm comfortable with this is that because these are uh, traffic officers, this is a traffic unit. And um, we had in our pre-pandemic world, without the other cuts that we did to the department, and we did do many other cuts to the department um, in that budget, uh, we had many complaints about enforcement across this city. Uh, I know myself and my district was called out multiple times to multiple stop signs where people said people were running stop signs at a continuous basis. I had uh, complaints about the speed that was taking place near children who were going to school. We had, we, we, uh, it is still true that in our pre pandemic world, we were one of the top uh, cities in the state with respect to accidents taking place between cyclists and, 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 uh, and pedestrians and cars. So looking at all of that, and as this is just the traffic unit, I am uh, I am supportive of this because I think that this is something that's uh, important for our, our constituents, 
safety in their interaction with vehicles in our streets, especially because in that pre-pandemic world, there was so much more cut through traffic taking place uh, through our neighborhoods. So I do agree we need to have that conversation. Uh, today, San Mateo County took an amazing, uh, an amazing step in talking about that they were going to have mental health workers responding to certain types of crises uh, with officers. And certainly we have a discussion to take place, uh, both in the hiring of our chief and, and with our community and, and want to talk about enforcement and what principles we'll be looking at enforcement uh, toward enforcement in the future. But none of that, uh, none of that takes away from the fact that we, in our pre-pandemic world, our interaction between pedestrians and cyclists and cars, uh, really we were hearing very strongly from our constituents needed increased enforcement. And so I'm very concerned that as we scaled down uh, for the pandemic, we scaled actually scaled down that enforcement. And when that traffic comes back, there will be less than there was when we were getting those complaints before. So, and those complaints came from all over the city about, and I, I can think of a, a stop sign in Bellhaven uh, specifically that I, I visited with Mayor Taylor, that people consistently were running near Facebook going into the going into the neighborhood in Bellhaven. It wasn't just limited to specific sections of the city. This was a problem throughout the city. So, thank you. Councilman Ramesh, I know uh, you raise your hands and I'll go to you, but, but I actually have a question to you just to make sure I'm understanding. In your, your um, uh, uh, you know, opposition includes uh, the two police officers and the community service officer, correct? Okay, I just want to make sure. That we were we were talking about 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 all all three three positions. Um, did did you have uh, any? Well, just um, I agree with everything that has been said, and I do believe that we need to be concerned about traffic safety. A uh, couple comments about that. First of all, I would hope that that would be something that this would and police. Um, policing generally would be something that would be um, quickly addressed as we get a new police chief, which hopefully will be the, um, within two to three months. Um, perhaps we can have um, City Manager Jerome Robinson comment on where the recruiting is. Um, the, my other comment is that, um, and please correct me if I'm wrong, um, but I believe we did not actually lose any of our traffic officers. They just changed to patrol. So we do have some well-trained officers out there. And um, so it, I realized that it's a matter of that they are now have responsibility for other areas um, and for um, general policing. And I had a very um, good conversation with um, Chief Spiller, who I, fully understand um, why we need more people. I just think it needs to be done in the context of the overall community um, and how we are going to do policing and public safety generally. So hopefully this can be done very, very quickly. But so I would love to hear from uh, City Manager Jerome Robinson where we are in the police recruiting, please. So uh, we are, uh, I think the, the recruitment deadline is, next week, uh, the 19th or the 20th, we've received a number of applications. We anticipate filling the position optimistically uh, in March or early April. Um, but I think, if I may, the one argument that I would make, and I, and I understand, of course, whatever the council gives direction on, but the recruitment process is so long and we can't redeploy. The recruitment process and the training process takes six to 12 months. We cannot redeploy our former traffic police officers to traffic until we have sufficient uh, officers on duty. And, and you know that could happen more quickly or less quickly, but what we're really asking here is to get a head start on that. And if I may, I've worked with a number of police chiefs in this organization, and each and every one of them has emphasized to me the key importance of having traffic officers. Thank you. Thanks for that, 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 that comment. Uh, Council Member Wollison. I have a, a follow-up for um, Ms. Jerome Robinson about the police recruiting. Um, will Chief Spiller be able to stay with our organization until that position is filled? 
Um, Chief Spiller's contract runs through the end of January, and we're in discussions about his the, the link. We will certainly encourage him to stay as long as possible. Okay. Thanks for that that follow up question. So, um, I'll, I'll chime in, and and then we'll we'll go to Councilmember Wilson, and then and then Councilmember Taylor. Um, you, you know, I, I appreciate that there is a, a long lead time. Again, like what we would not be hiring here, we'd be, we'd be, this would just be sort of normal recruits. And again, of course, then, the, so that's the positions that essentially we're, we're opening up, but because the traffic officers will be, be filled with people who are already um, on, on, on the police, or who are already in, 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 in the police department. Um, and, 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 and I, Appreciate that again. Like I said, that th th there's a, there's a, a long lead time. Um, I'm I'm honestly not not there yet as, as far as adding additional personnel to to the police department. Um, uh, for I I just you know I thought part of and not necessarily just the sort of like who's going out on calls, but even like how you know we we approached policing in the city as far as like the beats. I, I thought that we were going to get like a sort of a fuller picture of like how that might evolve and change, and and I haven't gotten it, and so it's it's hard for me then to sort of say that like well let's let's add two more uh, or let's sort of recreate the the, the, the traffic, um, the the traffic division, and so again that that's where I'm at. I'm not saying that like this means that I'm like six months away, <laughs> maybe I'm just a month away. But 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 as I sit here right now, I'm not I'm not I'm not there. And so but um, but let's let's go. Uh, so I think it's clear, and, and that would be for all three positions. So I think it's clear where uh, Councilmember Nash and I stand. It's clear where uh, 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 Councilmember Mueller stands, and so uh, uh, Councilmember Willison and, and Taylor. I'm gonna <laughs> put you guys on the spot to see see where 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 there's a majority of support. Um, thank you, uh, Mayor Combs, and all of you for your thoughts. Um, I am in agreement with um, Vice Mayor Nash and Mayor Combs on this one. Um, given the conversations over the summer um, about police reform and um, some of the things we heard on the town halls, um, and given that we have a new police chief coming online, um, I understand the safety concerns. Um, safety is obviously a huge issue for me um, and something that I, I think about a lot is the role of enforcement versus the role of engineering in, in safety. And I think some of the problems we have with um, some of the behavior of drivers around town, um, not on all the streets, so you know, Bayfront might be different and Sand Hill might be different, but certainly the, the streets that are kind of where um, kids are crossing more regularly, um, like El Camino or Willow or, or Santa Cruz, um, that has to do with engineering and designing our streets so that cars aren't going so fast because as we all know, the police can't be there all the time to enforce. So um, while I think enforcement is part of the puzzle, um, I don't necessarily think it's the root of the puzzle. And I think this all needs to be looked at um, I would definitely be in favor of expediting conversations about policing uh, when the new chief um, comes on board. Um, I'm very curious to learn more about you know, what they're doing in Berkeley, about having non-sworn officers do traffic stops. Um, I think there's a lot of communities that are exploring these issues, and um, I would hate for us to ramp up and then decide we're ramping up in the wrong way. Um, I am also would be interested in more uh, community outreach on this topic, um, possibly looking at some kind of public safety commission um, to, um, to look at this. Um, but I, I think that I, I'm not ready either um, to, to add these back. Um, and you know, that's a hard thing to say because I, I do really respect the, the chief and, and, and the work they're doing. Um, and while I'm speaking, I'll also address the Six Sigma position. I'm kind of in the same place on that position as well. Um, I think there's so much uncertainty right now um, with 
the budget and with COVID and yes, you know, vaccines coming and there's going to be recovery. Um, but, you know, if we're going to add back a position or add, add a new kind of high level management position or management position, I mean, I'd be more interested in adding like some kind of COVID recovery position um, or like Ms. Bramlett says, like disaster coordination or like, I wonder why I get this position, but I just don't see why this position's trumping um, other positions. So um, I'm inclined to do a wait and see on these. Um, we're going to be looking at the next year's budget before we know it. <laughs> um, and I know we're going to be looking at amendments probably again for this year. So um, this isn't our last chance to look at this. So that, those are my thoughts. Thank you, Councilmember Taylor. Thank you, Mayor Combs, um, and I appreciate this discussion. Um, I am feeling the same way um, that Mayor Combs, Vice Mayor Nash, um, and Councilmember Willison um, have, have expressed. Um, and I do also see Councilmember Mueller's um, point. I, I believe that with our new police chief, that that police chief needs to have the tools and resources that he or she needs to be successful, um, but also addressing concerns um, that have been shared um, ongoing um, with the city. And those are the things that I'm concerned about. Um, so how we approach policing in our city for me is extremely important. Um, and I do not see at this time that adding to our police department is actually going to get us there. Um, I think that we need to be talking about this more um, over the next couple of weeks. Um, so maybe we can get there because I do see value in the community service officer um, having known, I believe it was, um, I believe she is Commander Ferguson now, but she was in that position a few years ago. Um, and the value there that was expressed by the principals at the local schools and also some of the students. So I do see value in these positions, but I'm not there yet as far as adding them back. Thank you. Um, Councilmember Mueller and then Councilmember Wilson. I just wanted to thank uh, Councilmember Taylor and thank all of you. I, I respect where all you are, where all of you are on this. Um, I just know in terms of the lead time of how long it'll be before these officers actually were hired, um, and I think it's going to take a while to recruit um, uh, to recruit recruit uh, for traffic officers. And I do think there was that need, but I understand where you all are, and I respect that. Um, um, but I did want to uh, so. So that's fine. Um, I'm not gonna, not gonna. Uh, I, I have, I have uh, no criticism where, where it is, but I, I would, um, I would uh, just ask everyone to just consider, um, like, to go back through those emails of January and December of uh, 2019 of what we were hearing from people around, around enforcement, around traffic enforcement. So people were really, I, I, I can think of um, multiple stop signs. Um, I can think, like, so I, I'm just thinking now of my district, uh, and, and I should speak to it for my constituents, but in Sharon Heights, people were cutting through Sharon Heights repeatedly uh, at very high speed um, over near, uh, over near uh, Oak Knoll School, stop sign, run all the time. And to make those types of engineering changes uh, that we're talking about is a multi-year process. Um, and there were people who were complaining because there were kids present in both places and elderly people trying to walk the street uh, nearby. So I do agree we can make engineering changes in the future and address those things. And I, I do agree we need to have that community conversation. And I, and I don't want this to, to in any way have anyone think I don't support that. I think those are all very important things and we need to look very, we need to, with our new police uh, chief, we need to look at uh, how we're doing, how we're doing enforcement and policing. And certainly I won't, don't want anyone to think I was advocating we bring back uh, all the cuts that, that we made. But uh, I, I do think at some point having, right, you know, we don't have any traffic officers right now uh, they were all shift over uh, to to patrol, 
And I do think at some point um, there will need to be, and, and how, they, how those traffic officers engage themselves is something that we'll have to have that conversation about. But I just, I remember very vividly still the discussions about enforcement with our constituents when it came, with our constituents when it came to, uh, when it came to traffic enforcement. And uh, so, and I'll leave it at that, but I completely respect where, where, where all of you are on the issue and, uh, and look forward to us talking about all these issues in the future. Um, th thanks for that comment, uh, Councilmember Mueller. I, I will also add, I think sort of in support of the ORP position, one of the things that propelled at least me um, to support some of those cuts was what we were hearing from the federal government, specifically the Senate leadership at the time, was that there would not be any state and local government bailout, uh, full stop. Um, that there is, there is going to be different Senate leadership. And so that there is a strong likelihood that there may be, um, or not, I don't know if strong, but certainly more likely than, than before that, that there could be some, some support. And I know like even under these, these, these um, sort of, uh, uh, items, uh, you know, uh, the the city is still still in the positive territory, um, but but again again some one of the main reasons driving that was at least for me was this decision that, that there wasn't going to be any federal government bailout, um, and and then there, there may be some money coming from the federal government for for local local governments. Uh, Councilmember Williston and then and then Councilmember Nash. Yeah, um, I just wanted to clarify to Councilmember Taylor um, that I believe. You were thinking of the school resource officer, um, which is a different position, which is the position that goes into the schools, which is a different position than um, the one on this list. So um, I just have experience with, with that officer through Safe Routes to School work. So I just wanted to make sure you were aware of that. Thanks for that clarification. Council Member Nash. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to mention, um, realizing that public work staff is very, very overloaded, as is our staff generally, um, we did pass um, the speed limits reduction in, well, with the speed limit, speed, citywide speed limit survey. And none of the speed limit signs, to the best of my knowledge, have gone up yet, which reduces the speed. So whenever we can do that, um, while I realize the flip side of it is we don't have the traffic officers to um, be enforcing it, I do think getting the speed limit signs, getting the speeds reduced um, where we can, putting up the re um, new speed limit signs would be very beneficial. And that was in October when we actually passed that somewhat laboriously. So it would be great to see it implemented. Thanks for that comment. So I, it's clear, I think, where we all stand with regards to the, the police department positions. I do want to follow up on the, the senior man, management analyst. I know Councilmember Willison expressed that she was not ready at, at this, this moment to move forward. Um, I would be willing to move forward on this position, but with the caveat that the, the position that became vacant would, would it, if they wanted to start actively recruiting that, that that would have to come to council as like a sort of consent item as just a heads up that this was that this was happening um, because I think to I uh, and I don't know if this is possible so but but before we even see if it's possible maybe there's no support for it anyway and so so we we, we can drop it um, I, I want to give as I see it the opportunity um, for for staff advancement especially in a time when we have asked a lot of staff and, and staff has delivered under very challenging uh, conditions. And so if there is, again, internal people that have been identified and, and that this um, is, a, is a way of, 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 you know, again, putting someone into position that they certainly can have the abilities to do, but also sort of uh, re rewarding, uh, um, you, you know, a staff person um, who, who has contributed to, to the city, I, I'm willing to do that. Um, and open up that opportunity, but I, I'm, I'm not willing to, to again, like sort of add personnel in this, this situation. And so um, that's how I would be willing, that's how I would get my support is, um, you know, is there any interest for anything like that? Or, or is, it, is, it, is it just like, like we're, we're not there yet, uh, even, even for this position? Uh, Councilmember Nash and then Councilmember Wilson. Well, 
I actually think you raise an interesting possibility and I'd be interested in hearing um, student manager Jerome Robinson take on it and also i guess i need a refresher if um if as a city manager you wanted to do something something like that do you actually need where you're you're just taking one head count and moving it to another position um but it is a new position do you need city city council approval for that or is that something that you just could do on your own well pre-covid i could have done it on my own post-covid we try and keep the council in the loop because because of the number of re staff reductions, we wanna make sure that you know how personnel is moving around. And just as a reminder, the council asked us to give you periodic personnel reports, which we are trying to do on the agenda. In this case, we could certainly, I mean, it, you know, it's, it depends. It depends on who's selected for the position. It's not pre-selected at this time, so I can't tell you if I move the widget to this corner, then the other widget will move in. But I'm certainly happy if I'm given the authority tonight to proceed with a, a hiring for that position to come back to the council and let you know what the next step is or would be, if that makes sense, as, as uh, Mayor Combs has outlined. Thanks, uh, thanks for that. And, and I, I, would be, I would be supportive of that. Um, but are, are there any other I mean, other thoughts there? Oh yeah, sorry, Councilmember Wilson. <laughs> uh, that, that's okay. So I, uh, I have a question and then a comment. So Mayor Combs, are you saying that you would be in support of it if it were an internal hire, but not an external hire? Yeah, my understanding, I would not be in support of it as an external hire. My understanding from Mr. Jacobson is that there is a recruitment that has already taken place and they have identified uh, internal people um, to to slot into this this position, if if that is not correct, um, then 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 I, I stand I stand corrected. Well, it's 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 correct I think, but um, I think what Mr. Jacobson said was that there was an open recruitment, which means some internal people applied, and some external people applied, and we developed a list of people that we can now go back to to uh, interview like let's say we interview the top five. So some of those may be internal, some may be external. But if I may, I also wanted to comment regarding the uh, illusion that this is a senior management level staff. It, it is not, it is a analyst position, a senior analyst. So we do have a higher level expectation of their analytical skills and their ability to produce, but it is not a senior management position. And so if I'm understanding uh, city manager, we could then, so there could be, so part of those people have been identified includes possibly external people. But mm -hmm. if we authorized the city to proceed with this recruitment, it would come back to us or we would see it in some form again before it was actually filled. Is that what you were saying or, or, or what exactly were you saying? No, thank you. That That's not what I meant to say. I, I I thought the proposal was that you would give me, assuming I know that you haven't voted on this yet, but I would be given the authority to proceed with this position and hire someone internally or externally and then report back to you on what the next step would be. So one next step could be if it's an internal recruitment that we reevaluate re depending on where that person came from, how we could realign responsibilities within the city. I, you know, um, every day is a little bit different, so it, we would just have to make our best assessment of that. If it's an external replacement, uh, somebody moving into the organization, then that would require a different analysis, and that would be adding to the FTE count at this point. Um, yeah, so uh, th thank you, Councilmember Wilson, for it, it certainly introduces a variable that, that I didn't know existed. I still would be willing to support and move forward, but again, I would say, like, I don't see how, like, um, in a certain pandemic working from home world, how you could put an external person into this position mm -hmm. and they would have, like, uh, you know the impact or value that that you, that we would really want to see. That being said, I would still be willing to um, um, give you the authorization to to proceed with the recruitment. Uh, Councilmember Wollaston and then Councilmember Nash. 
Yeah, um, thank you for the clarification, uh, uh, Ms. Jerome Robinson. Um, so while I, I really respect um, Mayor Combs, your desire to um, you know, reward staff and, and find pathways um, for promotion, um, the way um, I would hate, and I don't, I know you are not saying this, but I would hate to just get a position um, on the books in order to create a pathway. Um, like if it's, if it's a, if it's a job that, you know, we, we now is the time for that job and we need that job. And that one of the benefits of that is having a pathway, um, versus, you know, having the job as a pathway. Um, so I, I still don't think, um, I'm ready, uh, to, to be adding, um, headcount given all the uncertainties with the economic recovery. Um, and so uh, my position um, is still not to add it, but thank you. Okay, totally fair. So uh, we have uh, um, uh, on the senior management analyst position, a yay and a nay. So we're on our hunt for where where, where the other, other votes are coming from. And I'll go to you, uh, Council Member Nash. Thank you. I guess um, I'm looking for more information as to why we're doing this now be, and what sort of other resources, because it seems that um, as soon as you start looking at, at the, how to be more efficient and sort of um, look at how to better do our work, I think that that's an excellent thing to do, but I'm just not sure that's now is the right time. In addition, um, I do understand that when we're, we have lots of change, you know, people are used to it and this is a good time, but it seems like anything that we're doing will also take other headcount away from what they're doing. And so this really does belong as part of our priority setting and looking at the whole um, organization as a whole, rather than doing a one-off right here, as Council Member Willison said. Okay, um, we have two nays and a yay. Uh, so Council Member Mueller or, or can, no, uh, Vice Mayor Nash, did I? Sorry, I'm sorry. Um, just unless um, I can, unless there's some rationalization that I haven't picked up yet as to why specifically this should be the head count that we're pushing ahead. Um, okay. Uh, I'll, okay, I'll let the city manager take that. <laughs> okay, so I'll take a stab at that. So I think uh, Mr. Jacobson really hit a key point and that is the, the uh, organization has really had to change substantially and it's it's really part of how we're functioning now. I mean, if you um, can recognize that we eliminated 42 positions and we're still making progress on many of our technology improvements. And, and again, let me just emphasize if, if there are glitches in the open gov or transparency tools, please let us know that we, we are anxious to get those repaired. Um, so I think in the overall, there's just been so much adaptation already that we think it's a key opportunity to continue that adaptation. It, uh, Vice Mayor Nash, you don't seem movers. So, and what, um, it, if we take an internal person, I assume that they are not going to be trained in this methodology. And so I'm just sort of wondering how, you know, again, it's, well, what happens if, if it's an external person, do they already have the methodology, the information, you know, this system under their belt, um, if it's an internal person? And again, how does that fit into our resource constraints, which I assume you've already thought of, but. Well, we, we certainly have thought about it, but there's so many variables. It's, you know, what if this and what if that? So maybe, um, since this doesn't seem to be going my way, I'm going to propose that we go through goal setting and then uh, have another conversation about this position. I think that, that sounds... Um, uh, Councilmember Taylor and Mueller, is, is that uh, acceptable to you, both of you? Yes. Okay, cool. Right, thank you. Um, so with that, uh, uh, as you can someone correct me if I'm wrong, we sort of wrap up the personnel um, aspect, which is uh, um, attachment A, and then and then there are this sort of non-personnel 
um, attachment to B. So um, who wants to, uh, um, you know, kick it off with their, their thoughts, uh, their, their thoughts here? Council Member Nash. Thank you. I just wanted to make one comment and that's um, actually after hearing more about the downtown lighting, um, I actually am for that. And one of the other reasons is driving downtown at night or walk, walking or being downtown at night, it is quite dark. And I actually see this as a way that we can actually enhance safety without having to reinvent how we're doing some of our street lighting, or at least I'm hoping this will help with some of the um, darkness downtown and also with the vibrancy. Um, but it actually, um, some of the crosswalks are very dark um, as you're driving through and it's, it is difficult to, um, this, hopefully this will enhance it. Thanks for that, that comment. I mean, I'll, I'll just, I am generally, so with that, Vice Mayor Nash, does that mean you're, you're supportive of the list as presented? Or, or were there other items uh, other than the downtown lighting that you um, um, had reservations about? Very honestly, I'm interested in hearing what other. Um, okay. What else? Totally. Said. <laughs> yeah, totally. Fair. So I was uh, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll go over to uh, Council Member Taylor. Well, I was wondering if Mr. Jacobson can bring the list up so we can see what the remaining items past number 14. Is it possible to look at the, the entire list of non-personnel at one time? Uh, yes, it should be. Give me just a second to readjust. The thing that just gets cut, cut off there is that the big, biggest expenditure is the overtime, right? <laughs> um, and then and there there's, or, or I guess it's not technically the biggest one, but it's one of the bigger ones. Okay, at this point, can you see all of the non-personnel items? Yeah, the water rate study is the last one, right? Yes, correct. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I'll just sort of kick off on my thoughts. Um, I'm, I'm generally supportive of of all of the, the, the requests here. I mean, the ones of which, you know, there may be, you know, one here or there of which I have questions, but I, I know that they have council support. <laughs> At least a couple of those, because I've I've been in those meetings and those discussions, and that doesn't mean that someone else can't bring those up. Um, but and so so in that sense, while I you know like while there are there is a like sort of an item or two, um, which I'm not the most comfortable with. Again, like I know that th that there are things that that like have have council support, and so in general, I'm 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 supportive of everything on the on the list. Anyone else want to chime in? Uh, Council Member Taylor. Thank you, Mayor Combs. Um, I'm supportive of everything on the list. Okay, Council Member Willison. Um, yeah, I I could be in support of everything on the list. Um, the tree one gave me pause. Um, of course, um, listening to Ms. Dane, I was you know, persuaded, uh, persuaded. I was, I was curious, you know, I know there's been like adopt a tree things. I don't, I don't know if there's a creative ways, either the chamber or, you know, I don't want to create another program, but just thinking of, um, I, we we're putting a lot of money in downtown. Um, and, uh, it's, it's just, if there's, some creative ways where you know maybe a family or a neighborhood wants to you know adopt tree lighting or something um just i think we might want to start thinking about you know some some creative ways of having um, the community participate in in some of the downtown efforts um but but i i'm i'm flexible on this one i'll support everything and so and so you were talking about the downtown lighting program 
Yeah. Or, yeah. yeah. That, 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 that's also, the one. Also, I mean, maybe it's also a tie into the, the holiday lighting, um, okay. which I know is behind us, but yeah. um, we can talk about that next holiday season, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Council Member Bueller. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm I'm comfortable with all of them. I, you know, to the extent we're going to talk about downtown, like I actually, I actually think the public and our constituents wants us to do more with downtown. What I consistently hear is the downtown is in need of investment. Uh, that the sidewalks are falling apart and dirty, and the streets are cracked. And uh, that the while the downtown uh, parklets for COVID are nice, uh, that we have them, that they don't look like the professional downtown uh, structures that you would want to see for a long term. So uh, I support the downtown lighting, but I think of it as a band-aid of what the what people are really thinking about how they want the downtown to reflect, and some of that uh, will, comes with uh, with uh, renewal of those buildings, but some of that requires city investment and infrastructure investment that um, that just has to take place. It's, it's just really degraded down there. So thank you. Yeah, thanks for that, the, those comments. And I would generally say I, I, I agree with you. Um, like yeah, you, um, I, I think it's a, a, a great quaint downtown but certainly it it is aged right the the um the the sort of light fixtures the, the the wood that seem like they're like literally out of the 1970s or something like that here it, there are definitely lots of things that is that clearly can can be can be updated and so um we do have like right a downtown subcommittee <laughs> um so 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 yeah but but totally agree with you councilman Mueller. um were there any other comments on on this this uh these non-personnel requests and um, okay so um uh, s support for that and so then the the last um uh, attachment were the clerical budget amendments um okay mr jacobson uh yes if i may just to clarify um the non-personnel with the exception of the climate action plan is that correct that that was what i understood Okay, thank you. And uh, I cannot fit all of the clerical ones uh, on the screen at the same size. I can either shrink it down, um, though I think that those may be somewhat more straightforward. Um, yeah, totally. I, I mean, so, so this this is mainly about sort of clear. This is again back to clarification. I, I think more than sort of substantive as as we we sort of address sort of clerical amendments. Um, or are there? Or, does anyone have questions about uh, the, the clerical amendments? Council, uh, Vice Mayor Nash. Thank you. I had a question about the mobile command vehicle cancellation and just, um, I thought that there would be more money, that there was more money expended. And so I was wondering if there was some more money coming back or had already come back or if I was, um, I thought that the original amount was somewhere over $450,000, of which $319,000, if I'm remembering correctly, was coming from the um, general fund um, capital budget, I think, to be paid back by the, um, the law enforcement loans or um, grants. And so I realized that when the um, when the mobile um, command center was actually ordered probably some of those amounts changed some and that we did cancel and there was probably some repercussion with that but can you sort of walk through just in big numbers if there's if we're missing anything or we lost it more than i thought or what happened sure um so to kind of revisit uh, how that uh, happened the mobile command vehicle project was approved at one point um, and so the police department went through the process of issuing an RFP, selecting a vendor, um, and then placing an order. And so the original plan was to have the general capital improvement plan, uh, fund pay for the vehicle initially because the fund balance in the COPS and supplemental law enforcement fund was insufficient to pay for it outright. Um, and then to have that fund repay the general capital fund over the course of several years. 
Um, so there was a cost incurred with canceling the vehicle. I believe it was approximately 45,000. Um, and that did, uh, given that that is not an approved use for the COPS fund, it had to come from the general capital fund. Um, this transfer was uh, essentially erroneously left in um, at the end of the budget adoption process. Um, it was the first transfer from the COPS fund to pay back the general capital fund. Um, and so it is, there, there hasn't been a large amount of actual cash expended at this point, not the full 450,000 because the city did not take uh, ownership the, of the vehicle. Um, and so there doesn't need to be a larger amount paid back at this point. Thank you very much. Councilmember Mueller. I just have a question for our city manager and Mr. Jacobson. Uh, we obviously haven't gone through goal setting yet. And I just wanted to make sure that this, what we're doing tonight, these are just a uh, budget amendments for 2021, but they don't, they don't take in, um, they're not limiting with respect to new uh, new projects that the council is contemplating coming in, in goal setting. Is that right? Or is this somehow limiting our discussion and goal setting? That is correct. And these are largely backward looking amendments to just true up to the audited financials at the beginning of the, the year or the actions that the council took last month. Okay, and just to be perfectly transparent, the reason why I asked that question is because there is the project, well, obviously there are projects with respect to the downtown that I hope the downtown subcommittee comes with, it, but there is also the equity project that um, that I believe council member Taylor and I will be bringing forward with uh, the provost of, um, of, the former provost of Menlo College, looking at a, a, a racial equity baseline for the city uh, with stakeholder engagement. Uh, that uh, would would love to be talking with you all about in the near future. So I just wanted to make sure this wasn't limiting on the ability to have that discussion. Um, and I think that's, Mr. Rome Robinson knows what I'm talking about. So um, with that, uh, I will be quiet. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor Combs. Okay. I was gonna ask the, city, ask the city manager if she wanted to add something, but she went away. So I'm, I'm assuming she did not. Um, but that council member Mueller was also my, my understanding of, of the exercise tonight, tonight too. Um, okay. So were there any other questions with regards to s sort of the, the clerical, clerical amendments? Um, if, if not, I, I think we can, someone can make a, make a motion, right? Um, since there, there seemed to be a, a general, uh, uh, Consensus, um, right? Or, or because, or, or unless, excuse me, I'll, I'll correct. Uh, was there a desire to have a, a debate about the the, the cap? Um, I'm sorry, because uh, that's sort of numbers two and three. Um, did, did someone want to to, to have some questions? Or, or, or uh, council uh, vice mayor Nash. Well, I'm actually hoping there's not a debate and would just like to um, see it go ahead as proposed. Yeah, yeah, and of which I'm, I'm supportive of too, so okay. Um, in which I had thought we'd come to earlier in the meeting, but I just want to double check and make sure. Um, okay, so, so does anyone want to make a motion or I, I can I can make take a stab at it uh, if, if no one else wants to. Okay, so then then the, the motion would be um, that um, to amend fiscal year 2021 budget and authorize the city man, uh, manager to waive uh, or, or sort so, so, so of amend the 2021 budget uh, uh, um, as detailed in attachments B and C, right? Uh, the, those those non-personnel um, uh, 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 items and then the, the, the clerical amendments and then to authorize the city manager to waive the requirements for uh, uh, the uh, existing building electrification project climate action plan one and right is, is that the right one and then authorize the city manager to execute uh, amendments in amount not to exceed approved uh, uh, project budget for the following projects and that would be again c right existing building electrification uh, project climate action plan number one. 
Is that, is that uh, does that does sound right? Okay. Uh, Thank you. So I have a motion on the floor by Mayor Combs with a second by City Council Member Willison to amend the fiscal year 2020 21 budget as in attachments E and C, which are non personnel, authorize the city manager to waive bid requirements, increase the board authority for the specified projects. Is there any further city council questions or discussion? Vice Mayor Nash. Thank you. Um, just that we want to remove the one um, climate action item for $155,000 that we no longer um, are looking for. So this is, um, I put it away so I lost it, but Judy, do you know which one we're, we're talking about? Yeah, I have it noted in the uh, in my notes. It was uh, from line eight, capital implementation, I believe. I'm sure you have it. Good. Thank you. And if not, I can always refer to the video, but I will um, include that in the motion removing that cap item for the 150000 Any further question or discussion? Seeing none, by roll call vote, City Council Member Mueller? Yes. City Council Member Taylor? Yes. City Council Member Willison? Yes. Vice Mayor Nash? Yes. Mayor Combs. Yes. And the motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Okay, with that, I'm um, I think going to do the uh, the the first audible of my mayorality, <laughs> whatever, and, uh, and and switch up the uh, the the the, um, the agenda. And um, my understanding is that that uh, G three and G four are um, have a key time element to them. Um, and so, and so, I'm going to take up those uh, before we get to G2. Um, so, does that uh, on the staff side? Does that that work for everyone? Um, I, I hope it does, since staff is the one who told me to do it. But yes, Mayor Combs, that that works for us. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so, so with the uh, with G3. Um, it is uh, the agenda item G3, authorize the city manager to accept the grant deed for 555 Hamilton Avenue, execute all documents necessary to complete the purchase and approve the appropriation of below market rate housing funds not to exceed $525,000 to purchase and retain property in the below market rate housing uh, program. Um, and with that, I will introduce a management analyst Mike uh, Noche uh, to, to do the presentation. Uh, thank you, uh, Mayor Combs, and uh, good evening, uh, City Council. Mike Noche, Management Analyst with the City's Housing Division. Uh, and for this item, uh, just like item G4, uh, we do not have a, a formal staff presentation. Um, however, uh, we are available for questions. Um, and, and Mayor Combs made my job a little bit easier um, by reading the action uh, that is uh, in front of you. So thank you. Um, uh, if there are any questions about, about the action that is in front of you, again, please please let us know. And I'll, I'll be available for any questions that, that do arise. Great, thank you, Mr. Noche. So with that, let's go into public comment uh, and, and see if there, there is anyone in the public who wants to, to comment on this item. Thank you, Mayor Combs. So at this time, I invite any member of the public wishing to speak on item G3, authorize the city manager to accept the grant fee for 555 Hamilton Avenue, execute all documents necessary to complete the purchase and approve the appropriation of below market rate housing funds not to exceed $525,500 to purchase and retain property in the below market rate housing program. To engage that hand feature on the top right side of your screen, I'll have the opportunity to open up your microphone you may address the city council at this time. And so our first public commenter will be Karen Grove. Karen, if you'd like to unmute yourself and address the city council at this time. Thank you. Um, good evening. I just wanted to quickly comment on this. I am a member of the Housing Commission, but I am speaking for myself tonight. 
um, and I encourage you to approve this staff request. Um, this is one of our BMR ownership units that is for sale and we have the right of first refusal or something like that. We are allowed to buy it before it goes on the open market if a BMR qualified buyer doesn't present in time. And if we don't do this in limited time available, then someone can buy it on the free market and it is lost to us as a BMR unit. So um, it's very important. I'm glad you moved it up so that we're sure to get to it tonight. And I encourage you to vote yes. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Our next public commenter will be Lauren Bigelow. Lauren, if you would like to unmute yourself, you may address the city council at this time. Hi there, my name is Lauren Bigelow. I am a housing commissioner as well, but I am speaking as a private citizen tonight. Um, thank you guys for taking the time to consider this. As a former below market rate administrator um, and somebody very actively involved in the affordable housing world, I cannot stress the importance enough of keeping BMR units in our inventory as affordable units. So I really strongly encourage you to approve this item. Thank you so much and uh, have a wonderful rest of your meeting. <laughs> Thank you for your comment. So this is the final call for any public comment on item G3. And see no hands raised. Mayor Combs, you may continue. Thank you, uh, Clerk Karen. Um, so any, any questions, comments, uh, motions, I will entertain them all. Uh, uh, Vice Mayor Nash. Thank you. I have one question, which I think was explained in the report, but I just want to make clear on that. Um, so right now it's at, um, you have to find, um, there's only 90 days to find a purchaser. When the city purchases it and then becomes an owner, can we now reset it to 100? So it's the standard 180 days, or does it still stay at 90 days because it's somehow attached to the deed? Uh, we would reset it, um, Council Member Nash, to the 180-day uh, uh, window, which is typically uh, enough time for us to find a qualified buyer. Um, and, and, and sometimes that doesn't always happen, and, and the city at that point could do what we're doing today or seeking today. Um, but we would, to answer your question, uh, move it to the 180-day 100 day window. Thank you. Council Member Wollison. Yeah, I just want to uh, point out that there are, looks like 208 households currently on the city's BMR waiting list. Mm -hmm. um, and of those, I think 136 are looking for potentially uh, home ownership. So um, I'm completely in support of preserving this in our housing stock. And I move that we accept the um, motion, the staff report description. How, how do I say this? Um, just, I move to do what it says we're gonna yeah. do. You can, uh, you can read it like directly from the top of the, the you, you don't have to, I think Judy, but but I always just read it directly from the top of the staff report, um, like authorize, move to authorize the city manager to access that one. But, but I, I, think, I think I think we all get the point. <laughs> so, so we have a motion on, 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 the, on the floor and, and, and I see the second. So I have a motion by City Council Member Willison and a second by Vice Mayor Nash to authorize the city manager to accept the grantee for 555 Hamilton Avenue, execute all documents necessary to complete the purchase and approve the appropriation of the low market rate housing fund, not to exceed $155,000 to purchase and retain the property of low market rate housing fund. Any further city council discussion or questions? Seeing none, I will call vote. Councilmember Mueller. Yes. City Council Member Nash. I'm sorry, City Council Member Taylor. Yes. City Council Member Wollison. Yes. 
Vice Mayor Nash? Yes. Mayor Phelps? Yes. And the motion passes with Thank you. Thank you. All right, and with that, we'll move on to item G4, approve a budget amendment of $15,000 in below market rate housing funds and authorize the city manager to execute an agreement with House Keys Inc. to revive below market rate housing program administration services. Um, and here to introduce uh, this item is Deputy Community Development Director Rhoda Kaufman. Good evening, Mayor Combs, uh, Council members. Put my camera back on. You can hear, you can hear me okay. Um, so uh, similar to the previous item, um, this was a no presentation item. Um, and thank you, uh, uh, thank you for reading the um, yeah item, which is to approve a budget amendment, uh, really of just fifteen thousand dollars from the below market rate housing fund to increase our budget so that we can um, continue to pay for BMR administration services. Um, we went out with an RFP, a request for proposals, um, to see uh, if there were um, additional organizations that could provide these services for us. And within the staff report, we, we described um, the results of that RFP. Um, but based on that, I would be happy to answer any questions that uh, you may have. And also, I would note that um, House Keys, uh, the, the, the provider that we've identified as wanting to proceed with, is available um, for any technical questions you may have for them as well. Thank you for that. Uh, let's uh, let's first go to public comment and see if uh, anyone want, from the public wants to to chime in on this item. Thank you, Mayor Combs. So at this time, I'd like to invite members of the public who wish to comment on item G four. Approve a budget amendment of fifteen thousand dollars in below market rate housing funds, and authorize the city manager to execute an agreement with House Keys Incorporated to provide below market rate housing program administration services. To engage that hand feature in the top right side of your screen, I'll have the opportunity to open up your microphone. You may address the city council at this time. Our first public commenter will be Karen Grove. Karen, if you'd like to address the city council now, you may. Thank you. Um, again, very quickly, I just would encourage you to approve the staff uh, requested budget increase. It's a small increase and will lead to significant ongoing savings. And um, from my assessment, and I believe the housing staff as well, um, an increase in cultural competency and efficiency of managing our BMR um, stock. And again, I'm on the Housing Commission, but I am speaking for myself. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Our next public commenter will be Lauren Bigelow. Lauren, if you'd like to address the City Council at this time, you may. Thank you so much again. Short and sweet in my previous life as a below market rate administrator with Alta Housing. Um, I would say that my work was tough and nuanced and so an overall cost of $85,000 is a really good deal. Um, so I absolutely think that you guys should move forward with this proposal. I think that it will work well for our community. Thank you so much. Thank you for your comment. So this will be the final call for any public comment on item G4. And seeing no further hands raised, Mayor Combs, you may continue. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Clerk Karen. And so back to the City Council. Any comments, questions, motions? Council Member Taylor. I'd like to make a motion to approve. Okay. I'll second. That motion. Thank you. So I have a motion on the floor by City Council Member Taylor and a second by Mayor Combs to approve a budget amendment of fifteen thousand dollars 
and below market rate housing funds and authorize the city manager to execute the agreement with Housing Incorporated to provide below market rate housing program administration services. Any other city council questions or discussion? Seeing none, by roll call vote, city council member. Yes. City council member Taylor. Yes. City council member Wilson. Yep. Vice Mayor Nash. Yes. And Mayor Phillips. Yes. And the motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Um, and now, actually, uh, another audible. On, we're we're going to go on to to G five uh, uh, under regular uh, business, which is. Um, Adopt resolution number 6606, authorizing transfers and sales to adjoining property owners of vacated alley currently owned by the successor agency to the now dissolved Menlo Park Community Development Agency. Um, here to introduce the item is, is City Attorney City Attorney Cara Silver. Thank you. Um, this will also be a brief um, item. Um, we do have a PowerPoint primarily just to show you where uh, the property is located. Um, thank you, Judy. So um, next slide. So this is um, basically a housekeeping item. Um, it asks you to authorize us to um, seek authority from the County Oversight Board and the State Finance Department to transfer portions of an already vacated, vacated alley to adjoining property owners. Um, as you may recall, the Council previously authorized this transfer. However, um, when the city staff was putting together the transaction, they realized that the property was actually owned by the former Menlo Park Redevelopment Agency rather than the city. Um, and so since uh, property that is owned by redevelopment agencies um, uh, needs to go through a special process, we are coming back to you um, for authorization to go through that process. Uh, next slide. So the three-step process for um, disposing of a redevelopment uh, agency-owned property is um, the first step, which we're doing tonight, which is to authorize the, uh, have the city council authorize the disposition of the property. And you are doing that in your capacity as the successor agency to the redevelopment agency. Um, as, this, as the staff report has indicated, the redevelopment agency has been dissolved as a matter of law under state law. Uh, the second step is to go to the county oversight board. The oversight board is primarily um, uh, consists of different representatives from other taxing agencies, such as the fire district and the school district and the county. Um, that have an interest in property that is being disposed of because they uh, do receive some of the proceeds from the sale. The third step, once we receive um, approval to dispose of the property from the county oversight board, then we go to the state finance department um, for approval of the sale. Um, the, the purpose of this review is so that the uh, property will be um, so that the oversight board can assure that the property is going to receive um, a, a fair market value and that it is um, that the sales price is, is maximized um, so that the other taxing agencies uh, can receive their share of the proceeds from uh, the redevelopment property. So, next slide. So um, the, the property that we're dealing with is just a very um, small alley portion between 1305 and 1345 Willow Road. It was abandoned and or vacated, as I, as I mentioned, by this council in March 2019. Um, it's, a, it's an undersized parcel. Uh, the city recently commissioned um, an appraisal for that property. Um, and the, because that's a requirement for the uh, county oversight board and the appraisal came back at $100 a square foot, which is equivalent to um, the value that the council um, 
um, authorized in the purchase and sale agreement with um, the um, Southern uh, property owner, the, which is currently the, uh, the, the uh, market. Uh, so the parcel is going to be split roughly down the center. The northern portion would be sold to Midpen for a dollar, and the southern portion would be uh, sold to um, the trust that owns the property where the, the Seleska market is currently located. And then both properties would be required to merge um, the vacated alley with their larger properties. And given the size of, of this small property, we don't think that it's marketable to other um, property owners that are, are not um, adjacent owners. Next slide. So you can see the, the property um, that we're dealing with is that blue shaded alley portion. And, and here's the context of the property to the north, which is going to be the mid-pen uh, new development. There's currently development there, but obviously it's a, a redevelopment project. And then to the south is the property where Celeste Market is. Next slide. So the recommendations that we need are number one, to adopt the resolution which, which authorizes the sale of the vacated alley to the adjacent property owners. And then the second um, action item is to authorize staff to proceed to seek approval from the county and the state for the sale of this property. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you for that presentation. If we could just go to public comment first, because I just don't want that to get lost. Um, in some... Thank you, Mayor Combs. So at this time, if any member of the public wishes to speak on item G5, adopt resolution number 6606, authorizing transfer and sale of adjoining properties, owners of vacated alley currently owned as a separate agency to the now dissolved Menlo Park Community yeah, Development Agencies, okay. please engage that hand feature in the top right side of your screen. I'll have the opportunity to open up your microphone and you may address the City Council at this time. So this will be the final call for public comment on item G5. I'm seeing no hands raised. Air phones may continue. Thank you, Clerk Karen. Uh, Councilmember Nash, you, you had a, a comment or a question. I have a clarifying question, and that's um, if uh, we could get the last slide up as far as what the steps are that we have to do. Please. I just had a question. Is there any concern about the city council adopting a resolution authorizing a sale that may or may not be approved by the county oversight board? And what happens if for any reason the county oversight board or in the state department of finance decide that we are not, um, it is not appropriate to sell um, for $1, which I don't have a problem with. I'm just wondering how this plays out. Thank you, uh, Council Member, or Vice Mayor Nash for that question. So the council actually already did approve um, the sale, um, although it was um, not reflective of the current um, uh, ownership uh, for this property. And the um, input that we've received from the oversight board and from the state um, the state finance department is that they do need the council to adopt this authorizing resolution before they can um, give their approval. So um, I, we've talked to both parties um, in connection with, with this procedure and they understand that the sale at this point is subject to um, oversight board and, and state um, board approval. Do we know, um, I mean, if they don't approve it, they just come back and say, we don't approve it. And at that point we have to change course. Um, there's no repercussions for, for that. Right. So the, we're, we're pr fairly confident that they will approve the sale to uh, this, the, the trust property. 
Um, the reason for that is that it's a fair market value and it's supported by the appraisal. We're not as sure about the um, um, the sale to the to mid pen, and so um, we will be having further discussions with with the oversight board uh, staff regarding that particular issue. Um, what we would hope to do is set it up so that if um, a sale is not authorized, that we get some feedback from the department or from from the oversight board as to you know what a reasonable value um, they they would consider to authorize the sale, and we you know it it may be that they would just authorize the sale at some value um, more than one dollar and then we would come back to the council um, to discuss that issue before going on to the state is there any concern with selling half and then possibly having the other half be in a be in limbo in other words rather than keeping it as a whole right so um I guess that's an operational issue. This, the, the alley has already been vacated. And so there's no public use for the alley. Um, the property might be more marketable as a larger piece of property. Um, so the council may decide that if the oversight board says, you know, no to the mid pen project, maybe the, the council would um, want to reconsider the sale to um to Celeska, that could be a possibility i think in in any in either event though if if um the oversight board um does deny the the, the sale at one dollar to mid pen we would come back to the council for further discussion and so given all of this you're you're this is what you're recommending yes thank you Any other uh, questions or comments? Um, uh, Councilmember Wollison. Oh, I'm ready to make a motion. Okay. I think you can just say you move. I think that's fine. <laughs> okay, I move to adopt this resolution. Yeah. As written. All right, I'll second. Thank you. So I have a motion on the floor by City Council Member Wilson and a second by Vice Mayor Holmes to adopt resolution number 6606, authorizing transfers and sales to adjoining property owners of the vacated alley currently owned by the successor agency to the now dissolved Park Community Development Agency. Any further City Council discussion or question? Seeing none by roll call vote, City Council Member Mueller? Yes. City Council Member Taylor? Yes. City Council Member Willison? Yes. Vice Mayor Nash? Yes. Mayor Phelps? Yes. And the motion passes unanimously. Thank you, uh, Clerk Karen. Okay, with that, we'll we'll move to uh, back to G2, um, which is to provide direction on the annual goal priority settings and um, here to introduce the item will be Assistant City Manager Nick Pagaris. Uh, uh, Council Member Wilson. Uh -huh. Can I request a, a five-minute break? Yeah, you, you may. I actually was gonna gonna suggest that. So okay, so, so let's you. um uh let's reconvene at eight fifty-five. Does that does that work for everyone? Okay, cool. Perfect. So please disengage all webcams and microphones and only engage your webcams.
Welcome back. Having all members of the City Council return to our virtual days, they are called to be reconvened. Thank you, Clark Heron. Um, so, yeah, I was teeing up a G2, which is to provide direction on the annual goal priority setting process for the city. And, and um, as I was saying before, uh, Assistant City Manager Nick Pagueras, uh, who is going to join us to introduce this item. Uh, we can't hear you here. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just one second while I set up my screen. Um, can you see the presentation? Not currently. No, okay. Um, what's going on here? So we see it as uh, the note slides. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, uh, well, happy uh, New Year, Council members. Uh, it's exciting that we're uh, launching into 2021 here, and I'm very pleased this evening to uh, present uh, the item uh, before you this evening, which is to receive direction from City Council on uh, the 2021 goal or priority setting uh, session. Uh, so the direction we're looking for tonight is um, that the council identify your preferred uh, process. Uh, we've identified in the staff report three uh, different options. However, the council, is, as as um, as this process has has evolved over the many years, uh, clearly uh, any of the three uh, may uh, help achieve the the objective of the council, and there may very well be an additional. And an unidentified option or alternative. Uh, if uh, possible, uh, we would also like to uh, drill down into some details such as date, time, and uh, the, the public interest or public input process. So just uh, very quickly, uh, one of the reasons we're here this evening is that uh, the goal setting helps uh, form our uh, development of the fiscal year budget for the upcoming fiscal year. It also uh, helps us prioritize what resources are available for the remainder of this fiscal year. So from now until the end of June uh, is our is fiscal year 2021, and then July 1 we begin fiscal year 21-22. Um, <clears throat> the uh, traditionally we kick off the budget preparation with the annual goal setting and priority setting process to Councilmember Mueller's earlier uh, question about whether the mid-year changes were in, would influence the uh, annual process of uh, goal setting, uh, and the answer to that was no. Um, we uh, regularly will bring uh, mid-year changes to the council this year. Our budget amendments are more frequent due to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, uh, but also at that goal setting session, the council provides policy direction on budget principles for preparation of next year's budget. Uh, this year will be a uh, challenging budget as has already been highlighted in a number of uh, discussion items the council has had this evening. Uh, still, There is still a great deal of uncertainty relative to reactivation and uh, what our services will look like uh, in, the, in the next fiscal year and then the fall and into the future. Um, <clears throat> so the budget principles are, are an essential element that if we can uh, have those uh, identified by the end of Feb by the middle of February, end of February, uh, that will help us uh, move forward with the budget preparation. Um, there's also from January to April, there's a great deal of internal staff work. Uh, we um, are working on our operating budget assumptions, et cetera. Won't read through all of the um, items there. And then finally, we get uh, to the May, May and June timeframe, which is when we do the review, the public discussion, and ultimately the council adoption on June 22nd. Uh, so as uh, mentioned earlier, we've identified three um, possible options. Uh, more uh, articulated, greater articulation is can be found in the staff report. 
but effectively uh, just to start with what we have historically done our sort of status quo option um, in the past we have had uh, financial updates i think that that's perhaps particularly uh, relevant uh, this year as we begin uh, the budget setting or uh, the uh, goal setting process and definitely the budget setting process um, We've also used this opportunity to have the city council conduct its annual review of its procedures. And um, as you uh, may, may recall, uh, towards the um, end of last calendar year, we uh, presented a number of uh, draft procedures uh, and updates, recommended edits for city council consideration. And the council at the time had um, agreed to it with the recommendation to defer uh, adoption of those procedures until the new council is seated. Uh, so that's uh, definitely something that can happen between now and uh, and February. Um, again, the budget principles, and then finally at the end, sort of the deliverable of our of our uh, status quo process uh, is that the council reaches consensus on your 2021 uh, priorities and adopted work plan. Uh, I will say that uh, for for those council members who have uh, you all most of most of you even Councilmember Wilson as a member of the public has have participated in class in past priority uh, goal setting sessions. Um, one of the I would say perhaps more um, substantive changes that happened over the last couple of years is really narrowing down the work plan from a collection of upwards of 90 individual projects to five or so top priorities and a number of um, work plan projects. Uh, a lot of the projects went into the capital improvement plan, so it, does, it doesn't mean that, that um, the delta between what we have today and uh, that 90 or so plus list entirely disappeared. It just acknowledged the differing uh, level of um, city council engagement, public engagement necessary for certain projects over others. And, you know, I, I, I could never, I, I, I just uh, can't commend the council uh, enough uh, with staff and with the community and with Facebook for making, making such a considerable progress on the uh, Menlo Park Community Center. Uh, about this time last year, our community campus, uh, about this time last year, the council made the decision to make the MPCC one of its top priorities. And that really provided clarity for us as staff uh, and as well as uh, the commissions, even in light of uh, a pandemic and the crisis that that had uh, has diverted so many resources away from uh, what uh, was in existence prior to COVID-19. But just having that those top five priorities really helped uh, move projects forward. It provided clarity in how uh, resources uh, should be devoted when there is a question, do we work on project A or project B? One of the first questions we ask is, is, is uh, which one or both are, is on the um, city council priority list? So that narrowing of top five has been, um, has been incredibly helpful um, in, in, in mustering the resources necessary to, to make significant progress like you did this evening. Um, and so all that said, a status quo would result in some priorities and a work plan uh, for city council adoption at their next regular meeting. Um, acknowledging this year is very much unlike previous years, uh, namely in the area of budgetary resources. I would say if we go back the last five years, budgetary resource, resources were less of a consideration uh, in the goal setting process. Um, there were there were trade-offs that were necessary. However, the city's financial condition was quite strong. Um, <clears throat> this year, uh, we clearly have a number of, a uh, confluence of a number of, uh, of circumstances that uh, will have a direct impact on what our um, capacity is for the 2021 uh, uh, goal setting or priority setting process. Um, and we have completed the, the transition to district elections. And I know that the <laughs> council has had uh, several questions or discussion points over the last couple of years about the um, how, if at all, district elections in, inform how resources are allocated and priorities are made. And uh, now that all members of the council are 
uh, have been elected by district if the council desires to go down uh, to, to explore more fully how resources are, are delineated by district, uh, this may be a time to do that. Um, so the new process effectively uh, would start with uh, the council uh, adopting your budget principles. So staff, much like this recommend or much like this report, would make a recommendation on February 9. Um, we would likely have a special meeting for council procedures uh, to to work through those. Um, the council could adopt or set a subcommittee uh, to prepare an alternative process for council to then uh, act on and and um, help to inform um, uh, subsequent uh, goal setting processes. Uh, under this, we one of the questions is, you know, how do we balance the resources necessary to establish a new process with continuing to make progress on top priorities and uh, the, the, the thought here would be that there would be no change to the 2020 adopted priorities which are in the staff report and that the new process could conceivably be uh, implemented either um, as soon as possible after after their uh, after they, the subcommittee has completed their work and the council has approved the new process or it could wait until 2022, which brings me to the final uh, sort of identified option. Uh, the hybrid is effectively the new process uh, with two uh, distinctions. The first is that uh, there would be a slight, recommend a slight adjustment to our top priorities. As you know, um, <clears throat> the uh, tra TMP, the tra Transportation Master Plan was a top priority and uh, council adopted the, the report and the plan uh, late last calendar year. Uh, that falls off. There are other things that, that jump on us. Uh, for example, Climate Action Plan number one, and we had the discussion this evening about number three, uh, Safer Bay, which is uh, Safer Bay Implementation Plan which is a sea level rise uh, response and uh, may cover, uh, may, may have, uh, or has a, a good deal amount to do with climate action plan number six. And then finally, perhaps most critically, uh, as we look to emerge from the uh, pandemic is uh, rebuilding our library and community services uh, department. Um, no, the uh, budget adoption for 2020-21 affected every single department in a number of ways, uh, none perhaps as, as striking as uh, the impacts that it has had on our uh, library and community services team. Uh, the department has experienced a tremendous number of uh, budget reductions. It's uncertain as to when exactly we will be able to begin to restore those, those programs, but we do want to take the time now to begin planning for six to nine to 12 months out, uh, reactivating and rebuilding our, our services. And so uh, there, there is a, an, an element, uh, or, or there are resources necessary to devote to that. And then finally, uh, as I mentioned earlier, whatever new process is recommended by the subcommittee and then ultimately adopted by council could be used in 2022. Um, so with that, just very quickly summarize, uh, we're seeking council direction on your preferred process and if possible, date and time for the, uh, for the public meeting. So with that, I am happy to answer any questions. Thank you, uh, Mr. Pigaris, for the presentation. Let's go to uh, public comment. Do Mayor Combs. So at this time, if any member of the public wishes to speak on item G2, which is provide direction on the annual goal setting uh, process, please engage that hand feature in the top right side of your screen. I'll have the ability to open up your microphone and may address the city council at this time. And our first uh, public commenter will be Adina Levin. Adina, if you'd like to unmute yourself. You may address the city council at this time. Um, good evening, Mayor and City Council. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we All can. All right, excellent. All right, uh, Azina Levin, and um, uh, speaking uh, it to the letter sent by Menlo Together, and uh, uh, 
thank you for your leadership at this challenging time as uh, you know COVID still continues and it's a time of constrained resources and uh, uncertain recovery. Um, so we do support the general direction outlined in the staff report with a few initial comments. And I'm gonna to speak to the set of uh, priorities and then make a brief point as an individual if I have time on the process. Um, so so a, a couple of the points are about the priorities, but wanting to broaden those a little bit more than the narrow uh, framing in the staff report. So first of all, the housing element is really essential, both as a legal requirement and as a process that can help the city of Menlo Park to take steps to address housing unaffordability and the legacy of segregation. And as part of this goal, um, in addition to the specific legal requirements of the housing element, um, the, the city council may consider prioritizing other policies and projects to increase housing production, preserve affordable housing, and protect renters that aren't strictly legally required for the housing element update. Um, similarly, um, we strongly support the priority on rebuilding library and community services as important for a year in which we expect the pandemic to lift and restoration of services to be important. However, we think that this item could be reframed as rebuilding city services to achieve an equitable COVID recovery that you know may or may not be strictly within the walls of rebuilding library and the community services department. And um, lastly, in advancing the community, the, the climate action plan, we strongly support the building electrification and electric vehicle charging as mentioned in the staff report. However, um, the city council should also consider prioritizing within the city's regular transportation planning, several items that could also advance the climate action plan um, in ways that reduce vehicle miles traveled, for example, in the capital improvement plan, um, to uh, advance projects that reduce uh, driving as well as in the standard process um, advancing a transportation management association. Um, so the, um, those are suggestions about slightly broadening these priorities um, to address the needs of the time. Lastly, a personal opinion on the process rather than having a committee to go through the process taking away time would uh, personally prefer that the city council uh, move on actually setting the priorities rather than thinking about how to do so. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Our next public commenter will be Lynn Bramlett. Lynn, you're off mute and able to address the city council at this time. Yes, hello. Um, first, I appreciate your thoughtful discussion on the item of G1. I think a lot of ideas were brought up that made for a richer discussion tonight and in the future. And I, I think that's one reason why we need a process that will involve the public with input. And that can also come by giving a survey. But the kind of conversation I'm really interested in is a real examination of the services. For example, I'm looking here where it says the majority of the city staff perform duties mandated by law or considered baseline public services. And you know, year after year, I, I see that very little of their time is really devoted to additional projects, but the general assumptions, I don't see those questioned. And in the case of libraries, you know, of course I think reading is very important and so forth, but we actually can get a lot of services just by neighboring jurisdictions, whereas we have an opportunity to, you know, give some services that would add some value that, that we don't have, for example. So what I'm advocating for is looking at that and also more facts. This report does talk about so you know duties mandated by law, and the staff were even asked what those were, but the details were actually not supplied. Um, instead, it, you know, for example, it said new state mandates expose the city to the risk of a lawsuit. Well, I do want to point out that there have been quite a few man so-called mandates, or not so-called, they were mandates, that we actually weren't following. For example, we had to be sued by East Palo Alto to do a housing element. Um, we didn't have a debt management policy. And right now, we have, a, we have a mandate to have emergency operations plan, 
But what we have is really a check off the box plan that somebody put forth in 2009, and it's remained fundamentally unchanged since then. I'm talking about maybe some word changes, that's about it. And it doesn't follow FEMA's best practices. Um, you know, I can elaborate in detail in the interest of time, I won't. So my point is, I, I, I think we need council, I'd like you to get more details around that. So that really can be explored. Because, you know, I, I see these reasons why the staff can't do more, but I think our whole model is what needs to be looked at. Just what services we have, what don't we have that we really need. And, if, and because we don't have them, just what are the consequences going to be? So please use this time during COVID to really take a heart, as I know you're doing, and I applaud you for that, um, you know, Take, take a look at the whole model. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. So this is a final call for public comment on G2, provide direction on the annual goal setting, uh, the goal setting process. Our next public commenter will be Pamela Jones. Pamela, if you'd like to unmute yourself, you may address Good the evening. city council at this time. It's perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Pamela Jones, uh, resident of Menlo Park, um, Mayor Combs, Vice Mayor Nash, Council Members Mueller, Taylor Wilson, and staff. Um, I, it's goal setting, so I'm bringing a reminder that um, that you may want to put the districting um, on your on your goal setting uh, beginning at this time. Uh, although we're not sure when our uh, census is going to be released. It could be as late as August. There is le legislation for that. It does not mean that we cannot begin to uh, hear what the community desires for um, the type of commission. Uh, we also need to put money aside for um, staffing and as well as for demographers and something we have not done in the past and, and because we didn't have time. And that is put out a bid for demographers because there are uh, a number more simply because so many of the public agencies have gone to districting uh, in the state of California. Uh, so I'm hoping that you will put this on your work plan and uh, so that we can begin the process now. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Any final public comment on item G2? Seeing none, Mayor Holmes, you may continue. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Clerk Heron. Oh, pardon um, my pretty interruption. Oh. There might be one. I saw a hand flicker. There we go. Uh, Leah Elkins, would you like to address the City Council at this time? Yes, I would. I'm sorry. i maybe not operating my little hand properly. Um, okay, yes. Hi. Um, my name is Leah Elkins, and I'm a Menlo Park resident over the last 23 years. And um, most of you know me, um, but uh, I just want to say that I, I am speaking tonight as a private citizen and not as a member of the Environmental Quality Commission. As you all know, I've been advocating for a ban on gasoline-powered leaf blowers for a couple of years now. And ironically, the city's adoption of the Climate Action Plan, along with the stated goal of becoming carbon neutral by 2030, has seems to have pushed the possibility of such a ban further away. This is because it was decided that gas blowers were not a significant enough contributor to the total amount of greenhouse gas emissions to warrant taking any action on them, despite a general recognition that they are gross polluters. By now, I'm sure you're all aware that these machines have no um, emissions controls and spew all their toxins, toxins directly into the air that we breathe. And studies have concluded that operating a gas leaf blower for an hour emits the equivalent amount of hydrocarbon as driving a Toyota Camry from here to Denver. But the reality of the situation became even more clear over the last year. In 2020, many of us were forced to shelter in our homes and to, re to work and to go to school from our homes. Many, many Menlo Park residents noticed that gas leaf blowers also make a lot of unbearable noise, noise that enters through double paned windows and seemingly 
goes on all day in many places. In late summer, our state was devastated by wildfire. Our skies literally turned orange from the smoke. We were advised to stay inside. We had 30 continuous spare the air days. As gardeners continued to operate their gas blowers during these conditions, 300 Menlo Park residents signed my online petition to ban these machines. Our air is precious, our peace and quiet is precious, and our ability to enjoy the outdoors is precious. And there is a solution to this problem, and it is obvious. Electric blowers are as efficient as gas-powered blowers. They can be used to do the same job. So I'm asking you tonight to consider this as a priority for 2021. I want to speak for a second about the burden on city resources and city staff, as we've just been talking about budget. Um, I believe that creating a ban would not be unduly burdensome on either of these things. The research is easy to compile. Portola Valley and Atherton, among many other cities in California, have already done this research and, and created city uh, staff reports on the matter. Um, model ordinances are readily available. Therefore, I urge the council to respond to the pleas of your constituents and bring the process of passing a ban on gas power blowers um, and begin the process of passing such a ban. And um, I'm happy to get to you a copy of those signatures in whatever way is best. I, uh, um, there's over 800 signatures, but only 300 of them are from Menlo Park. So it's a little um, hard to read them all. Um, so whatever way would be best for me to get you those names, I'm happy to do it. Thank you for your comment. Looks like our final public commenter will be Lauren Bigelow. Lauren, if you'd like to unmute yourself, you may address the city council at this time. Thank you so much for the opportunity to comment tonight, city council, yet again. Uh, I am sure that you are growing weary of my introduction, so I'll spare you. Um, but at this point, I just really wanted to say that I applaud your efforts. Um, I know that trying to deal with austerity measures and budget is really, really tough and one of the things that I think that we have found over the last year um, being in the COVID-19 pandemic is that our homes are even more important than they have ever been and that having homes is something that can drastically impact all of our communities health so i really wanted to encourage you to try try uh to find some more funding for our community development um as as we know we are in a housing crisis we are in a pandemic and it seems like a natural solution to try and allocate resources towards getting more housing taken care of. But to do that, our city staff actually needs to have capacity. So I promise that I am not here at any city staffer's behest, um, but I just wanna say that I work in a city and with a city right now that is not Menlo Park and it is remarkably difficult to move forward with housing work without having city staff have support. Um, so I would really encourage you to get creative uh, and see if you could find any ways to make more staff happen for the community development group. Thank you so much. Thank you for your comment. I have pausing because I thought I saw a hand flicker. Just a couple more seconds. Then there's a hand feature in the top right side of the screen. If you select it once, it should engage and turn green. 
and seeing no hands raised, microphones may continue. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Clerk Karen. Um, so I struggled a bit today with how how to frame this this discussion. Um, so what I want to do initially is to bring Mr. Pagaris back on and, and make sure like I'm understanding at least um, um, the direction the staff is seeking and what we're doing here. And so in theory, we're talking, this discussion is about process, correct? And not delving into substantive issues about what is or isn't a priority is 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 that as you see it or 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 no because obviously the two can easily get muddied um but if it is the case that we're just processing like i, I certainly want to sort of stick to that um as as much as possible as, as a way to again to like frame the, the discussion tonight yes thank thank you mr mayor the um by all means, the uh, city council um, staff is not asking the city council this evening to identify priorities. We are focused on uh, process. Um, the references to priorities uh, shown in the staff report were meant to sort of spark conversation. And I see that there are perhaps, um, there are two options here. The first is to do what we substantially did in 2020, which is to leave the top priorities as effectively is, as they are. Um, and there's clearly a, a good amount of work that needs to happen on most of the priorities that were that are carrying over from 2020. As part of the council's annual priority session that you do sort of, you handle it in two phases. Uh, first is, basically confirm that you want to carry over the priorities from the previous year. And then you ask the question, do you want to add priorities for the current year? And uh, typically uh, how that process evolves is that we have um, a presentation from staff that just gives a very quick update on whatever elements the council would like an update on. Uh, part of that could be a identification of what um, staff is currently working on that's new and the best example there is the climate action plan uh, it has not been added as a priority uh, but that's something the council may consider adding to the priority list uh, and then at the end hear from the public hear you know understand what is of interest to the public and then have the conversation between council and staff about what is realistic and and how the how what can we realistically accomplish in the next in the next uh, 12 months so um today we're, we're really hoping to focus on the process aspect um there was uh, over the past five years with council with the city of Menlo Park, we've had goal setting and priority setting processes that took four hours, and we've had some that have taken cons considerably more. And and again, we want to make sure that we're providing the council with the information and um, format that makes most sense to move forward with a priority setting. Cool, thanks. And then so staying on on that idea of the process now. Like option two, so like is is that geared at like this year? It it seems as though like based on just the time that like that whole like sort of a new approach, a subcommittee looking at things like vision statement and statement of values, um, and then sort of bringing that back. That seems like that would be something that couldn't really be completed. Um, in in a short period of time and so we would be thinking of so is that about like the next is that about like sort of 2022 and then like we essentially don't do anything really this year and and the focus is about like sort of establishing this this new process um or, or do you sort of envision like option two being something that can like roll out over the next few weeks no, uh, most definitely not roll out in the next few weeks. I think there's some substantive questions that uh, will require time to uh, identify you know, questions do, that does the city council want a facilitator, a professional facilitator to help through the discussion. Vision, uh, priorities, value statements, all of those things will take time. 
the reason I bring it up right now is that if there is a desire to happen for that to happen, um, it need that may take, let's say, four to six months in order to sort of get to a place where the council could then implement um, implement that process. And I would see say that there are probably there are two options there. Uh, the first would be to do the to do goal setting once you've agreed on that process. So that could let's say happen in August, which is outside of our normal cycle. Um, but there's lots that's not normal in 2020 and 2021. And so this may be a good sort of transition year. The other option would be to adopt that process this year. And since there will be no change of council next year, uh, that's the process that we would use in, in January of 2022. Could one option be that that like we agree to or commit to what generally is the status quo for for this you know for this year so we do have an actual goal setting session where there can be public input uh, but we commit to some changes um, more substantive like option two and and they would be rolled out not. August, which is the soonest you could do it, but you would actually have time and 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 they would roll out uh, early twenty or that process would sort of kick off like early early twenty twenty two again, given that it would all be in in place is is that an option or is is in that that essentially having an actual priority goal setting process at all this half um, bars the sort of exploratory uh, because of staff constraints and other things that that sort of exploratory um, endeavor with regards to making making changes uh, uh, going going forward um, and I, I only I say this I know because I know that that you are or staff is responding to um, a council desire to have changes in the process um, and, and so uh, to, to some degree and, and so I know you're responding to that um, but but uh, but again, want to get some sense of of like what is an apples to apples comparison here, and, and and what what sort of is mutually exclusive of something else. Um, my apologies uh, to council and members of the public, uh, Vice or Mayor Combs. Uh, what you outlined is the intent of the hybrid option. So basically, uh, move forward. I, I guess the question would be. Um, uh, that that is effectively the that was the intent behind the hybrid and I apologize if I didn't communicate that clearly. Okay, no, I'm pretty sure it was it was it was on the receiving and I'm pretty sure the communication was 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 fine. Um, okay, with, with that, I, I um, again, like I said, I, I, I don't have any real framing here. <laughs> we can we can take this other than than I, I do think it is it is important to to focus on on the process and and not. Um, if possible, get into 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 the substance. Even though I know that that, that is really tempting to do, um, I, I say that speaking for myself. Uh, Councilmember Willison. Um, thank you, Mayor Combs, and um, thank you to the members of the public who um, made comments and and requests for the goals and priorities that are important to them. Um, as a member of the public up until recently, I uh, made many of those comments, so I know what it feels like, and um, persistence is, is the word that I would like to just uh, throw out there. Um, so I've, as uh, Mr. Pergoro said, watched and, and participated in many, many years of goal setting, um, and one thing that just struck me that I feel like um, would be helpful, and it, it's it's there's no framing to this, um, Mayor Combs. Um, but over the last month, um, as a new council member, I've had the privilege of getting to sit down with each department and kind of go through what's on the department's plate. So I had meetings with community development, with uh, community services and library. Uh, with public works and I got to see kind of what what's in the queue um, kind of what they see as what staff sees as kind of the priority that they're working on um, and that's been a really helpful framing for me 
And when I think about past goal settings and these types of conversations that I've witnessed in the past, um, what happens is you get a lot of like apples and oranges and bananas. Um, and, you know, people are throwing out different priorities of different magnitudes that affect different departments. Um, some are more uh, resource constrained, some are more budgetary constrained, some are more politically constrained. Um, but a lot of them kind of fall by department um, in terms, I think that's how staff, um, my sense is that there are some priorities that are more kind of global and institutional, but a lot of them are, are more um, department based. Um, so like what would be, I'm just throwing this out and seeing if it sticks at all. So I haven't like thought this out, um, but I, I could envision kind of a session where um, you know, we have an agenda by department and then the department makes a presentation of um, this is what we are currently working on. This is what is in the CIP. This is what's in the budget, everything that kind of like touches that department. And then the council can kind of look at what they're doing and discuss, does that still jive with what they, what we want them to be doing or the way they're seeing those priorities, the way we're seeing those priorities, are there new things we want to add to that queue? what would bump what, um, and then move to kind of the next department. Um, I think um, I understand that kind of the old way of 90 projects um, was overwhelming. And I'm thinking maybe that was because it wasn't organized right. I think um, we might have swung too far to the top five thing um, and kind of gotten away. I, I need to see the whole picture and sometimes I don't understand as a member of the public or council, what makes one project like the IT master plan, for example, and I appreciate all the work going into the IT master plan. I really do. I know it's very important for the organization, but I don't know if there's like a council member like champing that, that would see that as their priority um, versus maybe a bike lane project that, that a council member was really passionate about. It, um, I feel like some method that we could put all of those projects out there in an organized manner, and then we can react to them um, systematically uh, would be something I know that doesn't match any of these options that you've given us, um, but kind of my, my top level. And then the other piece of feedback I have is um, the city council procedures. I know that's something um, important, but I see that doesn't necessarily have to take time out of the goal setting, priority setting um, time. Um, and also um, a lot of the time I've seen in the past has been dedicated to um, like giving the budget or the financial picture of the city. Um, and I would just, I feel like we kind of get it. <laughs> um, I'm just spending a little bit of time on that and on the resource constraints. And then, like I said, if, if we were to, do something like this departmental thing, then that specific category could potentially have a little intro. But um, I'm just thinking some way to have both, you know, the details and the bigger picture. Um, and that that was just kind of an idea I had as I was sitting here because I too preparing for this staff this item on the agenda was the most perplexing one for me because it's the most um, nebulous. So. Those are my my initial thoughts, but I'm really open to hearing what everybody else has to say. Thank you for those uh, comments, uh, Councilmember Wilson. Um, Mr. Pagero, so if, is is that sort of like a department by department kind of like day just is that something that could be uh, incorporated into like a goals and priority session in February? Or is that something staff sees as being sort of fundamentally different? And so that would be something that would be part of uh, of a, a work plan for for 2022. That, I, uh, excellent question. Um, and Council Member Willison's um, uh, the, the idea of, of seeing everything, the big picture is, um, Definitely something that we uh, have strived to accomplish in the past with varying uh, levels of, um, uh, I guess, satisfaction. 
so uh, j just on the topic of looking at a department by department review, um, if there is a desire, for example, to dive into the um, resources or capacity by um, functional area. Let's say that sort of pr provides a foundation from which we begin to look at, at all of this. Um, there are um, There is a good amount of work that needs to go into that. Um, staff hasn't, uh, hasn't prepared that yet, uh, but that said, um, that's something that we can explore a little further and, and at least uh, in a and and um, identify just what timeline would, would would work for that. I don't want to commit the organization. That's a pretty big ask uh, by way of um, prep work and making sure that we are responsive to the request. But Mr. Pigueros, what if it if it's that the ask is just like that each department head comes in during this priority session and talks for like about you know, 15 minutes about what their department is doing, like what, what's what's their goals for um, for 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 2021. Um, isn't that something that would be sort of easily doable? Because again, I, I, I completely get their sort of like, if we're getting into this larger sort of capacity analysis based on each, each department, there could be, I mean, yeah, easily like a, a lot of work. Um, and, and maybe that is where a majority of the council ultimately wants to go. Um, but could we sort of dip our toe into something like that? Again, you know, just having like a scenario where we we put a you know, because I would find that to be honest, like more fruitful than than talking about sort of like some of the stuff like goals and values and stuff like that, like or like the the, the values and principles, like, right? The principles and values are in what you do, not, not what you say, right? Um, and so, so if we could get more quickly into what we're doing, um, then I think that that would make some of those other things moot. And and so I would be more interested in, but you know, at least having that 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 overview, and then maybe we like decide as a council to like, oh no, this is definitely not the right way to go. And so let's not have staff invest in sort of this type of department level analysis. Um, I think I, I think um, uh, Councilmember Nash and, and maybe Councilmember Mueller wanted to say something. And I know Councilmember Wilson. Um, really quickly, I'll just uh, Councilmember Taylor. Since I can't see you, I just want to chime in and make sure you're 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 all good. Or if if you have have any questions. At this time, no, Mayor Combs. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay, uh, Councilmember Nash. Thank you. So I actually, I I would be very interested in doing something um, like what you're um, both of you are talking about, where we're looking at department and not at too detailed a level, more like what services are being offered, and also um, just generally when it says mandated and baseline, just generally what are those things? Because in the report it says that we consider, you know, deprioritizing or, you know, eliminating some of these, but we don't even know what that is. It's in the staff summary, it sort of had these red lines. Um, and, you know, obviously some are fairly obvious, but others are probably um, not that obvious to us. Anyway, I'm, sh I'm sure I don't know a lot of it. And just, and also the baseline, which is sort of information that's not mandated, but that's been carried forward year after year. Um, as something that at one point um, council and city decided was important. But I think to just looking at all of this and especially with the um, idea that we are in a very different time now, we're going to be coming back from a pandemic and what services um, should we be reinitiating? Where should our priorities within the services be? And also as we go into um, supporting the new MP MPCC, and what will be going on there. It all sort of seems to dovetail into what services do we want our city to be providing and at what levels. So not to um, get too detailed, not to micromanage, but just sort of generally in um, 
well, with some detail about what generally are the departments doing and what what where are sort of decision points for us. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Mueller. Yeah, so um, I appreciate where all of you guys are going with this, but I want to bring it back in context to where I think this staff report originated. And that's that in our prior couple goal settings, uh, there have been city council has expressed that they wanted to look at goal setting through the lens of equity and, uh, and, and also some other themes with respect to uh, approach for the city. And so uh, really what, there was an expression while we were going through goal setting about trying to approach it from a vision, um, a strategic vision. And uh, that really came out, it started to come out one year ago, but then last year was really a strong statement um, that had come out. And um, and so as I look at this, I, I can read the heart of what staff is trying to get to in, uh, in adopting this. I think it's a thoughtful reaction to the comments that were made in those two goal settings. I am candidly not that interested, guys, in doing a deep dive into all of the city departments. Um, I don't think, uh, given how hard our staff has worked throughout this pandemic, um, that that is uh, an additional amount of work that I think is just, if I were one of them managing that department, um, I, I wouldn't be very excited about that because I'd be in the middle of the process of trying to keep the city running in my department during the pandemic, plus all of those other priorities we had in the past. So when I look at what, uh, so through those lens, I look at the staff report and I think staff's trying to give us a hint that they want to be responsive to us about looking at it uh, through this this lens that we want to approach these things and I think that's what these different options are but I also think that there is also a theme running through these that there's a lot of work that they're doing with less employees to get those things done uh, those past those past just run the city plus some of those past goals and priorities I actually, in looking at this, uh, would be fine with option two. Um, um, I don't think option three is going to save us much time, um, but I think option two probably makes the most sense uh, to me. We could go through option one, but that would be a very long day. But those are kind of my my thoughts on it. And if you all disagree, I understand that. Um, but that is sort of uh, where I am at this point, and I certainly respect where all you are. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Mueller. Uh, Councilmember Woolison, did you, or Councilmember Taylor, did you, were you gonna? Thank you, Mayor Combs. I, I, I actually, at the moment, I don't have a preference, um, but uh, just going back in my head of what um, Councilmember Willison said about looking at um, departments, um, and the first thing that came to my mind is that we did budget cuts by departments. Um, so thinking about um, setting goals by departments for me um, makes sense. But again, I don't have a preference over um, option two or option option one or option three. Um, one one thing I'd like to bring up, even though this is um, 12 months old, is that I was supportive of having a two-year um, goal setting process. So we weren't switching goals every year because I think it is inefficient. Um, but again, uh, as far as the three options that the staff has laid out for us, I don't have a preference at the moment. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Taylor. I think Councilmember Wollison, uh, if not, then Councilmember Nash. Um, and I'm just speaking on the fly here. <laughs> so um, this is, uh, um, I'm just trying to think of resident expectations too with the goal setting priority setting process so i'm trying to understand how the the public comments that we heard tonight that you know we're a little premature because we haven't we're not really talking about the substance now but if we take those requests so we have them ranging from 
um, you know, reducing VMT, doing more on housing, um, doing, uh, looking at baseline services, redistricting, gas leaf blower, um, more capacity and community development. So, and, and I'm sure that as council members, we may have priorities or those may be some of our priorities. You know, I've heard of all kinds of things people are contacting me about. So I'm just trying to understand, um, are we, are, are any of the, first of all, is there any room for any of that this year? <laughs> is, is staff, and what, what I'm reading from staff's um, options are possibly there's none of that's gonna happen. So, so I guess maybe that's, that's one question. And then if there is a chance that any of that is gonna happen, I don't, see how we would possibly um, be able to understand what staff has the capacity to do without looking at it kind of by department or by functional area. Um, and so um, th those are just my current thoughts. Council member Nash. I, I just wanted to add that um, I would like to look at minimally, I would like to look at the 2021 council priorities and um, the work plan without just adopting it um, and continuing. I think we at least should be discussing what's on there and if there's anything else um, that should be on there is I think some things will be coming off, um, but I don't, I certainly would, um, it, not be in favor of just proceeding with what we have on the on the priorities and work plan without having some sort of discussion about it. And um, just in response to what Council Member Mueller said, um, I don't know that we need to have a tremendously deep, um, I don't know that it has to have, there has to be that much work involved in getting some information from the um, department heads, you know, they know what the primary um, work that people are working on, and so I don't know that it would um, that it would be that um, big a lift to um, give us those major projects that people are working on and just sort of give us a feel for what's going on. Um, we don't need to get down into the, you know, all the minutia. Just sort of generally what um, and maybe have a discussion more than any great you know, report or anything like that, I think it, it would be worthwhile to um, to do something without having it be onerous. Yeah, thank you for those comments, uh, Council Member Nash. I mean, I would I would see it as, as nothing much sort of different than what it seems as though Council Member Wilson, you know, sort of got as far as her, her, her onboarding. Um, and, and so, and so essentially I, I think it would be, it would be that, that, that those presentations, um, um, as, as I see it, I would, I mean, just so we can kind of like narrow down to sort of see where there is some consensus, um, um, I'll, I'll let, uh, the, the city manager uh, comment. Um, okay. Well, just very briefly. I, I'm, we're certainly happy to give a presentation if that's the council's direction. That, and, and I understand your interest in it, it is more traditionally done as part of the budget process. So I don't, and, and maybe you feel you need to have that information before you can set your goals, but we could certainly try and prepare something for the, uh, for the budget process or as an introduction maybe in the spring. So it's sort of a prep for the upcoming budget process. Um, so, uh, okay. thank you. Okay, uh, Council Member Mueller. I mean, my my concern is that the, I mean, to say it's just a presentation, it would be is kind of begs the question. Well, why? I mean, if we're having a presentation, what will more than likely happen was that there'll be questions as a result of the presentation and then there could be a discussion about whether or not people should be spending their time that way and what i what i, what I would just say to my colleagues is you know uh i'm fine with doing the presentations if it really is just listening to the presentation 
but my gut instinct tells me that it's not just going to be that because it um so if everyone is willing to just say fine we're just going to listen to the presentations and then decide what we want to do for our priorities um but i don't want to get i don't think it's the appropriate time to get into a situation where we're going to be you know uh, sort of reconstructing what staff is doing and the city manager is doing uh from the 2021 work from a 2020 work plan um so i think we went through a very detailed budget process and when we go through a priority setting for the year we're talking about okay these are the at least traditionally what it's been these are the things we really want to make sure that get accomplished in addition to running the city if it's going to become a discussion of these are the things we want to get accomplished and by the way i also want to talk about how the city is run that's entirely different that's an expanding the scope dramatically and and uh, and if i were a staff member and i was going into a goal setting with the possibility that we we're going to be having a discussion where we're deconstructing how the city is run uh, that's something entirely new that i would want to prepare for um, uh, and, and have notice of so that's why i'm really you know i respect the fact that people want to have that conversation but i think that um I think that we need to give proper notice to staff and I think we need to be honest about what it is we're talking about. If it's just the presentations for background for priority setting, that's one thing. But if, but the question we really have to ask ourselves is why? And if the why is something more, then I also think it's, you know, I think we need to, I think it'd be smart to also make sure how we delineate time for conversations like that, give notice for things like that, um, otherwise, we could just have, you know, our goal setting, how the city's run thing lasts for a long time. And uh, and we are still on, uh, we are still on a much smaller staff size and, uh, and in the middle of a pandemic trying to deliver services. Yeah, thanks for those comments, uh, Councilmember Mueller. I, I think it's, it's, it's very fair, fair point um, in, in the sense of, of that yes, if a presentation turns into like you know in-depth discussions about departments, then that's a long several days, uh, right? And 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 not traditionally the way the city has approached the process. And so it certainly isn't something that if that was thing that could be done in February, right? Um, uh, it it would be wouldn't be wouldn't be fair to staff. And so. I, I agree that the extent to which we went down this road, it would it would have to be something where essentially it was one way communication that we saw it as, or at least I'm just obviously speaking for myself, that we saw it as as sort of fact finding and 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 you know again learning more or or, or being sort of new information about sort of what departments are doing. If it turned into a you know something where you know. The department head presents and then you know gets cross-examined for for two hours uh then that's that's totally something something different um i will i have a uh, council member willis and, and then council member nash but i'll, I'll let uh mr pagaris go go first um thank, thank you mr mayor um <clears throat> the uh one uh, and for those of you who've worked with me, you know that I can sometimes come up with crazy ideas just for conversation purpose, but uh, I might just sort of throw this out there as one possibility. Um, in the past, we've had a tremendous uh, challenge sort of identifying capacity that's available to work on things that are unknown. Um, and uh, those run the gamut uh, those run the gamut for I can easily rattle off several projects that um, that we may not have the resources available to do and it's and we find ourselves in the situation where uh, the natural question is well why don't we have the resources um, uh, uh, to do that what are we doing that we may not want to be doing as an organization um, just as an idea for council, one thing that I think that, so, so first with respect to council member Willison's presentations, one of the things that we asked department heads to do was to identify 
what projects, uh, and we did this with the candidates as well, what projects um, or major issues does the department head anticipate affecting um, uh, either requiring city council action or somehow having an unforeseen impact on our ability to get our work done? Um, it's sort of like a risk uh, assessment, so to speak. And we sort of plotted that out both between uh, the time that we met with the candidates and the end of the calendar year, and then what we anticipated in the first six months of 2021. Um, so I think that the department heads are capable to sort of have that uh, that, that presentation uh, ready to go uh, relatively um, w with uh, relative ease. Uh, just as another idea, uh, what if we were to approach this from the perspective of, um, you know, staff tell us where the where what tell us what is taking time that you think doesn't need to that, that staff professionally does not um, necessarily think. Uh, is what time well spent. And I, the best example I can give of this is the IT master plan. The IT master plans project, while it takes time to make time, <laughs> it has made time. It has made capacity. It allowed us to transition to telework uh, in a way that our peers and other organizations are, are, are in some cases are baffled by. Um, and so, uh, there are elements of our processes and procedures that that I'm sure our, our department heads can identify uh, efficiencies to create capacity without creating headcount, um, and that you know that, that may be a, a that may be an area uh, that the council considers um, as part of goal setting. So again, just to recap. Have I have departments identify sort of what they see happening in the next year? What do they know about is out there and what challenges and decisions does council need to make? And then secondarily, um, if we were able to get rid of three things in your departments that were time sucks, what would what would those be and how could we how could we um, address that? Now, I just want to be forthcoming since I know that as uh, the administrative services uh, lead, um, most of our processes, while we, our staff has made a tremendous amount of headway in efficiency, um, there is this core management, um, training, uh, staff development, staff retention investments that uh, do consume capacity, but they are, and information technology plan implementation, all of those consume capacity, but they are investments in the future. And so that may be one area uh, where the conversation would get a little sticky uh, by way of um, who all is involved in those various initiatives. Thank you for that, uh, Mr. Pagueros. And, uh, so. Councilmember Wollison and then and then Councilmember Nash. Um, thank you, Mr. Pagaros, for your for your ideas. And um, oh, this is this is a tricky topic. <laughs> um, and um, I I I'm sorry, none of you got to see the presentations that I gave. I mean, they were good, but they like you didn't miss out on like everything. Mm -hmm. um, and I do have to say, I get the IT master plan. I'm not trying to, to say that the IT master plan isn't important. And I think it's amazing what you've all been able to accomplish um, in terms of telework. And, um, and, and in that regard, it might be a, a labeling or a branding or a framing of how we talk about priorities and goal setting. Um, that, that just might be a semantic issue. Um, Regarding the idea of this departmental idea um, and the presentations, um, the more I think about it, I, I think um, the conversations that would follow are actually kind of what I would like to see. Um, so, so to that point, Mr. Uh, Council Member Mueller, um, it, it would be a lot and maybe beyond the scope of, of what we traditionally think of goal setting. Um, I guess I'm just trying to take a step back and, and think about what this process could be. And if it took more time, um, you know, maybe, maybe that's something we should consider. Um, and also the interplay between 
the goal setting and the budget and the CIP and all the different categories of, of these projects. Um, for example, um, Middle Avenue Tunnel, um, the, the undercrossing at the Stanford project. So that's, I don't think it's on the work plan and I don't think it's a council priority, but I believe it's something that staff, you know, is working on or plans to work on. So how do all these pieces fit in the bigger picture? Um, and, and to me, that's where the functional pieces is where we would get a sense of the of how these things stack up. Um, so, yeah. Um, Councilmember Nash and then Councilmember Mueller. Thank you. Um, first of all, Middle Avenue pedestrian and bike rail planning is number seven. So it is on the work plan. Um, yes, exactly. But it's your point is still absolutely well taken. Um, a couple questions, I guess, to Mr. Pagueros, and that is when I look at page um, G2.3 for the library and community services um, that they're going to do um, uh, rebuilding, it says that the department will undergo a rebuilding exercise to identify when aspects of the department's pre-pandemic portfolio of services, programs, and events are practical when safe. I would, to me, that's something that would, um, might, actually, I will just say it. I think that council would have very valuable input into that and what programs and um, services actually are things that we think would um, be valuable to the residents, not in addition to what, it, it would be a discussion. So certainly there's lots of information that staff has, but there's also lots of information that council members have. And to me, something like that, where we're actually talking about what are the services, and I know there's been several that have been you know, discussed with me, so, um, well, actually, I won't go into specifics now, but I think that that to me is something that would be a benefit to discuss and that not go down to details, and it's still up to staff as to how to implement these things, but as far as what should we, in grand terms, what programs do we want to bring back, I think makes sense to have a discussion to me. And I guess I'd love your opinion on that. And don't worry if, it, if, if you have a different opinion, that's totally fine to, you know, I will not be offended. Um, I, um... There are a number when we when when we talk about library and community services, um, there are a number of layers that uh, are at play in sort of understanding how we ended up where we did pre-pandemic, what happened during the pandemic, and where we're going to go after the pandemic. Um, that can be as simple as looking at what's before you. I think it's attachment C and just saying, you know, we do not, uh, if we were to prioritize these services, um, here's how we were, here's how we as a council would prioritize restoration of those services, you know, and, and uh, so that's, that's sort of, an option. The challenge to that that Councilmember Mueller raised is that, um, as much as as much as the presentation appears to be in silos, we work very very hard to break silos down. We see the value in the cross de cross departmental teams, cross functional areas, uh, and that comes in particular play when we look at things like cl climate action plan. Those those touch a number of different departments, and um, and, and so it it's not as simple, I guess, to to to, to pick to, to go back to the um, well. We want to provide um, we only provide we only want to provide services to this one particular segment of population. Let's say um, let's say um, and and I guess a great example would be library hours. What is the right number of library hours? 
Um, some might say it's what you can afford. Others might say it's what the community demands or where, where the demand is. And, and those are not clear cut decisions or conversations. There's give and take in each and every one of those. And how do you think, how would you recommend those decisions be made? Don't want to get out ahead of uh, the city manager here, <laughs> but you know it it it, uh, it goes to the what can I mean, ultimately as a finance professional I, I I come back to what is it that we can afford, and is that consistent? Is it sustainable? And is it um, advancing what we understand the council priorities to be? That's that's how I would respond to that. And how would you get those council priorities about uh, that? The, what I'm trying to get at is, I certainly, and I imagine all council members have heard quite a bit about libraries, especially when we were talking about PLS, which I know we're going to do soon, but people came out of the woodwork to talk about library. So that um, I think that it would be beneficial as um, sort of, as the link to the community to get our input into these decisions realizing that there are also there's also input from the um, many other sources staff obviously has direct connections with community members there's the commissions um, there's the foundations there's many ways to get it but it seems like um, i would like to think that i would like to have council members be part of that decision as far as not so it's not just a financial decision or one made in a vacuum without our input and I could think that there's other situations. Um, very honestly, I've heard about bringing, what, what are we gonna do about gymnastics? Again, to me, that's something that would be a good discussion with staff and council. It shouldn't be made by one group or the other exclusively in my world. So the, the, uh, um, and then I, I do wanna um, go to council member Mueller, but, uh, Council Member Nash, unless I'm missing something, I don't see how this this would be sort of made by one group or one sort of decision maker, like in only under like sort of a, a sort of like an option two, where we sort of keep roll over what we had in 2022, and then these things get added, and then we start this sort of new, you know, we start to sort of work out this new process. Like it, it, that's the only way where I saw where there's not sort of involvement um, in what the priorities are. If we stick to the old process, then then that's the, then we're we're involved. There is a special meeting, and then if we do the hybrid, then you know again you know we proceed for the most part similar to how we proceeded last year, and then but we also kick off this process to to rethink it. Um, so I don't know unless I'm missing something. I don't I don't see where we're, we're necessarily excluded from the process. But I want to go to Council Member Mueller because I, I know he's been waiting a while. Okay, can I actually, okay, and then I'd love okay. to. I, yeah, yeah I, I promise you, right after Council Member Mueller, we'll go, we'll go right back to you. I'm sorry. Yeah, so I'm just gonna be canned, guys. I'm more concerned than I was in the beginning. Like, so the, the I mean, it's not, it's not outside the realm of possibility during the term on council during a year that you'd say, okay, there's something happening in a in a department that I want to drill down on. But what it sounds like what we're gonna is being contemplated is we're gonna open the book on all the departments and look how decision making is and then on the things that we've gotten public input on, want to talk about those things. And I mean that's like a that's almost like a top to level uh, like audit of how the city's conducting business during a goal setting. And like, I don't, I just, number one, number one in a goal setting, I don't think it's gonna, I don't think it's gonna be conducive towards the goal setting. And number two, like, I don't even wanna do a top to bottom audit of the city. Like I don't, not in the middle of a pandemic, certainly. And, like I think that what's really important is to identify what areas that you want to talk about and like when those arise and then work on those but then the rest of the time like we want to empower staff to run the city and um 
And certainly there are those things that we dive in on that we think we want to look at. Um, and then, but to say that, you know, in our goal setting, we want to do a review of all the departments and then dive in on those things that we think are important so we can give our input so that they're empowered to do it. I mean, it's kind of, um, I can see where the question of how they're doing it so we can give our input then becomes a review of how they're doing it. And then us giving our input in that dynamic is kind of like, well, we're gonna tell you how the council wants it to be done. And like to say, we're gonna do that comprehensively during goal setting in every department. I just, number one, it's gonna take forever. Number two, I think it's gonna be, uh, I don't think it's gonna be good for our professional staff's morale or department morale. Number three, I think it's going to take so long that it'll take away from goal setting. Number four, after we've done it, I think that um, I don't I don't know how. I mean, I think, you know, I think it's just I think I understand what people want to do. And I think that it's just like we have to you have to pick what things you want to dive in and, and on once and one, one at a time through your policy work. Trying to do them all at once during goal setting uh, is just going to be, I just don't think it's going to work. I think it's going to be incredibly hard. And I also think we have to like, you know, if I go back four years ago, like we do goal setting, we'd say what our goals were and then that was it. Staff would go and, you know, trust city manager, professional staff to execute. And if they didn't execute, we held them accountable to them not executing. Um, so, I mean, I mean, we can like doing this sort of process would be a major departure of how how the city does business. I mean, we'd be really going very deep into uh, city. I mean, we basically would be sitting down with every professional manager in the city, asking them what's going on in the department, opening it up to questions from us. Us, guess, us telling them, well, we think there's a problem here. Well, how do you address it? And then, and then us giving them their input on that in every single department. I, you know, I just, and, and then remember, it's not just what you think of it, but what all five council members think of it. And when was the last time all five of us talked about something and given something new to do? Right? Like we just do. They're going to put all five of us in a room, talk about something, we're going to give them more work. Or, or, one, or three people are going to say, I don't like the way you're doing it. Like we have a pit, that's we have opinions. We think things should be done a certain way. So I just, I don't, I just, I, I understand. I think that the intent is really good, uh, but I think I'm very concerned about, uh, about what the effect will be both on getting work done in the city and also on morale. So. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Mueller, for those comments. Uh, Councilmember Nash. So, I guess um, I was going to, do, I'd still like to talk about something else, but I'm actually confused by, um, I don't see us doing, I, I guess I'm not tracking with what Councilmember Mueller is concerned about. And I'd love to get just an example. Um, and I guess I will make the other comment. And that was the whole comment about, um, so in reading um, attachment C, attachment C is actually this document that repeatedly said um, to create capacity, the city council may take action to deprioritize compliance with a specific federal mandate upon consideration of the legal and financial risks. And upon, um, anyway, for each of these, um, issues. It says that um, city council retains full discretion over baseline services. It may direct staff to identify functions to suspend or eliminate. So how do we, I'm, I'm just wondering, how do we get and follow this document that was given to us as to how to evaluate capacity without getting some sort of basic information? I do not want to micromanage. That is up to the city manager to manage and for us to direct, but I do think we need some information to be able to actually set some priorities at a high level and um, make, some, make some choices. And so I, I guess I'm 
I'm not sure if I'm asking, I guess right now I'm asking Ray to, um, Council Member Mueller, please, to um, explain, I'm, I'm just sort of missing something. Yeah. In the past, when we've done council goal setting and priorities, there was a, there would be examples of recommendations from staff of things that could be cut. If you wanted to increase capacity, if you wanted to increase capacity, here are the areas that we would recommend it. But what we didn't do was do a, but what we didn't do, but what we didn't do was have them come in and do like a full explanation of what they were doing in their department and for us to give them feedback on what we thought was useful and not. Like, ooh, I just, I, th I think I th you asked you asked staff for their, and so look, but the fact of the matter is, look, if there's three votes to do it the way you guys want to do it, then there's three votes. Like I've said this multiple, you know, I've made my, I've made my case here a few times, but if, but look, if you, if I can tell you guys aren't convinced and if there's a third vote, then fine. But I just, I really very earnestly want to share my concerns on that because i i just um i have deep concerns that this would go off the rails and um uh, and last a very long time and defocus uh defocus work product at a time that we really need it focused coming out of the, out of the pandemic with a very uh with a very uh constrained workforce so but you know if uh if that's not the will of the council, then I respect that. So, um, thank you for those uh, comments, uh, Councilmember Mueller, and for yeah, bringing us back to the at least focus on the idea of of where are there are there three votes. And so, I actually, you know, would not be supportive of the department overview this time around, um, only because I think. Um, as Councilmember Woolison uh, uh, proposed it, and as I heard it, we're, we're different. Um, and that I do think that she wants a presentation that leads into a full sort of discussion, which is valid. Um, but I see if that's happening, then that that's sort of like the the option the option B, right, or, or that that second option. Whereas that can't be. Staff couldn't do that. Um, in a time of which we're we're getting sort of it as part of a a um, you know a, a priority goes uh, session in in February, um, I, I I don't know that like that they can could then do a presentation and then and then be in a position to engage in in a full uh, a, a full discussion, and if we are sort of going that route, I do think it it's sort of maybe something that that. Um, that we uh, should should sort of spend some some additional time sort of thinking about. And so, for me, as I sit here, like I I think I'm most inclined to the traditional um, approach to the priorities goal setting process, in the sense of of we we have a, a you know a a, a session um, again like likely on on a saturday there's an opportunity for for the public to to chime in um, staff presents us uh, so with the goals from from last year that are holdovers and with some proposals for for new additions um i think for me that that's w what i would be supportive of um and then additionally i, I would be supportive of of a process by which I guess it goes, it's closest to this hybrid process. I mean, if there is interest in, in sort of like how we approach this process anew, um, I would be supportive of that. Um, um, uh, and, 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 but um, but, but I, I would, for me, the priority is having a, is not skipping um, a goal setting uh, priority session um, in, in that there is one, relatively early early in the year and that there is an opportunity for the public to engage and it seems as though the only way we can do that is to just follow what because it doesn't seem like there is there's a consensus for like how we might change that process now um and so to me it seems as though like again like i say i would support that and then I would I would be supportive if if there is uh, council members who again want to sort of look at this process more, more holistically uh, for a future iteration 
like 2022, um, I, I, I would be I would be supportive supportive of that. Um, that being said, I want to give Council Member Taylor, if she um, um, is so inclined, uh, an opportunity to, to to chime in. Thank you, Mayor Combs. Um, and I didn't have much to say, um, but um, I do like the idea of having a, a holistic approach. Um, and I do believe if we're going to be using um, a lens of diversity, equity, and inclusion, that change in our process has to come. Um, when that happens, I'm, I'm not sure it'd be great to have it now, but um, clearly it can't happen right in the moment. Um, but, um, Let's see, something else you brought up, Mayor Combs, and that was about the hybrid option. Would that be something we would look at for next year's process? Yeah, so as I see the hybrid option, and Mr. Pagueros can correct me if I'm wrong, is that we essentially engage in the standard sort of process this year for, for essentially 2021 goals and priorities. Um, but then we also kick off a process by which we look to change it for 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 next year, and and whether that is something that, like, again, has a specific sort of like equity lens or framework um, as a part of it, whether it's something that also has some sort of department rundown um, and discussion, as as Ms. is is Council Member Wilson has suggested, I think is would all be up for 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 debate, um, but. I don't, I don't know that like we're going to, like I say, I, I don't know that there's an ability to reach any consensus about any fundamental changes like tonight um, are, are changes for, for th that again, that would allow something where the public could, could sort of chime in, uh, um, you know, again, like in the earlier part of, of this, of this, of this quarter. Um, and so, but yeah, I don't know. Did I answer your question? <laughs> I don't know if I actually. Yes, you did, Mayor <laughs> Cups. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry about that. That's okay. I, I wanted to go back to when at the beginning when you were um, setting the stage for this discussion and just to go back to the idea of talking about process, talking about the procedure and not necessarily our principles and our priorities. So we're still in line with that. Well, I mean, like I say, the, the, it's blurred. <laughs> As I thought it would, um, because uh, y you know, um, like you could say, like having a department by department kind of presentation and discussion is process, but it really goes to like a fundamental, like sort of um, way in which we're going to sort of look at, you know, look at the services that the city provides, and and I think to Councilmember Mueller's point, what represent a major sort of um, uh, divergence from how the city has done it in the past, which is fine. Again, I'm not opposed to us diverging for how from for, for how things are done in the past, but I, I just think that there has to be lots of setup for that, and 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 I don't know that like you know we're 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 going to get there like <laughs> with that setup, to be honest, any anytime soon. Um, um, Certainly not not uh, by the time I was hoping to in this meeting, which is is, is, is is before we would be required to vote on extending it. <laughs> so uh, yeah, um, thank you, uh, uh, Councilmember well, Wilson. All right, as the as the one that took us down this rabbit hole, um, first I just want to tell you all this has been a really a really good conversation from my perspective, and I don't think it's a waste of time to, to have these kinds of conversations. Um, and I've actually kind of come around a little bit on this in the course of listening to all of you. Um, so for the sake of, um, in, in deference to Council Member Mueller and um, kind of trying to think of how we can move forward from here, because it, it has become clear to me, and Mayor Combs, you were referring to this, that at this time, and, and Mayor Mueller, you were referencing this, during the pandemic right now, um, to, to go through like this brand new process, 
like like we were talking about with some of the the staffing, maybe now is not the time. Like, is there an urgency to do it now? Maybe not. Um, does that mean that there's not value in going down this um, road and and um, having these types of explorations? And for me, it's not so much um, opening up staff and 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 telling them, you know, what to do. It's more to what. Um, Vice Mayor Nash, I think, was referring to in terms of the, the assumptions that we don't even realize are baked into everything that is done every day. Um, so, so like one example would just be, you know, as a, a former, I guess I'm still a resident, but as a um, layperson, um, you know, I often heard, well, this is the way it's done in Menlo Park. Um, this is how we do outreach. You know, this is how we do this. Um, this is just um, the policy that is set by council. And so to, to Mayor Mueller's point, to, to rip open all of those things at once and start scrambling and looking at all of those assumptions is like, I, I get it now, that's like not feasible to do in the context of goal setting. I do think it's important though, to start asking those questions. And um, maybe, I don't know if it's a subcommittee, I don't know what that looks like, starting to figure out, maybe it's not this year, but next year. I do think that um, the traditional way of how we've done goal setting and priority setting could be improved and um, could kind of get to some of these uh, underlying um, assumptions that we've just kind of taken for granted for so long. And so I am interested in looking at that, but um, to help move this forward, I, I don't need to do that now. <laughs> Um, one thing that could be helpful, and I don't know, um, so I'm also inclined um, now that I'm kind of pivoting um, to, to Mayor Combs' point, more of the traditional model. Um, again, I don't know if the policies and procedure manual um, needs to be part of it. I'd be more interested in subbing out some kind of values discussion um, or kind of mission conversation of just like, where are we all coming from? Um, so that would be my um, new thinking and suggestion. And I, I really wanna let you know, I heard everything that all of you said, and I, I really appreciate this conversation and um, I'm, I'm happy to be your colleague. So thank you. Councilmember Mueller. Yeah, thank you, Councilmember Wilson. I really appreciate your thoughtfulness in that and, and all of my colleagues' thoughtfulness. I did wanna make the, uh, just did wanna share, like it's not lost on me, uh, the intent and what I think um, and I do want to point out that I, um, I do hope we move forward with the baselining on racial equity project that'll be coming forward with it. And the project is supposed to look at a bunch of different, um, a bunch of different topic subtopic areas in the world in the in the in the city of Menlo Park, bring stakeholder input that, and then set a baseline metric with recommendations from that. And then I think that will help inform some of the conversation. Uh, should the council wanna proceed with that, I think that'll help inform some of the conversation that we would have then strategically about where we would look to have this conversation in different departments. So it wouldn't, it would be, we would be okay. This is the baseline metric of where we are. This is where we wanna to get to. Here are some suggestions. How do we implement that change now in a department? And we're going to have also, obviously, the learnings that we take from um, from the program that we just we just approved um, monies for this year. So I think we are building momentum for the type of institutional uh, reflection that that my colleagues are so interested in, and I appreciate that very much. Um, so uh, I think we're all I think all of us have. Uh, both the right heart and the strategic mind to get there. So thank you. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Nash or Vice Mayor Nash. Did you have uh, your hand up? I did, and that's sort of to bring this full circle around with what everyone's um, said and sort of what um, Mayor Combs, you and I, and City Manager um, Jerome Robinson sort of talked about. I think it was last week. Um, I actually, having said everything and had this discussion, I actually think we've got more than enough on our plate just with the 2020 um, City Council priorities and work plan. 
and one of the places we might want to start is to actually go through this, take some public comment. Like I think there were there were um, suggestions that were made tonight that I think we I would like to discuss as possibly maybe they do make it onto the priorities work um, this priorities work plan, but actually not. Um, I think if we do, we've got more than enough on our plate for this year already, but I would like to definitely have discussions about what services are offered in the city. It doesn't have to be part of the council um, priority goal setting right now because it is a, a much bigger discussion, but I think we do need to start having it. And I think one of the topics that staff recommended putting on being the library and community services rebuilding is a prime place to start having that conversation. And I'll stop there. Yeah, thank, thanks for those comments. I wanted to, um, uh, Mr. Pagero, so I just want to make sure that I'm understanding sort of option three. And so because it says, it says option three maintains the top 2020 top priorities and adopts the identified work plan for 2021. And so, like as I see option three, there is there is a a, a session, a council meeting, where we discuss the work plan for for 2021, and and we you know sort of like so, so if we're we're talking about Safer Bay, if we're talking about um, the rebuilding rebuilding uh, library and community services, that those additions that are being suggested that that, that we 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 um. That, that there is a meeting where that's discussed and it, is is that how you see that that hybrid option or do you see it differently yeah uh thank you mr the so the um i think the key differential is so it's a couple of things that i've heard tonight that I, but first the key differential between um how uh, the hybrid option was identified either in the staff report or in the presentation. I think the key message here is that, um, or what I'm hearing is the council would like to use, or th there is some interest amongst council members to continue with the procedure, the process status quo, so to speak, with some significant, with some amendments such as uh, for council consideration, uh, deferring the procedures to a different uh, date or conversation. Uh, so how I, how I would envision that sort of coming together is that uh, we could do a couple of things. First would be um, that we could very easily, or I believe it's within our capacity to prepare a survey uh, to, to one of the comments that was made uh, earlier. Uh, we could pre prepare a survey asking residents to prioritize the current work plan um, or or prior and priorities that that or and so that could be one question the second question could be you know what needs to be what do you think needs to be added so that could help facilitate the public in, engagement uh, inclusion in in the process and then on the day of the meeting uh, we just sort of talk we, we received the public comment verbally on that um, at the end of public comment we come back and we staff staff um, the list that's included in the staff report is the um, it is uh, I think what staff would recommend for 2021. But again, that's it. This is what the council wants us <laughs> wants us to work on, and so that it's just the basis of starting the conversation, and then we have the um, the give and take uh, sort of sort of conversation of if we wanted to add X, what would happen? What would happen to the balance of the plan? I hope that that made sense to yeah everything except for like the 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 survey are you talking about like sending some survey out to residents yeah it could be an electronic survey to residents mm -hmm. if that's something that's uh, of interest um yeah yeah um probably not from from me i, I think i think it would be just to sort of like you know, having the 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 first portion of the meeting devoted to public comment and and taking um um you know taking taking uh, the public input in in that form. Um, I'm not saying again as part of this 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 you know and and maybe it is that like we don't talk about the hybrid option. Maybe it is we we just talk about the status quo, right? But then have this understanding that that like 
that there is a desire for 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 some change. I mean, um, we we don't necessarily have to kick that off tonight. Um, um, I, I don't know. J just maybe to to keep it to to keep it simple. Uh, um, but but uh, we'll obviously open to hearing from 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 the rest of the council. It seems as though there is some some uh, we are coalescing around this idea of at least for for this year you know staying with the the traditional process and so the question is is that do tonight should we also commit very specifically um by adopting sort of like this hybrid option of of the the process by which we we we're going to commit to changing it or or do we do we hold off and sort of revisit that um you know, I don't know, in a, in a month or so, or revisit that at some point after you know staff is focused on, on on just the the, the priority goals setting session that 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 um it, it'll be putting together for for this year. Councilmember Nash. So I would um I would think it, given that we're going to if we decide to go ahead with um pretty much the status quo and what we've done before it actually might be more beneficial to just do a quick post-mortem after we do that and decide what the direction is and whether we want to do something different next year rather than making that decision now yeah i actually think that's a great idea um and it'll, it'll be fresh in our minds what we what we liked and what we didn't like um and then and then and then um you know um and yeah and then i think provide more, more salient direction to, to the staff as far as like how we would change it um d does that make sense to you mr pigaros yes sir thank you okay cool uh council member wilson i just want clarity we're not deciding any substantive substantive priorities now tonight like we're gonna, I, I don't know if I'm comfortable saying we're gonna keep the same thing as 2020 or we're gonna add the four things from the hybrid that are in that language. What I, what I would envision if we're going with the status quo is that we all show up, the public shows up and we all kind of you know put it all out there what we wanna do. You know, I've heard Ray tonight talk about, or Council Member Mueller talking about you know downtown kind of refurbishing and um, the equity uh, program. So if, if he throws that out and a couple of people throw out this, a couple of like, I feel like it all just kind of has to go out there, including the Safer Bay and the library and community yeah. services. And then we can kind of see it all. And then we can hear the constraints that staff yeah. has, and then we kind of sort it out. Yeah, totally. And, and again, someone, keep me on is I, I think that the staff will frame it based on again what are the 2020 priorities that have not been completed and what it thinks should we should add for 2021. Um, it is its recommendations as it does. That's totally fair. That's totally yeah. fair. I just don't want to say it no. has to be this. No. I, 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 I think okay. if if uh, if that's the way, then then we're we're delusioned together because that's not not how, how I, I I see it. I, I feel that like it's a jump ball essentially, um, and that that we can. Uh, but but staff will sort of you know sort of have its its recommendations. Uh, Council Member uh, Vice Mayor Nash. Sorry for waving my hand. I just the status quo to me was the process, not the yeah. not the specific projects. So I actually um, would very much like to debate some of these projects and whether or not they should stay on the list or be, you know, at what point. Um, it's entirely the process that would be pretty much status quo. Yeah. Um, and, and the only thing is that, like, it, the, the process in the past, like, you know, staff did come with its its recommendations, right? Um, and, and so, and, and again, we will come with our own thoughts. And, and but yeah, that there there's nothing in staff's recommendations, uh, uh, again, unless it's some statutory requirement, right? That we are we, we're sort of obligated, and even then, we can we can we can not follow it and, and sort of take the risk of, of getting sued. Um, uh, uh, Councilmember Wilson, um, I just think it's funny we're going right back to kind of where we started with the status quo. So my expectation, and then what I plan to bring to this goal setting event is kind of like five to 10 or three to five or three to seven 
kind of things to kind of put out there that may or may not have capacity and may or may not have consensus. And, and then we kind of a incorporating what the public is saying and what residents are telling us, and then we kind of talk it through. Yeah, I, I would say capacity. Is that the vision? Is that what you guys are thinking? Yeah, my only advice would be don't come with 10. Um, right. I'll, go, I would... <laughs> I'll go with the, the lower range, maybe three <laughs> ideas. But yeah, I, I think part of this whole idea is that you come with some ideas and seeing if there is consensus. And then again, like that consensus may not mean then that it becomes a priority. But as you see, there's a long list there. Um, maybe it is just that it gets added to the list, right? And, and then starts its, its mighty journey um, and maybe long journey up to becoming a, 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 a you know, a top five priority. Uh, Council Member Nash, or Vice, Vice Mayor Nash. Um, anything works. <laughs> um, so I guess I was seeing it more as we look very critically at what um, we want to sort of push ahead within projects that are already on the list. And if there's any that we think could drop off, in other words, the pro I was taking my primary focus is what's already on the list. And then if there's something that's really burning that has that um, in addition to this, that we would present it, but that it wasn't going to um, be trying to find other projects to add to this because we already have more than enough, more than we can handle on our plate. Yeah, I would only say, Councilman Burnash, that's how I'm going to approach it. But you and I have had some engagement in this list before, whereas is Councilmember Willison has not. And so I do think that she should have the opportunity to be like, hey, I don't know where this list came from. And, and I had nothing to do with it. And so I want to add things of my own. And certainly we can still do that too. But I think for you and me and, and for you know those of us who have been on the council, there are a couple of things we can point to that we know that we have like a very specific interest in, and, and maybe the fact that it is even listed um, has to do with with our, our support in the past. And I just want to make sure that Councilmember Wollison has that space to, like I say, get something on the list um, and and and, um, and and let it its it start its its journey. Um, uh, Councilmember Wollison. I appreciate that. And I like the little visual of the, the priority yeah. going on the journey. Um, <laughs> but and, and I just want to, I guess to me, and this is kind of a point that I had on a list of to say like two hours ago when I thought I, what I was going to say on this topic is kind of what are the rules of engagement kind of because um, I also agree that we probably have more than enough already on the plate and that we can't be like adding a lot. Um, so in one sense, I'm inclined, you know, not to bring more stuff um, forward. But on the other hand, if other people are bringing stuff forward, then I want to be prepared to bring stuff forward. So I'd be inclined to just, we all bring back, bring up, and then we can have the discussion about what's realistic and not so that for we all come prepared so we can have these conversations. Yeah, no, I, I think that's very fair. And again, that there is it could provide some, again, signal. Maybe there is some project of which you're really, really passionate about. And, and you know, rather than have a, an opportunity, to have a situation where you just sort of keep that, you know, quiet for months and months and months, and then at some point down the road, realize that there's no way you're going to get two other votes for it. <laughs> let's let's get that out there quickly. And, and you can get some sense about, like, you know, whether that's something that's going to get some traction or whether you might need to go back and, and, and or maybe there are some some staff constraints like that you didn't foresee are some some legal constraints. Right. And that's why, you know, the city attorney is there um, that, that you didn't foresee. So, so I think, um, like I said, uh, obviously, it's it's not logistically possible for us all to bring like 10, 10 items, but I definitely think, um, and certainly staff can correct me if I'm wrong, as far as rules of the road, that you should feel like, you know, you, you certainly should should feel that you can bring bring some some ideas that that maybe have not been previously identified. Um, I think that we sort of are at a consensus. Um, uh, uh, Mr. Pagueros, do you, you know, do, do we, uh, we need a motion here, right? Um, or no, just, just direction. Do, do you, do you yeah. feel that you, you have the direction? So I'll, I'll just, uh, reconfirm what I, or I'll just state what I, what I've heard from, uh, the majority of the council. Um, we will schedule a goal setting session, uh, for 
uh, and we I heard Saturday thrown out there, so I do need some clarity on uh, we do need some clarity on that. Um, that will largely uh, 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 process from a process perspective, largely model what we have done over the last two years. Uh, which includes clearly inviting the public, creating the web form for members of the public to offer their their suggestions. Um, we, uh, I believe, I understand that there's a preference for the procedures to happen as a separate council meeting. So I just would like confirmation on that. Uh, I see two heads nodding, saying yes, three. Okay. Uh, for um, the financial update, um, interestingly, we dispensed with that probably about two years ago, uh, and um, I think it would be helpful just to have the uh, a place on the agenda for us to mention any new information uh, that has come up since this meeting, uh, and, and then we would go, we would break for lunch, and then we could um, come back and uh, go through all of the. Uh, the, the ideas that were raised in public comment, web form, uh, council members individually, and we'll reach a consensus at the end of that for action in, for, in a, as soon as possible thereafter uh, to adopt the 21, 2021 priorities and work plan. That, that sounds good to me. C Councilmember Nash, you raised your hand at some point, or Vice Mayor Nash, you raised your hand at some point. I did, um, and I it, this may not be where we want to go right now because since we're trying to close up, but I just I'm a little bit confused by the continued focus on policies when um, it's something that was put on the suspended projects part um, list, and so it which am I misunderstanding something? Um, I would just say that. The um, it, it's it has historically been the practice that the council adopt its prior its procedures um, on at least an annual basis, and I don't believe that this council has had the comprehensive view. If that's something the council doesn't want to do, um, then uh, a, a, a good amount of work has gone into it, and we can. But but that's the council's decision. I, I'm not. Um, I'm just looking at um, on our work plan. Number 21 is city county city council procedures update, and it was actually moved to the suspended projects. Um, and that's where I'm getting this disconnect again, just with resourcing constraints. And so I'm just wondering if there's something I'm missing. Uh, no, I mean. The, I mean, the the council procedures are intended to be to create transparency in our processes and establish the expectations um, of council members and their interactions with each other, interactions with the public, interactions with the press, interactions with staff. We have old procedures, and if the council is interested in keeping those, uh, then that's the council's uh, that's the council's discretion. We did go through an attempt to clean it up and to bring it to uh, modern uh, realities such as for example um, the we do not currently have anything written down that guides how we conduct teleconference city council meetings and you know if the council i mean staff it's helpful for staff to have that guideline to understand uh, where the expectations are uh, but again that's a council decision I, um, it's, it seems like a, a perfect thing to take up our goals and priorities meeting about whether, uh, or well, actually, I think we've decided not to, to, to take it up. Um, so, so maybe we don't take it up then. Uh, I, um, yeah, yeah, maybe that there is a, well, it's on the list, right? I mean, it's it even in suspended. And so, and so let, let, let's see what, you know, what happens, whether there's any time to, to sort of even, um, do a surface level addressing of, of whether this is something that the staff should, um, should 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 complete if it seems as though it's close to the finish line or whether whether it's 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 not um, it's not worth pursuing. Um, okay, so uh, um, so I think we're in a good place here, uh, right here. Uh, oh, Count, Count, Council Member Willison. I can't hear you. I don't know if others Sorry, can. Sorry, that was me. Um, 
I knew it was going to happen. Um, Mr. Fergrass, can you just repeat what it was that you still needed clarity on? Um, I, I think Saturdays and something else. Oh, the date. Uh, and the council confirmed the desire to, or at least three members of the council, four, if I'm not mistaken, uh, uh, shook their head uh, in favor of postponing, uh, or of, of putting the council procedures as a separate item at a different and, meeting. And then the last piece of direction um, that, that I would be interested in is in light of the two hour conversation we had about looking into kind of a new way of doing this or looking at baseline assumptions or looking at Menlo Park always does it like this or, or, or whatever. Um, I just don't want that to fall by the wayside. So um, I seek some guidance on how the best way to follow up on that to make sure, I mean, maybe it's adding that as a council priority. I don't know of, uh, of uh, how we accomplish that. So it doesn't we don't punt it for another year and then we're having this conversation a year from now. Well, I think one of the things that Council or Vice Mayor Nash had suggested was that sort of in the aftermath of this this sort of this goal priority session that that we would then make a decision about like sort of like what sort of process we want to engage in as far as as far as changing it, right? And so okay, that sounds great. Um so okay, but yeah, thanks. I, I think that I, I know I'm the one who mentioned Saturday want to make sure that there is consensus for a, a, a Saturday um, and and again I'm you know I, I think when uh, the vice mayor and I were talking to the city manager there was an idea of like sometime in, in February um, would be would work as far as staff and I mean that that that's fine with me um, it seems like anything sooner would be a real a real Little strain on on, on staff uh, anyway, and so um, that does uh, Councilmember Willison. Yeah, I would just like to put a big plea to um, try to give council as much time to discuss the priorities. Um, so I know um, so less time on background and more time on council discussion as much as possible. Even though I was the one saying department updates, but uh, sure. now that we're going with this different model. Um, and then, um, yeah, because I know we it often runs out of time for for that. And then I, I would be interested in a short discussion um, about values. Um, and I don't know if anyone else has an appetite for that, but kind of like setting the stage um, prior to getting into project level stuff. Um, I, I wouldn't. Uh, uh... I wouldn't oppose that. <laughs> I'll say that much. If if there if if, if uh, I'm totally willing to defer on on that. It, is that it, Mr. Baguero something that you think that um, you or someone else on staff would be in a position to sort of like uh, like add or or, or kick off a, like the discussion um, about values before we we sort of go into to to the meeting or or as as, as sort of the beginning of the meeting. Yeah, so typically we have done sort of the ground rules for the session um, in order to um, to, to um, move the meeting uh, forward. I understand Councilmember Wilson's uh, um, always. I mean, I mean the most valid the, the uh, council's consensus at the end of this process is what's most meaningful to helping to inform the the action that we bring back uh, with respect to vision that. Um, that can be a lengthy discussion. So I would just sort of highlight highlight that as um, as a potential having a constraint or having an impact on the time available uh, to 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 reach consensus. So uh, um, the city clerk is telling me we need to vote to extend the meeting. So um, I have failed in my first goal as mayor. Which was to do in this meeting before we had to extend it, uh, but but hopefully we hopefully uh, Councilmember Mueller. Are, are we just are we ready to make a motion on this item? I, I think we we well I don't think we need a motion. I, I think uh, Mr. Pagaro has a direction he needs. Correct? Do we need a motion here? There's no motion that's required. Yeah. Um, it, it, although I do would like some clarity of what if we want to add values to the agenda. 
um, a values discussion to the agenda. Council Member Wollison. Yeah, I don't think I would be looking for um, consensus of values necessarily. Like we all agree. I just want to know where my fellow council members are coming from, like what lens that they're they're looking at, and just a, a discussion about it is more yeah. what I had in mind. Okay, yeah, that, that's totally fine. So if the idea is that the onus is on each council member to come and you know talk for two or three minutes about their their values, and um, and then maybe we have a, a short ten minute conversation, then then, that, then that's fine. Okay. So is that all the direction, Mr. Pigaros? Okay, we're good. Um, so uh, by acclimation, are we able to extend our meeting even though we have technically past 11 p.m.? Yes, I, th I think I think we can extend it by by acclimation. Um, or, yeah. or the only things remaining is info, city manager. And yeah. city council. Okay, yeah. cool. All right, yeah. With um, with that, I think we'll. Uh, I think so. So what's just looking uh what's next on the agenda? Uh, informational items. Uh, so H one City Council agenda topics. So Mayor Combs, may I call for public comment on H one? Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. If any member of the public wishes to provide public comment on item H1 regarding the City Council agenda topics from January 2021 to February 2021, please engage that hand feature on the top right side of your screen. I'll have the opportunity to open up the microphone and may address the City Council at this time. And seeing no hands raised, our phones may continue. Okay. Um, so with that, uh, um, uh, is is there um, any discussion with regards to uh, to the city council agenda topics? And so the city. Okay, so so um, so then we can move on to the city manager's report. Uh, good evening again, Mr. Mayor. I, I do have a report out tonight. Um, I think we're all aware that the state has continued the stay at home order. And instead of giving a specific date now, I think the previous date was January 8th, they've, they've set the date as four weeks after ICU bed availability reaches 15% or greater. With that in mind, uh, acknowledging that currently it's at 3% for our greater Bay Area uh, um, group. I, I think that the staff will be bringing back a proposal to reopen Santa Cruz Avenue at the meeting of the 26th. It's highly, highly unlikely that we'll be able to have outdoor dining uh, prior to the end of February, which was the previously set uh, date for reopening Santa Cruz Avenue. Certainly that will be at the council's discretion. I just wanted to give you sort of a background on why we'll be doing that. And that's my report. Thank you. Thank you for that update. Uh, uh, council member reports. You know, Councilman Mueller is saying bye. <laughs> uh, okay. All right. Well, no, no, no. Council member reports. Then, then we are we are adjourned. <laughs>